Section 1 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Section 1. Catherine Parr, Chapter 1, Part 1. Catherine Parr was the first Protestant queen of England. She was the only one among the consorts of Henry the Eighth who, in the sincerity of an honest heart, embraced the doctrine of the Reformation, and imperiled her crown in life, in support of her principles. The name of Catherine, which, from its Greek derivation, Catharos, signifies pure as a limpid stream, seems peculiarly suited to the characteristics of this illustrious lady, in whom we behold the protectress of Coverdale, the friend of Anne Askew, the learned and virtuous matron who directed the studies of Lady Jane Grey, Edward the Sixth, and Queen Elizabeth, and who may, in truth, be called the nursing mother of the Reformation. Catherine Parr was not only Queen of England, but an English queen. Although of ancient and even royal descent, she claimed by birth no other rank than that of a private gentlewoman. Like Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour, Catherine Parr was only the daughter of a knight. But her father, Sir Thomas Parr, was of a more distinguished ancestry than either Sir Thomas Boleyn or Sir John Seymour. From the marriage of his Norman progenitor, Ivo de Talabois, with Lucy, the sister of renowned earls Morcar and Edwin, Sir Thomas Parr inherited the blood of the Anglo-Saxon kings. Ivo de Talabois was the first baron of Kendal, and maintained the state of a petty sovereign in the north. His male line failing with William de Lancaster, the seventh in descent, the honor and estates of that mighty family passed to his sisters, Hellwise and Alice. Margaret, the elder co-heiress of Hellwise, by Peter Le Bruce, married the younger son of Robert Lord Roos, of Hamlake and Works, by Isabel, daughter of Alexander the Second, King of Scotland. Their grandson, Sir Thomas de Roos, married Catherine, the daughter of Sir Thomas Strickland, of Sizer Castle, Westmoreland. The fruit of this union was an only daughter, Elizabeth, who brought Kendall Castle and a rich inheritance into Queen Catherine's paternal house, by her marriage with Sir William de Parr, knight. Sir William Parr, the grandson of this pair, was made knight of the garter and married Elizabeth, one of the co-heiresses of the Lord Fitzhugh, by Alice, daughter of Ralph Neville, Earl of Westmoreland, and Joan Beaufort, daughter of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. Alice Neville was sister to the king's great-grandmother, Cicely Neville, Duchess of York, and, through this connection, Catherine Parr was fourth cousin to Henry the Eighth. From the elder co-heiress of Fitzhugh, the patrimony of the Marmions, the ancient champions of England, was transmitted to Sir Thomas Parr, father of Queen Catherine. Her mother, Matilda, or as she was commonly called, Maud Green, was daughter and co-heiress of Sir Thomas Green, of Bowton and Green's Norton, in the county of Northamptonshire. This lady was a descendant of the distinguished families of Talbot and Throckmorton. Her sister Anne wedded Sir Thomas Bow, afterwards created Lord Bow of Harrowden, and dying childless, the whole of the rich inheritance of the Greens of Bowton centered in Matilda. At the age of thirteen, Matilda became the wife of Sir Thomas Parr. This marriage took place in the year 1508. The date generally assigned for the birth of Catherine Parr is 1510, but the correspondence between her mother and Lord Dacre in the fifteenth year of Henry the Eighth, in which her age is specified to be under twelve, will prove that she could not have been born till 1513. Her father, Sir Thomas Parr, at that time held high offices at court, being master of the wards and comptroller of the household to Henry the Eighth. As a token of royal favor, we find that the king presented him with a rich gold chain, valued at a hundred and forty pounds, a very large sum in those days. Both Sir Thomas and his lady were frequent residents in the court, but the child who was destined hereafter to share the throne of their royal master 
first saw the light at Kendall Castle in Westmoreland, the time-honored fortress which had been the hereditary seat of her ancestors from the days of its Norman founder, Ivo de Talabois. A crumbling relic of this stronghold of feudal greatness is still in existence, rising like a gray crown over the green hills of Kendall. It is situated on a lofty eminence, which commands a panoramic view of the town, and the picturesque and ever-verdant vale of the Kent, that clear and rapid stream, which, night and day, sings an unwearied song, as it rushes over its rocky bed at the foot of the castle hill. The circular tower of the castle is the most considerable portion of the ruins, but there is a large enclosure of ivy-mantled walls remaining, with a few broken arches. These are now crowned with wild flowers, whose peaceful blossoms wave unnoted, where the red cross banner of St. George once flaunted, on tower and parapet of the sternly guarded fortress, that for centuries was regarded as the most important defense of the town of Kendall and the adjacent country. The warlike progenitors of Catherine had stern duties to perform, at the period when the kings of Scotland held Cumberland of the English crown, and were perpetually harassing the northern counties with predatory expeditions. Before the auspicious era when the realms of England and Scotland were united under one sovereign, the Lord of Kendal Castle, like his feudal neighbor of Sizer, was compelled to furnish a numerous quota of men-at-arms for the service of the crown and the protection of the border. The contingent consisted of horse and foot, and above all, of those bowmen, so renowned in border history and song, the Kendall archers. They are especially noted by the metrical chronicler of the Battle of Flodden. These are the bows of Kentdale bold, who fierce will fight and never flee. Dame Maud Parr evinced a courageous disposition in venturing to choose Kendall Castle for the place of her accouchement, at a time when the northern counties were menaced with an invasion from the puissant and flower of Scotland, headed by their king in person. Sir Thomas Parr was, however, compelled to be on duty there, with his warlike mane, in readiness either to attend the summons of the Lord Warden of the Marches, or to hold the fortress for the defense of the town and neighborhood, and his lady, instead of remaining in the metropolis, or seeking a safer abiding place at Green's Norton, her own patrimonial domain, decided on sharing her husband's perils in the north, and there gave birth to Catherine. They had two other children, William, their son and heir, afterwards created Earl of Essex and Marquis of Northampton, and Anne, the wife of William Herbert, the natural son of the Earl of Pembroke, to which dignity he was himself raised by Edward the Sixth. Sir Thomas Parr died in the year 1517, leaving his three infant children to the guardianship of his faithful widow, who is said to have been a lady of great prudence and wisdom, with a discreet care for the main chance. The will of Sir Thomas Parr is dated November 7th, the ninth of Henry the Eighth. He bequeathed his body to be interred at Blackfriars Church, London. All his manors, lands, and tenements he gave to his wife, Dame Maud, during her life. He willed his daughters, Catherine and Anne, to have eight hundred pounds between them as marriage portions, except they proved to be his heirs or his son's heirs, in which case that sum was to be laid out in copes and vestments, and given to the monks of Clairvaux, with a hundred pounds bestowed on the chantry of Kendall. He willed his son William to have his great chain, worth one hundred and forty pounds, which the king's grace gave him. He made Maud, his wife, and Dr. Tunstall, master of the rolls, his executors. Four hundred pounds, Catherine's moiety of the sum provided by her father for the nuptial portions of herself and her sister, would be scarcely equal to two thousand pounds in these days, and seems but an inadequate dowry for the daughters of parents, so richly endowed with the gifts of fortune as Sir Thomas and Lady Parr. It was, however, all that was accorded to her who was hereafter to contract matrimony with the sovereign of the realm. Sir Thomas Parr died in London on the 11th of November, four days after the date of his will, in the parish of the Blackfriars, and there can be no doubt, but he was interred in that church, according to his own request. Yet, as lately as the year 1628, there is record of a tomb bearing his effigies, name and arms, in the chapel or family burying place of the Pars, in the south choir of Kendall Church. 
it has been generally said that catherine parr received a learned education from her father but as she was only in her fifth year when he died it must have been to the maternal wisdom of lady parr that she was indebted for those mental acquirements which so eminently fitted her to adorn the exalted station to which she was afterwards raised catherine was gifted by nature with fine talents and these were improved by the advantages of careful cultivation she both read and wrote latin with facility possessed some knowledge of greek and was well versed in modern languages how perfect a mistress she was of her own the elegance and beauty of her devotional writings are a standing monument i have met with a passage concerning this queen says stripe in the margin of bale's centuries in possession of a late friend of mine dr sampson which shows the greatness of her mind and the quickness of her wit while she was yet a young child somebody skilled in prognostication casting her nativity said that she was born to sit in the highest seat of imperial majesty having all the eminent stars and planets in her house this she heard and took such notice of that when her mother used sometimes to call her to work she would reply my hands are ordained to touch crowns and sceptres and not spindles and needles this striking incident affords one among many instances in which the prediction of a brilliant destiny has ensured its own fulfillment by its powerful influence on an energetic mind it is also an exemplification at how precocious an age the germ of ambition may take root in the human heart but however disposed the little catherine might have been to dispense with the performance of her tasks under the idea of queening it hereafter lady parr was too wise a parent to allow vain dreams of royalty to unfit her child for the duties of the station of life in which she was born and notwithstanding catherine's early repugnance to touch a needle her skill in industry in its use became so remarkable that there are specimens of her embroidery at sizer castle which scarcely could have been surpassed by the far-famed stitcheries of the sisters of king athelstan though dame maud parr had scarcely completed her twenty-second year at the time of her husband's death she never entered into a second marriage but devoted herself entirely to the superintendence of her children's education in the year fifteen twenty four she entered into a negotiation with her kinsman lord dacre for a marriage between his grandson the heir of lord scroop and her daughter catherine of which the particulars may be learned from some very curious letters preserved among the scroop manuscripts the first is from dame maud parr to lord dacre and refers to a personal conference she had had with his lordship at greenwich on the subject of this alliance most honourable and my very good lord i heartily commend me to you whereas it pleased you at your last being here to take pains in the matter in consideration of marriage between the lord scroop's son and my daughter catherine for the which i heartily thank you at which time i thought the matter in good furtherance howbeit i perceive that my lord scroop is not agreeable to that consideration the jointure is little for eleven hundred marks which i will not pass and my said lord will not repay after marriage had and two hundred marks must needs be repaid if my daughter catherine dies before the age of sixteen or else i should break master parr's will meaning the will of her husband sir thomas which i should be loath to do and there can be no marriage until my lord's son lord scroop comes to the age of thirteen and my daughter to the age of twelve before which time if the marriage should take none effect or be dissolved either by death wardship disagreement or otherwise which may be before the time notwithstanding marriage solemnized repayment must needs be had of the whole or else i might fortune to pay my money for nothing the conversation i had with you at greenwich was that i was to pay at desire eleven hundred marks one hundred on hand and one hundred every year which is as much as i can spare as you know and for that my daughter catherine is to have one hundred marks jointure whereof i am to have fifty marks for her finding till they live together then they are to have the whole one hundred marks and repayment to be had if the marriage took no effect my lord it may please you to take so much pain as to help to conclude this matter if it will be and if you see any defect on my part it shall be ordered as ye deem good as knoweth yesu who preserve your good lordship 
Written at the Rye, the 13th of July, your cousin, Maud Parr. Lord Scroop of Bolton Castle did not choose to submit to the refunding part of the clause, and was unwilling to allow more than forty marks per annum for the board or finding of the young lady, till the heir of Scroop came to the age of eighteen. Lord Dacre, after some inconsequential letters between him and Dame Maud, proved his sincerity in the promotion of the wedlock, by the following pithy arguments, contained in an epistle to Lord Scroop, his son-in-law my lord your son and heir is the greatest jewel that ye can have seeing he must represent your own people after your death unto whom i pray god grant many long years and if ye be disposed to marry him i cannot see without you marrying him to an heir of land which would be right costly that ye can marry him to so good a stock as my lady parr for divers considerations first in remembering the wisdom of my said lady and the good wise stock of the greens, whereof she is coming, and also of the wise stock of the pars of Kendall, for all wise men do look, when they do marry their child, to the wisdom of the blood they do marry with. I speak not of the possibility of Lady Parr's daughter Catherine, who has but one child between her, and eight hundred marks yearly to inherit thereof. My lord, the demands you have and my lady's demands are so far asunder, that it is impossible ye can ever agree. I think it is not convenient nor profitable that so large a sum as one hundred marks should go yearly out of your land to so young a person as my lady's eldest daughter, Catherine, if it fortune, as God defend, that your said son and mine die. Also I think it good, but I would not have it comprised in the covenant, that during the time of three years, that he should be with my said lady Parr, if she keep her widowhood, and ye to find him clothing and a servant to wait upon him, and she to find him meat and drink. For I assure you he might learn with her, as well as in any place, that I know, as well nurture, as French and other languages, which me seems were a commodious thing for him. At Morpeth, 17th day of December, 15th year, Henry the Eighth. These letters certify us, that Catherine Parr was under twelve years of age in the year 1524. She could not, therefore, have been born before 1513. We also learn that Lord Dacre was anxious that his youthful grandson should participate in the advantages of the liberal education Lady Parr was bestowing on her children, and that he placed due importance on the fact that the lady came of a family celebrated for sound sense and good conduct a point little regarded now in the marriages of the heirs of an illustrious line. Lady Parr and all her lineage had a great reputation for wisdom, it seems, but the wisdom of this world forms so prominent a feature in the matrimonial bargain which the sagacious widow and the worthy Lord Scroop were attempting to drive, in behalf of their children, that the affair came to nothing. Lord Dacre tells Lady Parr that Lord Scroop must needs have money, and he has nothing whereof to make it but the marriage of his said son, and Dame Maud, in a letter from the court of Greenwich, dated the 15th of the following March, laments to Lord Dacre that, the custom of her country, and the advice of her friends, will not permit her to submit to Lord Scroop's way of driving a bargain. Lord Dacre, who seems some degrees less acquisitive than his son and Lady Parr, replies, Madam, for my part, I am sorry that ye must be converted in this matter, seeing the labor I have had in it, which was most for the strength of my friendship for my cousin Catherine, your daughter, assuring you that ye shall not marry Catherine in any place, that be so good and comfortable to my said cousin, your daughter. And concerning my lord Scroop's demands, he demanded nothing but that ye were content to give, which was eleven hundred marks and concerning his offer, which was one hundred marks jointure, it is not far from the custom of the country, for, from the highest to the lowest, it is the custom to give for every one hundred marks of dower, ten marks jointure. But finally, madam, seeing ye are thus minded, whereat I am sorry, as nature constraineth me to be, as it doth please you in this business, so it shall please me, and thus, heartily, fare ye well." at Morpeth, 25th day of May, 16 Anno. 
thus ended the abortive matrimonial treaty for the union of catherine parr and the heir of scroop who was her kinsman by the maternal connection of both with the great northern family of dacre catherine must have been still of very tender age when she was given in marriage to her first husband edward lord borough of gainsborough a mature widower with children who had arrived at man's estate henry the second of these sons after his father's marriage with catherine parr espoused her friend and kinswoman catherine neville the widow of sir walter strickland of sizer and this lady though only twenty-nine at the time of her union was fourteen years older than her husband's stepmother the principal family seat of catherine's first husband was his manor house of gainsborough situated about seventeen miles from lincoln and here no doubt he resided with his young bride his father had expended considerable sums in enlarging and improving this mansion which was sold a century afterwards by one of his descendants to a wealthy london citizen lord borough had a fine mansion at catterick in yorkshire and probably at newark likewise where his arms impaled with those of his first wife alice cobham were painted on the window which his father presented to the parish church at gainsborough church on the tomb of the first lord borough father to catherine parr's husband the arms of borough were quartered with talabois marmion and fitzhugh which afforded sufficient proof of the ancestral connection of this nobleman with the parrs he appears to have been related to catherine somewhere about the fourth degree he died in fifteen twenty eight to twenty nine catherine therefore could not have exceeded her fifteenth year at the period of her first widowhood she had no children by lord borough soon after the death of her husband catherine was bereaved of her last surviving parent from a passage in the will of lady parr it appears as if that lady had sacrificed the interests of her daughter in order to purchase a marriage with a kinswoman of the sovereign for her son sir william parr this strange document which is utterly devoid of perspicuity and common sense commences thus dame maud parr widow late wife of sir thomas parr deceased twentieth of may twenty first of henry the eighth fifteen twenty nine my body to be buried in the church of the black friars london whereas i have indebted myself for the preferment of my son and heir william parr as well as to the king for the marriage of my said son as to my lord of essex for the marriage of my lady borchier daughter and heir apparent to the said earl and my daughter sir william parr knight my brother catherine borough my daughter thomas pinkering esq my cousin and steward of my house great difficulties were probably encountered by the executors of lady parr's will as it was not proved till december fourteenth fifteen thirty one more than two years after her death like many of the marriages based on parental pride and avarice the union of catherine's brother with the heiress of the royally descended and wealthy house of borchier proved a source of guilt and misery to both parties the young lady parr was the sole descendant of isabel plantagenet sister of the king's great-grandfather richard duke of york this alliance increased the previous family connection of the parrs with the sovereign lineage on the female side some degree of friendly intercourse appears to have been kept up between the king and his cousin and the young lady parr and we observe that in the year fifteen thirty she sent him a present of a coat of kendal cloth both the brother and the uncle of catherine were now attached to the royal household but many reasons lead us to suppose that catherine became an inmate of sizer castle about this period she was a lively noble and wealthy widow in her sixteenth year when deprived of the protection of her last surviving parent her only near female relations were an unmarried sister younger than herself and her aunt lady throckmorton who resided in a distant county as heiress presumptive to her brother william it was desirable to remain in the vicinity of kendall castle and the family estates in that neighbourhood therefore the most prudent and natural thing she could do was to take up her abode with her kinswoman and friend lady strickland that lady though she had by her marriage with catherine's stepson henry burrow become her daughter-in-law was quite old enough to afford matronly countenance to the youthful widow of lord borough 
whom, according to the quaint custom of the time, she called her good mother. Catherine Parr and Lady Strickland were alike descended from the Nevilles of Raby, and Sir Walter Strickland, the deceased husband of the latter, was also a relative of the Parrs, and as Lady Strickland held of the crown the wardship of her son, young Walter Strickland's person and estates, she remained mistress of Sizer Castle, even after her marriage with Henry Burrow. At no other period of her life than the interval between her mother's death and her own marriage with Neville, Lord Latimer, could Catherine Parr have found leisure to embroider the magnificent counterpane and toilet cover, which are proudly exhibited at Sizer Castle, as trophies of her industry, having been worked by her own hands, during a visit to her kinsfolk there. As the ornamental labors of the needle have become once more a source of domestic enjoyment to the ladies of England, and even the lords of the creation appear to derive some pleasure, as lookers-on, in tracing the progress of their fair friends at the embroidering frame, a brief description of these beautiful and well-preserved specimens of Catherine Parr's proficiency in that accomplishment may not be displeasing. The material on which both counterpane and toilet cover are worked is the richest white satin, of a fabric with which the production of no modern loom can vie. The center of the pattern is a medallion, surrounded with a wreath of natural flowers, wrought in twisted silks and bullion. A spread eagle, in bold relief, gorged with the imperial crown, forms the middle. At each corner is a lively heraldic monster, of the dragon class, glowing with purple, crimson, and gold. The field is gaily beset with large flowers, in gorgeous colors, highly embossed and enriched with threads of gold. The toilet is en suite, but of a smaller pattern. The lapse of three centuries has scarcely diminished the brilliancy of the colors, or tarnished the bullion. Nor is the purity of the satin sullied, though both these queenly relics have been used, on state occasions, by the family in whose possession they have remained, as precious heirlooms and memorials of their ancestral connection with Queen Catherine Parr. The apartment which Catherine occupied in Sizer Castle is still called the Queen's Room. It is a fine state chamber in that ancient portion of the castle, in Dane Court Tower. It opens through the drawing room, and is panelled with richly carved black oak, which is covered with tapestry of great beauty. The designs represent hunting in all its gradations, from a fox chase up to a lion hunt, varied with delineations of trees and flowers, and surrounded with a very unique border, in which young tigers are fighting and brandishing their claws at each other, in the manner of enraged kittens. The most splendid patterns for modern needlework might be taken from these spirited devices. Over the lofty carved chimney piece are the arms of England and France, supported between the lion and the Tudor dragon, with the motto, Vivat Regina. The date, 1569, proves they were put up some years after the death of Catherine Parr, though doubtless intended to commemorate the fact that this apartment was once honored by her use. The bed, with its hangings of costly crimson damask, is shown as the veritable one in which she reposed. But the fashion of the bedstead is too modern to favor the tradition, which, we think, more probably belongs to one of the elaborately carved and canopied oaken bedsteads, coval with the days of the Plantagenets, which are to be seen in other chambers of this venerable mansion. How long Catherine continued the widow of Lord Burrow is uncertain, but she was probably under twenty years of age, when she became, for the second time, the wife of a mature widower, and again undertook the office of a stepmother. It is not unlikely that her residence at Sizer Castle might lead to her marriage with John Neville, Lord Latimer, as Lady Strickland was a Neville, of Thornton Briggs, and would naturally afford her kinsmen every facility for his courtship of their fair cousin. Lord Latimer was related to Catherine in about the same degree as her first husband, Lord Burrow. The date of her marriage with this nobleman is not known. He had been previously married twice, first to Elizabeth, daughter of Sir Richard Musgrave, who died without issue, secondly to Dorothy, daughter of Sir George de Vere, and sister and co-heiress to John de Vere, fourteenth Earl of Oxford, by whom he had two children, John and Margaret. The second Lady Latimer died in 1526-27. to 27. 
after catherine became the wife of lord latimer she chiefly resided with him and his family at his stately mansion of snape hill in yorkshire which is thus described by leland snape a goodly castle in a valley belonging to lord latimer with two or three good parks well wooded about it it is his chief house and standeth about two miles from great tanfield the manors of cumberton wadborough and several other estates in worcestershire which he inherited from elizabeth beauchamp were settled on catherine parr at her marriage with this wealthy noble the ancestors of catherine parr the marmions had formerly held sway at tanfield and through the marriage of her grandfather sir william parr with elizabeth fitzhugh the granddaughter of the heiress of sir robert marmion the castle and manor of tanfield descended to the father of catherine and was now the property of her brother young william parr he was at that time childless and as catherine was his heiress presumptive there was a contingency by no means remote of this demesne which was so desirably contiguous to her husband's estates falling to her it would be too much to say that lord latimer had an eye to this contingency when he sought the hand of catherine parr for she was young lovely accomplished learned and virtuous and to a man who had enjoyed the opportunity of becoming acquainted with the perfections of a mind like hers the worldly advantages that might accrue from a matrimonial alliance with her must have been considerations of a very secondary nature fortunate indeed must lord latimer have felt himself in being able to obtain so charming a companion for his latter days and at the same time one so well qualified to direct the studies and form the minds of his children the amiable temper and sound sense of catherine taught her to perform the difficult duties that devolved upon her in the character of a stepmother with such conscientious and endearing gentleness that she ensured the love and esteem of all the families with whom she was connected in that capacity during the first years of her marriage with lord latimer she pursued the noiseless tenor of her way in the peaceful routine and privacy of domestic life to which those talents and acquirements which afterwards rendered her the admiration of the most learned men in europe and the intellectual model of the ladies of england was calculated to lend a charm end of section one Section 2 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter 1, Part 2. Lord Latimer was so strenuous a Catholic that he became one of the leaders of the Northern Insurrection on account of the suppression of the monasteries and the sequestration of the church property by cromwell in 1536 this revolt though chiefly proceeding from the miseries of a starving population who found themselves suddenly deprived of the relief of conventual alms in seasons of distress assumed the tone of a domestic crusade against the enemies of the olden faith and was called the pilgrimage of grace forty thousand rustics in yorkshire alone appeared in arms bearing white banners in the image of the saviour on the cross and the chalice and host depicted thereon their nominal general was robert ask a gentleman of mean condition and a mysterious personage entitled the earl of poverty but an enthusiastic junto of nobles knights and ecclesiastics at the head of whom was the archbishop of york lord neville lord darcy and the husband of catherine parr were allied with these adventurers they were knit together with oaths of compact, and they compelled the inhabitants of every village or town to take this oath, and to join the pilgrimage. They became so formidable in a short time, that the Duke of Norfolk, who was empowered by the king to put down the rebellion, considered it more desirable to negotiate than to fight, and a peaceable conference was appointed, between the royal commissioners, and a chosen number of the leading men among the insurgents at Doncaster lord latimer was one of the delegates nominated by the pilgrims for the perilous service of laying their grievances before the sovereign and stating their demands four pledges were given by the duke for the safe return of the delegates 
they demanded among other things the restoration of the monastic establishments and the papal supremacy the suppression of heretical books especially the writings of wycliffe luther melanchthon and others whom they specified and that the heretical bishops might be condemned to the flames or else compelled to do battle in single combat with certain valiantly disposed pilgrims who would take upon themselves the office of champions for the church militant there were also many legal and statistical reforms required but the most extraordinary demand of the northern democracy was that the king should expel from his council all men of villain blood especially cromwell rich and others who had risen from a humble station in society in every era of our history it may be noted that the lower classes have disliked the elevation of persons of their own degree to the exercise of authority in the state such is the inconsistency of popular pride the king was much offended at the manifesto of the pilgrims and took upon himself the task of compounding a reply in which he expressed his astonishment that ignorant people should go about to instruct him in matters of theology who somewhat had been noted to be learned in what the true faith should be in this his majesty with all the pride of authorship evidently designed to recall to the memory of the more polite members of the confederacy his own book against luther which had procured for him from the pope the title of defender of the faith he also angrily complains of their presumption in wanting to mend his laws as if after being their king eight and twenty years he did not know how to govern the realm he rejected all their petitions but offered to pardon them for appearing in arms against him if they would give up their ringleaders and concluded by bidding them admire the benignity of their sovereign the pilgrims declined the royal grace under such conditions recalled their delegates and made them ready for battle the wise and conciliating policy of the duke of norfolk prevented the collision which appeared almost inevitable he prevailed upon the insurgents to lay down their arms on condition of receiving free pardon from the king with a promise that their grievances should be discussed in parliament and with some difficulty he induced the king who was very peevish with him about it to publish the amnesty without exceptions the general pardon was dated december ninth fifteen thirty six in february the insurrection broke out again but lord latimer did not join it the prudent counsels of catherine possibly deterred her lord from involving himself a second time in so rash an enterprise it is certain that by remaining quiescent he escaped the tragic fate of his northern neighbors and late confederates the lord darcy sir robert constable sir stephen hamerton and upwards of seventy others on whom the royal vengeance inflicted the extreme penalty of the law the only daughter of sir stephen hamerton was betrothed to catherine's youthful kinsman walter strickland and not only this family connection but the execution of several of the nevilles after the second rising must have rendered this period a season of fearful anxiety to lord and lady latimer it was probably about this time that sir john russell the lord privy seal took the opportunity of requesting a very inconvenient favor for one of his friends of lord latimer namely that his lordship should oblige this person with the loan of his fine mansion in the churchyard of chartreux now called the charter house latimer did not venture to refuse but his extreme reluctance to comply with the request may be seen in the following letter written in reply right honourable and my especial good lord after my most hearty recommendations had to your good lordship whereas your lordship doth desire of your friends my house within chartreux churchyard besides so i assure your lordship the getting of a lease of it cost me one hundred mares besides other pleasures or improvements that i did to the house for it was much my desire to have it because it stands in good air out of press of the city and i do always lie there when i come to london and have no other house to lie at and also i have granted it to farm to mr newdigate son and heir to sergeant newdigate to lie in the said house in my absence and he to void whensoever i come up to london 
nevertheless i am contented if it can do your lordship any pleasure for your friend that he lie there forthwith i seek my lodgings at this michaelmas term myself and as touching my lease i assure your lordship it is not here but i shall bring it right to your lordship at my coming up at this said term and then and always i shall be at your lord's commandment as knows our lord who preserve your lordship in much honour to his pleasure from wyke in worcester the last day of september your lordship's assuredly to command john latimer to the right honourable and very especial good lord my lord privy seal from this letter we may gather that the household arrangements of the second husband of catherine parr were of the same prudential character which induces many of the nobles of the present age to let their mansions ready furnished to wealthy commoners when they retired to their country seats with this difference lord latimer's arrangement with the heir of sergeant newdigate was a perennial engagement by which the tenant was to vacate the house when his duties in parliament or other business called his lordship to town it must have been a serious annoyance to all parties for the friend of my lord privy seal to take an impertinent fancy of occupying lord latimer's town house under these circumstances and yet because the minister prefers the suit the noble owner of the mansion is compelled to break his agreement with his tenant and to seek for other lodgings for himself against the ensuing session of parliament in order to accommodate a person who has evidently no claim on his courtesy but a man who had been once in arms against the sovereign would in that reign be careful how he afforded cause for offence to one of the satellites of the crown after his name had been connected with the pilgrimage of grace lord latimer had a delicate game to play and it was well for him that his wife was related to the king and the niece of a favoured member of the royal household william parr catherine's sister lady herbert had an appointment in jane seymour's court and assisted at the christening of edward the sixth that catherine parr was not only acquainted with henry the eighth but possessed a considerable influence over his mind some years before there was the slightest probability of her ever becoming a sharer of his throne is certified by the history of the throckmorton family to which we are principally indebted for the following details sir george throckmorton the husband of catherine parr's aunt having incurred the ill-will of lord cromwell in consequence of some disputes arising from the contiguity of their manners of cofton court and owersley cromwell endeavoured to compass the ruin of his aristocratic neighbour by accusing him of having denied the king's supremacy the charge was peculiarly alarming to throckmorton because his brother michael was in the service of cardinal pole and had taken an active part in opposing the king's divorce from catherine of aragon as we are told by his kinsmen in the following lines from a metrical chronicle of the life of sir nicholas throckmorton for after that resolve stood the king to take anew and leave his wedded wife my uncle was the means to work the thing by reynold poole who brewed all the strife and then at rome did work the contrary which drave the king at home to tyranny throckmorton manuscript the subject of sir george throckmorton's imprisonment and the distress of his family is introduced in these quaint lines my father's foes clapped him through cantered haste in tower fast and gaped to joint his neck they were in hope for to obtain a mate who heretofore had laboured for a check yea greyville's grieved him ill without a cause who hurt not them nor yet the prince's laws thus everything did run against the hare our name disgraced and we but witless boys did deem it hard such crosses then to bear our minds more fit to deal with childish toys but troubles are of perfect wit the schools when life at will feeds men as fat as fools after drawing rather a ludicrous picture of their tribulations and comparing lady throckmorton in her tears to a drowned mouse he introduces the family of parr on the scene while flocking foes to work our bane were bent while thunderclaps of angry jove did last then to lord parr my mother saw me sent so with her brother i was safely placed 
of alms he kept me in extremity who did misdoubt a worse calamity o oh, lucky looks that fawned on catherine parr a woman rare like her but seldom seen to burrow first and then to latimer she widow was and then became a queen my mother prayed her niece with watery eyes to rid both her and hers from endless cries she willing of herself to do us good sought out the means her uncle's life to save and when the king was in his pleasing mood she humbly then her suit began to crave with wooing times denials disagree she spake and sped my father was set free in his rapturous allusion to the good offices of catherine parr the poet by mentioning her subsequent marriage with the king a little confuses the time when her intercession was successfully employed for the deliverance of sir george throckmorton the date of this event is clearly defined in the prose documents of the throckmorton family to have taken place in the year fifteen forty by the statement that sir george was released through the influence of his kinswoman the lady catherine parr and advised with the king at her suggestion about cromwell immediately before the arrest of that minister which was in the june of that year this fact throws a new light on the fall of cromwell and leads us to infer that his ruin was caused not by the enmity of catherine howard but of her unsuspected successor catherine parr at that time the wife of a zealous catholic peer and herself a member of the church of rome it was probably from the eloquent lips of this strong-minded and intrepid lady when pleading for the life of her uncle that henry learned the extent of cromwell's rapacity and the real state of the public mind as to his administration and thus we may perhaps account for the otherwise mysterious change in the royal mind when the monarch after loading his favorite with honors and immunities suddenly resolved to sacrifice him to popular indignation as a scapegoat on whose shoulders the political sins of both king and council might be conveniently laid sir george throckmorton took an active part in bringing his former persecutor to the block and instead of being stripped by him of his fair domain of cofton court was enabled to purchase cromwell's manor of oursley on adventitious terms of the crown and to transmit it to his descendants in whose possession it remains at the present day few things perhaps tend more importantly to the elucidation of historical mysteries than the study of genealogies it is by obtaining an acquaintance with the family connections of the leading actors in any memorable era that we gain a clue to the secret springs of their actions and perceive the wheel within a wheel which impelled to deeds otherwise unaccountable the brother of catherine parr was the husband of the heiress of the last earl of essex of the ancient line of bouchier but on the demise of that nobleman those honors which in equity ought to have been vested in his descendants were to the indignation of all the connections of the bouchiers and parrs bestowed on cromwell the death of that rapacious minister smoothed the way for the summons of william parr to the house of lords as earl of essex and the right of his wife catherine herself came in for a share of the spoils of the enemy of her house for his manor of wimbledon was settled on her tradition says that she resided at the mansion at some period of her life a portion of this ancient edifice which is still called by her name is in existence cromwell was the third great statesman of henry the eighth's cabinet within the brief period of ten years whose fall is attributable to female influence wolsey and moore were the victims of anne boleyn's undisguised animosity and the secret ill-will of catherine parr appears to have been equally fatal to cromwell although her consummate prudence in avoiding any demonstration of hostility has prevented her from being recognized as the author of his ruin save in the records of the house of throckmorton the execution of the unfortunate queen catherine howard in february fifteen forty two preceded the death of catherine parr's second husband lord latimer about twelve months the will of lord latimer is dated september twelfth fifteen forty two but as it was not proved till the eleventh of the following march it is probable that he died early in fifteen forty three in this document lord latimer bequeaths to the lady catherine his wife 
the manners of Nun Monkton and Hamerton. He bequeaths his body to be buried on the south side of the church of Well, where his ancestors were buried, if he should die in Yorkshire, appointing that the master of the hospital and vicar of the church of Well should take and receive all the rents and profits of the parsonage of Ascombe Richard in the county of the city of York, as also of the parsonage of St. George's Church in York for the time of forty years, wherewith to endow a grammar school at Well and to pray for him the founder. The latter clause affords evidence that Lord Latimer died as he had lived, a member of the Church of Rome. There is, however, neither monument nor memorial of him in the Church of Well, for he died not in Yorkshire, but in London, and was interred in St. Paul's Cathedral. The conversion of Catherine to the principles of the Reformed religion did not, in all probability, take place till after the decease of Lord Latimer, when, unbiased by the influence of that zealous supporter of the ancient system, she found herself at liberty to listen to the impassioned eloquence of the apostles of the Protestant faith, men who were daily called upon to testify the sincerity of their profession through tortures and a fiery death. The house of the noble and learned widow soon became the resort of such men as Coverdale, Latimer, and Parkhurst, and sermons were daily preached in her chamber of state, by those who were desirous of restoring the practice of the Christian religion in its primitive simplicity. Catherine was not only pious, learned, and passing fair, but possessed of great wealth as the mistress of two ample jointures, both unencumbered. With these advantages, and connected as she was, either by descent or marriage, with some of the noblest families in England, even with royalty itself in no very remote degree, it is not to be supposed that she was left unwooed. At an early stage of her widowhood, she was sought in marriage by Sir Thomas Seymour, the brother of the late Queen Jane, and uncle to the infant heir of England. Sir Thomas Seymour enjoyed the favor of his royal brother-in-law in a high degree, and was the handsomest and most admired bachelor of the court. He was gay, magnificent, and brave, excelling in all the manly exercises of that age, and much distinguished by the richness of his dress and ornaments, in which his fashions were implicitly followed by the other courtiers, and with the ladies he was considered irresistible. How it happened that the grave, learned, and devout Lady Latimer should be the one to fix the wandering heart of this gay and reckless gallant, for whom the sprightliest beauties of the court had sighed in vain, has never been explained, nor is it always possible to account for the inconsistencies of love. As the Seymours were among the political leaders of the anti-papal party, it is, however, probable that Sir Thomas might be induced to attend the religious assemblies that were held at the house of this noble and distinguished convert to the reform religion, from motives of curiosity in the first instance, till a more powerful interest was insensibly excited in his mind by her charms and winning deportment. Be this as it may, it is certain that Catherine fully returned his passion, as she herself subsequently acknowledges, and had determined to become his wife at that time if her will had not, for wise purposes, been overruled by a higher power. A more important destiny was reserved for her, and while she delayed her union with the man of her heart, till a proper interval from the death of her husband should be elapsed, her hand was demanded by a third widower, in the decline of life, and the father of children, by former marriages. This widower was none other than her sovereign, who had remained in a state of gloomy celibacy since the execution of his last queen, apparently wearied out by the frequent disappointments and mistakes that had attended his ventures in the matrimonial lottery. His desire for conjugal companionship was, however, unabated, and rendered, perhaps, wiser by experience. He determined in his selection of a sixth wife not to be guided by externals only. The circumstances that led to Henry's marriage with Catherine Parr are quaintly glanced at by her poet cousin, Sir Thomas Throckmorton, who dates the advancement of his family from that event. But when the king's fifth wife had lost her head, yet he mislikes the life to live alone, and once resolved the sixth time for to wed, he sought outright to make his choice of one. That choice was chance, 
right happy for us all, it brewed our bliss and rid us quite from thrall. Throckmorton Manuscript When the celebrated Act of Parliament was passed, which rendered it a capital offence for any lady who had ever made a lapse from virtue, to contract matrimony with her sovereign, without first apprising him of her fault, it had been shrewdly observed, that his majesty had now no other alternative than to marry a widow. No spinster, however pure her conduct might have been, it was presumed, would venture to place herself within the peril of a penalty, which might be inflicted on the most innocent woman in the world, the moment she ceased to charm the unprincipled tyrant, whose fickleness was only equalled by his malice and cruelty. When Henry first made known to Lady Latimer, that she was a lady, whom he intended to honor with the sixth reversion of his hand, she was struck with dismay, and in the terror with which his cruel treatment of his matrimonial victims inspired her, she actually told him, that it was better to be his mistress than his wife. A few months after marriage, such a sarcasm on his conduct as a husband might have cost Henry's best beloved queen her head. As it was, this cutting observation, from the lips of a matron of Catherine's well-known virtue, though it must have afforded him a mortifying idea, of the estimation in which the dignity of Queen Consort was regarded by the ladies of his court, had no other effect than to increase the eagerness of his suit to the reluctant widow. Fear was not, however, her only objection to become the wife of Henry. Love was for a while victorious over ambition in the heart of Catherine. Her affection for Seymour rendered her very listless about the royal match at first. But her favored lover presumed not to contest the prize with his all-powerful brother-in-law and sovereign. A rival of Henry's temper, who held the heads of wives, kinsmen, and favorites as cheaply as tennis balls, was not to be withstood. The Adonis of the court vanished from the scene, and the bride-elect, accommodating her mind as best she might, to the change of bridegroom, prepared to assume, with a good grace, the glittering fetters of a queenly slave. The arrangements of the royal nuptials were made with a celerity truly astonishing. Barely three months intervened between the proving of Lord Latimer's will and the day on which Cranmer grants a license, for the marriage of his sovereign lord, King Henry, with Catherine Latimer, late the wife of the Lord de Latimer, deceased, in whatever church, chapel, or oratory he may please, without publication of bans, dispensing with all ordinances to the contrary, for reasons concerning the honor and advancement of the whole realm. Dated July 10th, 1543. Two days afterwards, Catherine exchanged her briefly worn weeds of widowhood for the bridal robes of a queen of England, robes that had proved fatal trappings to four of her five predecessors in the perilous dignity to which it was the pleasure of her enamored sovereign to advance her. The nuptials of Henry the Eighth and Catherine Parr, instead of being hurried over secretly in some obscure corner, like some unhallowed mystery, as was the case in his previous marriages, with Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, were solemnized much in the same way as royal marriages are in the present times, without pageantry, but with all suitable observances. The ceremony was performed by Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, in the Queen's closet at Hampton Court, and the high respect of the monarch for his bride was proved, by his permitting the princesses Mary and Elizabeth, his daughters, and his niece, the Lady Margaret Douglas, to assist at these nuptials. The queen was also supported by her sister, Mrs. Herbert, afterwards Countess of Pembroke, her beloved friend, Catherine Willoughby, Duchess of Suffolk, and Countess of Hertford, and Joanna, Lady Dudley. The king was attended by his brother-in-law, the Earl of Hertford, Lord John Russell, Privy Seal, Sir Anthony Brown, Master of the Pensioners, Henry Howard, Richard Long, Thomas Darcy, Edward Bainton, the husband of the late queen's sister, Anthony Denny and Thomas Speak, knights, and William Herbert, the brother-in-law of his bride. It is scarcely possible but the cheek of Catherine must have blanched when the nuptial ring was placed on her finger by the ruthless hand that had signed the death warrant of two of his consorts within the last seven years. 
if a parallel might be permitted between the grave facts of history and the creations of romance we should say the situation of henry's sixth queen greatly resembled that of the fair scheherazade in the arabian nights entertainments who voluntarily contracted matrimony with sultan Shirar, though aware that it was his custom to marry a fresh wife every day and cut off her head the next morning the sound principles excellent judgment and endearing qualities of katherine parr and above all her superlative skill as a nurse by rendering her necessary to the comfort of the selfish and irritable tyrant who had chosen her as a help meet for him in the season of premature old age and increasing disease afforded her best security from the fate of her predecessors but this hereafter among the unpublished manuscripts in the state paper office we find the following paragraph in a letter from sir thomas rodesley relating to the recent bridal of the sovereign i doubt not of your grace knowing by the fame and otherwise that the king's majesty was married on thursday last to my lady latimer a woman in my judgment for certain wisdom and gentleness most meet for his highness and sure i am his majesty had never a wife more agreeable to his heart than she is the lord grant them long life and much joy together on the day of her marriage queen catherine presented her royal stepdaughter and bridemaid the princess mary with a magnificent pair of gold bracelets set with rubies and yet more acceptable gift in money of twenty-five pounds of course the princess elizabeth who also assisted at the bridal was not forgotten the pecuniary present to mary was repeated on the twenty sixth of september catherine parr had now for the third time undertaken the office of stepmother an office at all times of much difficulty and responsibility but peculiarly so with regard to the children of henry the eighth who were the offspring of queens so fatally opposed as catherine of aragon anne boleyn and jane seymour had successively been how well the sound sense and endearing manners of catherine parr fitted her to reconcile the rival interests and to render herself a bond of union between the disjointed links of the royal family is proved by the affection and respect of her grateful stepchildren and also by their letters after king henry's death whether a man who had so glaringly violated the duties of a father to his daughters as henry had done deserves any credit for paternal care in his choice of his sixth queen it would be difficult to say but it was scarcely possible for him to have selected a lady better qualified to conduce to the happiness of his children to improve their minds and to fit them by the inculcation of virtuous and noble sentiments to adorn the high station to which they were born the union of the sovereign with the pious and learned lady latimer was the cause of great joy to the university of cambridge where the doctrines of the reformation had already taken deep root the opinions of this erudite body on the subject are eloquently expressed in their congratulatory address to henry on his marriage catherine parr while queen consort of england continued to correspond with the university of cambridge in the name of which the celebrated roger ashcombe thanks her for her royal benefactions and the suavity of her letters write to us oftener says the enthusiastic scholar eruditissima regina and do not despise the term erudition most noble lady it is the praise of your industry and a greater one to your talents than all the ornaments of your fortune we rejoice vehemently in your happiness most happy princess because you are learning more amidst the occupations of your dignity than many of us do in all our leisure and quiet the dignity of the scholar and the queen are beautifully blended with the tenderness of the woman and the devotedness of the christian in the line of conduct adopted by catherine parr after her elevation to a throne her situation at this period is not unlike that of esther in the house of Asuerus. her attachment to the doctrines of the reformation naturally rendered her an object of jealous ill-will to gardiner bishop of winchester the leader of the anti-papal catholic party and as early as the second week after her marriage this daring ecclesiastic ventured to measure his power against that of the royal bride by an attack on a humble society of reformers at windsor anthony persons a priest john marbeck a chorister 
Robert Testwood, and Henry Filmer, were the leading persons attached to this community, but it was suspected they received encouragement from members of the royal household. Dr. London, one of the most unprincipled agents of Cromwell in the spoliation of the abbeys, had, since the fall of his patron, changed his tact, and was employed by the triumphant faction, in preparing a book of informations, denouncing every person in Windsor who was suspected of holding opinions at variance with the six articles. This book was presented to Gardiner, who moved the king in council, that a commission should be granted, for searching all the houses in Windsor, for books written in favor of the new learning. Henry acceded to this measure, as regarded the town, but accepted the castle, his own royal residence, having doubtless shrewd reasons to suspect that more works, of the kind objected to, would be found in the closets and chambers of those nearest and dearest to him, than among the poor and unlearned inhabitants of Windsor. A few manuscript notes on the Bible, and a Latin concordance in progress of arrangement, which were found in the house of Marbeck, furnished an excuse for the arrest, trial, and condemnation of himself and his three friends. Nothing could induce them to betray any person in the royal household, to save themselves from the fiery death with which they were menaced. Marbeck found an intercessor sufficiently powerful to represent his case to the king. This was most probably either the queen or some person encouraged by her. Henry was shown the Latin concordance, of which several hundred pages were completed. Poor Marbeck, exclaimed he, with an unwanted burst of sympathy. It would be well for thine accusers, if they had employed their time no worse. A reprieve was granted to Marbeck, but persons, Testwood and Filmer, were sent to the stake, July 26, two days after their condemnation. Though the flames of their martyrdom were kindled almost in the sight of Henry's Protestant queen, she was unable to avert the fate of the victims, and well aware she was that the blow which produced this fell sacrifice of human life was aimed at herself, and would be followed by an attack on persons in her immediate confidence. The murder of these humble reformers was, indeed, but the preliminary move, in the bold yet subtle game, which Gardner was playing, against the more elevated individuals, professing the same religion with the queen. Dr. Haynes, the dean of Exeter, and a prebendary of Windsor, Sir Philip Hoby and his lady, Sir Thomas Carden, and other members of the royal household, were denounced by Dr. London and Simons, as persons encouraging the new learning, and were placed under arrest. The only evidence against them that could be produced was contained in certain inferences and false statements, which Dr. London had suborned Occam, the clerk of the court, to introduce into the notes he had taken at the trials of the recent victims. The queen, having obtained full information of these proceedings, sent one of her most trusty and courageous servants into court to expose the iniquity of this plot. Occam was arrested and his papers seized, which afforded full proof of the base conspiracy into which he had entered, and the whole transaction was laid before the king. The tables were now completely turned. London and Simons were sent for and examined on oath, and, not being aware that their letters were intercepted, fully committed themselves, were found guilty of perjury, and were sentenced to be placed on horseback, with their faces to the horses' tails, with papers on their foreheads, setting forth their perjury. They were then set in the pillory at Windsor, where the king and queen then were. Catherine sought no further vengeance, and the mortification caused by this disgraceful punishment is supposed to have caused Dr. London's death. Such were the scenes that marked the bridal month of Catherine Parr, as Queen of England, that month which is generally styled the honeymoon. Her elevation to the perilous dignity of Queen Consort afforded her, however, the satisfaction of advancing the fortunes of various members of her own family. She bestowed the office of Lord Chamberlain on her uncle, Lord Parr of Horton. She made her sister, Lady Herbert, one of her ladies of the bedchamber, and her stepdaughter, Margaret Neville, the only daughter of her deceased husband, Lord Latimer, one of her maids of honor. Her brother, William Parr, was created Earl of Essex, in right of his wife, having been previously made Baron Parr of Kendal. The preferment which Queen Catherine's cousins of the House of Throckmorton obtained, through her powerful patronage, 
is thus quaintly described by the poetical chronicler of that family lo then my brethren clement george and i did seek as youth doth still in court to be each other state as base we did defy compared with court the nurse of dignity tis truly said no fishing to the seas no serving but a king if you can please first in the court my brother clement served a fee he had the queen her cup to bring and some suppose that i right well deserved when sewer they saw me chosen to the king my brother george by valor in youth rare a pension got and gallant halbert bear End of section two. Section three of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume five, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter one, Part three one of the first fruits of queen catherine's virtuous influence over the mind of the king was the restoration of his daughters the persecuted mary and the young neglected elizabeth to their proper rank in the court and recognition in the order of succession to the crown the privy purse expenses of the princess mary bear evidence of many little traits of kindness and friendly attentions which she had from time to time received from her amiable stepmother when mary was taken ill on her journey between grafton and woodstock the queen sent her own litter to convey her to amphill where she was herself residing with the king on the new year's day after her marriage queen catherine sent her footman jacob with the present of a cheese for the princess mary who girdened the bearer with seven and sixpence a rich nightgown or evening dress is on another occasion sent by queen catherine to mary by fritton the keeper of the royal robes mary's reward to fritton was fifteen shillings mary embroidered a cushion with her own hands as an offering for the queen and paid seven and sixpence to john haynes for devising the pattern catherine on her marriage received into her household one mrs barbara undoubtedly at the request of the princess mary who had kindly supplied this person with money clothes food and medical attendance during a long illness an item occurs at the time of catherine parr's marriage in the accounts of the princess of money presented to mrs barbara when she was sworn queen's woman and being thus honorably provided for her name no longer occurs in the list of mary's pensioners notwithstanding the great difference in their religious tenets a firm friendship ever subsisted between catherine parr and mary they were near enough in age to have been sisters they excelled in the same accomplishments and the great learning and studious pursuits of these royal ladies rendered them suitable companions for each other the more brilliant talents of the young elizabeth were drawn forth and fostered under the auspices of her highly gifted stepmother catherine parr took also an active part in directing the studies of the heir of england and her approbation appears to have been the greatest encouragement the prince could receive in a letter written in french to queen catherine edward notices the beauty of her penmanship i thank you says he most noble and excellent queen for the letters you have lately sent me not only for their beauty but for their imagination for when I see your belle scripture, or fair writing, and the excellence of your genius, greatly surpassing my invention, I am sick of writing. But then I think how kind your nature is, and that whatever proceeds from a good mind and intention will be acceptable, and so I write you this letter. A modern author has noticed the great similarity between the handwriting of Edward the Sixth and Catherine Parr, and from this circumstance it has been conjectured, that catherine superintended the education of one or other of the juvenile members of the royal family previous to her marriage with king henry no official evidence of her appointment to any office of the kind has been discovered but her great reputation for wisdom and learning renders the tradition not improbable certain it is that after she became queen she took great delight in directing the studies of her royal stepchildren it is evident that edward the sixth 
Queen Elizabeth, and their youthful cousins, Lady Jane and Lady Catherine Grey, all imbibed her taste for classic literature, and her attachment to the principles of the Reformation. She induced not only Elizabeth, but Mary, to translate passages from the scriptures. Each of these princesses compiled a little manual of devotions, in Latin, French, and English, dedicated to their accomplished stepmother. Catherine Parr's celebrity as a scholar and a theologian did not render her neglectful of the feminine accomplishment of needlework, in which, notwithstanding her early resistance to its practice, she much delighted. Like Henry's first excellent queen, Catherine of Aragon, she employed her hours of retirement in embroidering among her ladies. It is said that a portion of the hangings which adorned the royal apartments of the tower, before they were dismantled or destroyed, were the work of this queen, the only specimens, however, that are now to be found of her skill and industry in this pleasing art, are those preserved at Sizer Castle. Her taste in dress appears to have been excellent, uniting magnificence of material with a simplicity of form. In fact, the costume of Catherine Parr, as shown in her miniature, might be worn with perfect propriety in any courtly circle of the present age. Catherine Parr enacted the queen with as much royal state and splendor as the loftiest of her predecessors. She granted an interview to the Spanish Duke de Najara at Westminster Palace, February 17, 1544. This Spanish grandee visited England on his return from the army of Charles V and was admitted to pay his respects to the queen and her daughter-in-law, the Princess Mary. The queen permitted him to kiss her hand. Pedro de Gante, secretary to the grandee, has described her dress with the zeal of a man milliner. She wore a kirtle of brocade and an open robe of cloth of gold, the sleeves lined with crimson satin and trimmed with three piled crimson velvet, the train more than two yards long. Suspended from the neck were two crosses and a jewel with very rich diamonds, and on her headdress were many rich and beautiful ones. Her girdle was of gold, with very large pendants. The original miniature of this queen, which has recently attracted much interest, during the sale of Horace Walpole's collection at Strawberry Hill, represents her with very small and delicately marked features, hazel eyes and golden hair, folded in simple Madonna bands. Her forehead is lofty and serene, indicative of talent and sprightly wit. She wears a round crimson velvet hood, or cap of state, edged with pearls, and surmounted with a jeweled band of goldsmith's work, set with rubies and pearls, which confines a long black veil, that flows from the back of the headdress over the shoulders. The bodice and sleeves of the dress are made of rich gold brocade, and set tight to the shape. The bodice is cut square across the bust, like the corsage of a modern dress, and is edged with a row of pearls, between pipes of black and crimson velvet. She wears a double row of large pearls about her neck, from which depends a ruby cross, finished with one fair pendant pearl. Her bodice is ornamented with a large ruby brooch, set in filigree gold. The miniature is a small oval, on a deep, small blue background. Her age is stated, in gilt figures in front of the picture, to be thirty-two, so that the likeness must have been taken in the year 1545, about two years after her marriage with Henry the Eighth. Perhaps this was the veritable miniature which the Admiral, Sir Thomas Seymour, obtained from Catherine, when he subsequently entreated her to send him one of her little pictures if she had not given them all away, a proof that several original miniatures of this queen were painted, although they are now almost as rare and difficult to identify as those of Catherine Howard. The engraving, usually stated to be from an original painting of Catherine Parr, possesses none of her characteristics. It is a shrewd, sordid-looking female, of rather large proportions, with dark complexion and hair. Catherine Parr was petite in form, with remarkably small and delicately cut features, and her complexion was that of a genuine Westmoreland beauty, brilliantly fair and blooming, with hazel eyes, and hair of a golden auburn, realizing the beau ideal of Petrarca, when he exclaims, Love, from what precious mind of gold didst thou bring the rich glories of her shining hair, 
where pluck the open roses fresh and fair which on her cheeks in tender blushes glow catherine parr's celebrated work the lamentations of a sinner was written after her marriage with the king this little volume next to the writings of sir thomas more affords one of the finest specimens of english composition of that era it is a brief but eloquent treatise on the imperfection of human nature in its unassisted state and the utter vanity of all earthly grandeur and distinction within the limited compass of about one hundred twenty miniature pages it comprises the elements of almost all the sermons that have been levelled against papal supremacy the royal writer does not forget to compliment king henry for having emancipated england from this domination thanks be given to the lord that he hath now sent us such a godly and learned king in these latter days to reign over us that with the force of god's word hath taken away the veils and mists of errors and brought us to the knowledge of the truth by the light of god's word which was so long hid and kept under that the people were well nigh famished and hungered for lack of spiritual food such was the charity of the spiritual curates and shepherds but our moses and most godly wise governor and king that hath delivered us out of the captivity and spiritual bondage of pharaoh i mean by this moses king henry the eighth my most sovereign and favourable lord and husband one if moses had figured any more than christ through the excellent grace of god me to be another express verity of moses's conquest over pharaoh and i mean by this pharaoh the bishop of rome who hath been and is a greater persecutor of all true christians than ever was pharaoh of the children of israel the gross flattery offered up to her husband in this passage is somewhat atoned for by the pure morality which generally pervades the precepts of this little treatise the zeal with which it is written is extremely ardent her aspiration for martyrdom frequent the tenets inculcated are simply that all good works arise from the inspiration of the spirit of god vouchsafed through belief in christ derived from prayer and diligent perusal of the scriptures she is nearly as severe on those who call themselves gospelers and separate faith and works as she is on the pope and she evidently considers them in equal or greater error here are her words and it must be owned that if she considered her two last lords henry the eighth and thomas seymour exceptions from her description conjugal partiality must have strangely blinded her now i will speak with great dolor and heaviness of heart of a sort of person which be in the world that be called professors of the gospel and by their words do declare and show that they be much affected to the same but i am afraid some of them do build on the sand as simon magus did making a weak foundation i mean they make not christ their chiefest foundation but either they would be called gospelers and procure some credit and good opinion of the true and very favourers of christ's doctrines either to find out some carnal liberty either to be contentious disputers finders or rebukers of other men's faults or else finally to please and flatter the world such gospelers be an offence and slander to the word of god and make the wicked to rejoice and laugh saying behold i pray you their fair fruits what charity what discretion what goodness holiness and purity of life is amongst them be they not great avengers foul gluttons backbiters adulterers swearers and blasphemers yea do they not wallow and tumble in all manner of sins these be the fruits of their doctrine and yet the word of god is all holy sincere and godly being the doctrine and occasion of all pure living she then with great earnestness applies the parable of the sower and his seed and that of the barren fig tree her precepts to her own sex are as follows if they be women married they learn of st paul to be obedient to their husbands and to keep silence in the congregation and to learn of their husbands at home also that they wear such apparel as becometh holiness and comely usage with soberness not being accusers or detractors not given to much eating of delicate meats and drinking of wine but that they teach honest things to make the young women sober-minded to love their husbands to love their children to be discreet housewifely and good 
that the word of God may not be evil spoken of. Catherine evidently approved of clerical celibacy. The passage in her work from which this inference is drawn is curious, because it shows that she still professed the church established by her husband, which insisted on this point of discipline. The true followers of Christ's doctrine hath always a respect and an eye to their vocation. If they be called to the ministry of God's word, they preach and teach it sincerely to the edifying of others, and show themselves in their living followers of the same. If they be married men, having children and family, they nourish and bring them up, without all bitterness and fierceness, in the doctrine of the Lord in all godliness and virtue, committing, that is, the married men, the instruction of others, which appertaineth not to their charge, to the reformation of God and his ministers. The most remarkable passage in the book is perhaps that in which Catherine deplores her former attachment to the ceremonials of the Church of Rome, some of her biographers having erroneously asserted that she was brought up in the principles of the Reformation. Those principles were abhorrent to the king, for it was the government, not the essentials of the Roman Catholic Church, that he was laboring to overthrow. In such low esteem, indeed, was Henry held by the fathers of the Reformation, that, on his rupture with the princes of the small Caldic League, Luther publicly returned thanks to God, for having delivered the Protestant church from that offensive king of England. The king, says he, on another occasion, is still the same old Heinz, as in my first book I pictured him. He will surely find his judge. The adulation of a woman of superior intellect was necessary to Henry's happiness. Catherine presently discovered his weak point, and by condescending to adapt herself to his humor, acquired considerable influence over his mind. Early in the year 1544, King Henry gave indubitable tokens of the favor with which he regarded Queen Catherine, by causing his obedient parliament to settle the royal succession on any children he might have by her, in case of the decease of Prince Edward without issue. The wording of the first clause of this act is very curious. Inasmuch as Henry treats four of his marriages as absolute nullities, and out of his six queens, only condescends to acknowledge two, namely, Jane Seymour and Catherine Parr. Forasmuch, says the record, as his majesty, sith thence the death of the late Queen Jane, hath taken to wife Catherine, late wife to Sir John Neville, knight, Lord Latimer deceased, by whom as yet his majesty hath none issue, but may full well when it shall please God etc., etc. In failure of heirs by his most entirely beloved wife, Queen Catherine, or any other of his lawful wife, Henry, by the same act, entails the succession on his daughter Mary, and in failure of her line, to his daughter Elizabeth. But who their mothers were he does not think proper to notice, lest he should, by word as well as by deed, contradict his previous decisions, as to the unlawfulness of his marriages with Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. It was, however, too late for Henry the Eighth to think of making sacrifices to consistency in his old age, after having followed no other guide than passion or caprice for nearly a quarter of a century. The record further explains that this act for settling the succession was made preparatory to the sovereign, undertaking a voyage royal, in his most royal person, into the realm of France, against the French king. Previous to his departure on this expedition, King Henry testified his confidence in Catherine's wisdom and integrity, by appointing her to govern the realm in his absence, by the style and title of Queen Regent of England and Ireland. The Queen, observes Lord Herbert, was constituted General Regent of the realm, yet not so much that her soft sex was thought less capable of ambition, as that of the Roman Catholics, of whom the king was mistrustful, would take no dependence from her, she being observed to incline a little to the reform. The reformers certainly had the ascendancy, in the council appointed by Henry to assist his consort with their advice. From the minutes of the council of July 7th, 36 Henry the Eighth we have the following entry, connected with Catherine Parr's appointment to this important trust. First, 
touching the queen's highness and my lord prince the king's majesty hath resolved that the queen's highness shall be regent in his grace's absence and that his highness's process shall pass and bear test in her name as in like cases heretofore hath been accustomed the earl of hertford was ordered to be ever attendant on the person of catherine and resident in her court but if he could not conveniently be there then cranmer was for the time to remain with her grace and with them sir william peter and lord parr of horton were to sit in council Rodesley and the bishop of winchester were in this junto in the queen's commission of regency hertford was to be her lieutenant if she needed such assistance several of the queen consorts of england have exercised vice-regal power either by usurpation or by the consent of the sovereign but catherine parr was the first and only one on whom the style and title of queen regent was solemnly conferred and who signed herself as such as the facsimile from her official autograph witnesses catherine queen regent k p the initials k p for catherine parr were attached to all her regal signatures prove that neither her elevation to a throne nor the distinction of the highest title of honor that had ever been borne by a female in england had rendered her unwilling to remember her simple patronymic in the true spirit of a christian queen catherine entered upon her high office by imploring the divine protection for her royal husband and his realm in the following prayer which she composed for their use. O Almighty King and Lord of hosts, which by thy angels thereunto appointed dost minister both war and peace, who didst give unto David both courage and strength, being but a little one, unversed and inexpert in feats of war, with his sling to set upon and overthrow the great huge Goliath, our cause now being just, being enforced to enter into war and battail, we most humbly beseech thee, O Lord God of hosts, so to turn the hearts of our enemies to the desire of peace, that no Christian blood be spilt. Or else grant, O Lord, that with small effusion of blood and little damage of innocence, we may to thy glory obtain victory, and that the wars being soon ended, we may all with one heart and mind, knit together in concord and amity, laud and praise thee who livest and reignest world without end amen on the fourteenth of july fifteen forty four king henry crossed the seas from dover to calais in a ship with sails of cloth of gold on the twenty-fifth he took the field in person armed at all points mounted on a great courser and so rode out of calais with a princely train attended by sir william herbert the queen's brother-in-law bearing his headpiece and spear and followed by the henksmen, bravely horsed and appointed. Catherine's brother, the Earl of Essex, was chief captain of the men-at-arms in this expedition. On the 26th, Henry appeared before Boulogne, and took command of his puissance there. The Duke of Albuquerque, the general of the allied Spanish forces, encamped on the other side the town, and acted in conformity to the directions of the English monarch, who was the leader of the siege. The following very loving and dutiful letter appears to have been written by Queen Catherine to the king, very soon after his departure from England. Although the distance of time and account of days, neither is long nor many of your majesty's absence, yet the want of your presence, so much desired and beloved by me, maketh me that I cannot quietly pleasure in anything until I hear from your majesty. The time, therefore, seemeth to me very long, with a great desire to know how your highness hath done, since your departing hence, whose prosperity and health I prefer and desire more than mine own, and whereas I know your majesty's absence is never without great need, yet love and affection compel me to desire your presence. Again, the same zeal and affection forceth me to be best content with that which is your will and pleasure." Thus love maketh me in all things to set apart mine own convenience and pleasure, and to embrace most joyfully his will and pleasure whom I love. God, the knower of secrets, can judge these words not to be written only with ink, but most truly impressed on the heart. Much more I omit, lest it be thought I go about to praise myself or crave a thank. Which thing to do I mind nothing less, 
but a plain simple relation of the love and zeal i bear your majesty proceeding from the abundance of the heart wherein i must confess i desire no commendation having such just occasion to do the same i make like account with your majesty as i do with god for his benefits and gifts heaped upon me daily somewhat idolatrous this acknowledging myself a great debtor to him not being able to recompense the least of his benefits in which state i am certain and sure to die yet i hope in his gracious acceptation of my good will even such confidence have i in your majesty's gentleness knowing myself never to have done my duty as were requisite and meet for such a noble prince at whose hands i have found and received so much love and goodness that with words i cannot express it lest i should be too tedious to your majesty i finish this my scribbled letter committing you to the governance of the lord with long and prosperous life here and after this life to enjoy the kingdom of his elect from greenwich by your majesty's humble and obedient wife and servant catherine the queen k p a grateful and loyal spirit pervades this letter that the queen had both felt and expressed much anxiety for the safety of her royal husband as well as for the success of his expedition may be gathered from the following hypocritical passage in one of Rodesley's letters to her majesty god is able to strength his own against the devil and therefore let not the queen's majesty in any wise trouble herself for god shall turn all to the best and sure we be that the king's majesty's person is out of all danger a fragment of one of king henry's letters to queen catherine parr has been preserved in which he details with soldier-like plainness to his fair regent at home the auspicious progress of his campaign on the hostile shores of france the manner in which he names his family to catherine is very interesting considering their relative positions and implies much for the amiable conduct of the royal stepmother henry the eighth with all his faults wrote very pleasant letters and this is one of his best at the closing up of these our letters this day the castle before named with the dyke is at our command and not like to be recovered by the frenchmen again as we trust not doubting with god's grace but that the castle and town shall shortly follow the same trade for as this day which is the eighth of september we begin three batteries and have three more going besides one which hath done his execution in shaking and tearing off one of their greatest bulwarks no more to you at this time sweetheart but for lack of time and great occupation of business saving we pray you to give in our name our hearty blessings to all our children and recommendations to our cousin margaret and the rest of the ladies and gentlewomen and to our council also written with the hand of your loving husband henry r during the absence of the king in france queen catherine and her royal stepchildren appear to have resided together as one family in september the young edward and his sisters were under her careful guardianship at ocking whence in consequence of the pestilence then raging she issued her mandate to the mayor and sheriffs to make proclamation that since on account of the plague great danger might arise to her the prince and the king's other children no person in whose house the plague had been or who may have been with any infected person or may have lived near any place where the infection had been should go to court or suffer any attendance on the court to enter his house where the infection is under the queen's indignation and further punishment at her pleasure from Ocking if aught but good had befallen the dearly prized heir of england during the absence of the king a fearful reckoning would have awaited queen catherine from her jealous and unreasonable lord on his return no wonder that her anxiety for the safety of this precious trust impelled her to the use of arbitrary measures to preserve the royal household from the danger of infection among the few existing documents connected with the regency of catherine parr there is in the Cottonian collection an inedited letter to her council, headed Catherine, Queen Regent, K.P., in favor of her trusty and well-beloved servant, Henry Webb, gentleman usher of her privy chamber, 
requesting that the king's grant of the nunnery and demesne of Holywell, which had been given to him at the surrender of the said nunnery, but only in part fulfilled, might be carried into effect, on the modified terms of allowing him to purchase that portion of the demesne which had been withheld from him. Her Majesty concludes in the following persuasive strain. We shall heartily desire and pray you to be favorable to him at this our earnest request, and in declaring whereof, your kind and loving friendship towards him effectually, at the contemplation of these our letters, we shall gratefully accept it, and also thankfully remember it, whensoever occasion shall serve us to do you pleasure. Given under our signet, at my lord the king's majesty honor of Hampton Court, the 23rd of July, and the 36th of his highness's most noble reign. Boulogne surrendered to the arms of Henry the Eighth after a fierce siege. He made his triumphant entry into the town September 18th. His council in England, by command of the Queen Regent, issued a general order, September 19th, that a public thanksgiving should be offered up to Almighty God in all the towns and villages throughout England for the taking of Boulogne. This was one of the last acts of Queen Catherine Parr's regency, for the king returned in England October 1st, finding it impossible to follow up his victorious career in France, because his Spanish allies had made a separate peace with Francis I. Catherine had governed with such prudence, during the brief period in which the sovereign power of the crown had been confided to her administration, as to leave no cause of complaint to either party. It was in all probability, after Henry's return from his victorious campaign, that the interesting family group, in Her Majesty's collection at Hampton Court, was painted by Hans Holbein. In this splendid picture, the design of which appears to have been intended to introduce all the members of the royal house of Tudor, as a united family, Henry is enthroned beneath his canopy of state, with his consort at his left hand, but instead of Catherine Parr, a pale spectral resemblance of Jane Seymour occupies the place at Henry's side. The attitude and expression of the dead queen's face and figure are as rigid and inanimate as if it had been the intention of the painter to represent her as a corpse, newly taken from the grave, clad in royal robes, and seated in jeweled pomp among the living. There is little doubt but that the delineation was made from the wax effigy, which was carried after her funeral. She bears a mournful and almost startling likeness to her son, Prince Edward, a beautiful boy of eight years old, who leans on his father in a caressing attitude. With his right hand, the king embraces his son, and his hand rests on his shoulder. The princesses Mary and Elizabeth are entering on opposite sides, as if to offer filial homage to the royal pair. The scene appears to be on the dais of Wolsey's Hall, with a view of one of the turrets through a side window. The picture is richly emblazoned with gold, and the costumes are peculiarly gorgeous and characteristic of the period. Henry's gown, of scarlet and gold brocade, is girded to his waist, with a white satin sash, in which the hilt of his jeweled dagger is seen. The skirts of the gown are short, very full, and edged with gold. It is slashed on the breast, and five or six longitudinal rows, with puffs of white satin, confined with gold clasps. Over this he wears a magnificent collar of twisted pearls, with ruby medallions. A dalmatica with hanging sleeves, lined with sables and edged with pearls, is thrown on his shoulder. His hat is of black velvet, adorned with pearls, and edged with the drooping white feather, which is always characteristic of the costume of this monarch, and also of his son. Henry's hose and shoes are of white satin, and he wears on his breast a large medallion jewel, having the appearance of a watch. The prince wears a crimson velvet cap, jeweled and plumed, but his hair is so arranged as to have the unpicturesque effect of a brown silk skull cap or a little bob wig. He has a gold chain about his neck, and is dressed in a gown of dark red damask, striped with gold, and arranged in heavy plates, from the throat to the waist, where it is confined by a narrow belt. The skirt is full, and descends below the knees. His garment is much padded and stiffened, it has hanging sleeves, open to the shoulders, 
beneath which are very full sleeves of white satin, fantastically slashed with scarlet velvet. His hose and shoes are of scarlet. The faded statue-like representation of his dead mother appears in the pointed cloth of gold hood, edged with pearls, precisely like that worn by Jane Seymour in life, but which had been superseded by the pretty low French hood introduced by Catherine Howard, and adopted by Catherine Parr and her ladies. The two princesses are each represented in the same picture, in the round hood, according to the prevailing fashion of their royal stepmother's court, of crimson velvet, edged with pearls, similar to that worn by Queen Catherine Parr in the Strawberry Hill miniature, only not surmounted with so rich a coronal band of jewels. This peculiarity of the costume marks the miniature of Catherine, to have been painted at the same period as the Holbein family group, if not by the same artist. The hair of Jane Seymour and of the two princesses in this picture, as well as that of Catherine Parr in the Strawberry Hill miniature, are all of the golden tint, which appears the universal color in all the Holbein portraits of the last three years of Henry the VIII's reign. A singular freak of nature, we should say, were it not well known that an imitation of the envied Chiom d'Or, which was produced by the use of a bright yellow powder, then in vogue. In some instances, folds of amber-colored velvet were worn by the elder ladies of Henry the VIII's court, arranged like cross bands of hair, so as to give a great appearance of breadth to the forehead, under the low French hood. In Holbein's family group, the princesses Mary and Elizabeth are dressed precisely alike, in kirtles or close-fitting gowns, of rich crimson velvet, with long sleeves, finished at the hands with ruffles, and slashed with puffs of white satin, from the wrists to the elbows. Over these they wear flowing robes of gold brocade, with hanging sleeves and sweeping trains, their bodices fit tightly to the shape, and are cut rather low and square across the bust. They are edged with pearls. Both sisters wear double rows of pearls about their necks, supporting small ruby crosses. Elizabeth is a tall, full-proportioned lovely girl, of womanly appearance. Mary is much smaller, and more delicate in form and features. She has the melancholy cast of countenance, which sickness and early sorrow had rendered natural to her. In this painting, contemporary portraits of four Tudor sovereigns, Henry the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, Queen Mary, and Queen Elizabeth, with the posthumous portrait of Henry's favorite queen, Jane Seymour, are assembled together, in the splendid costume of the era, described in the fourth and fifth volumes of the Lives of the Queens of England. The circumstance of Catherine Parr permitting her deceased predecessor to take her place in the royal tableau is very remarkable. Few ladies indeed there are, who would not have regarded the proposal of being thus superseded, as a decided affront. But Catherine Parr was too generous to be jealous of a compliment offered to the dead queen, and far too prudent to oppose her royal spouse in any of his whims, however unreasonable. That Catherine Parr was in the full enjoyment of Henry's favor at this period, may be inferred from the consideration with which her kindred were treated, although she was herself cautious of giving cause of disgust to the old nobility, or envy to the climbing courtiers, by obtaining lavish grants of money and land, or a plurality of offices for her own family. Just such a meed of patronage was bestowed on her brother, her uncle, and her sister's husband, as evinced her affection, and the respect of the king for her relatives, but no more. Three of her young kinsmen, the Throckmortons, followed the banner of the sovereign in the French campaign. George was made a prisoner, and a thousand pounds was demanded by the captor for his ransom, on account of his consanguinity to her majesty. After he had remained a year in captivity, the queen exerted herself for his redemption. The scene of his return, and the preferment that followed at court, is thus pleasantly described by his nephew in the Throckmorton manuscript. When first in present chamber he was come, the king said to him, Welcome to our grace. I know thou lovest the alarm of a drum. I see the marks of manhood in thy face. He, humbly kneeling, thanked his majesty that he did see him set at liberty. And often after the king would jest, and call him cousin in his merry mood, because therefore the Frenchman had assessed his fine so high, which turned him to good, his foes did say, in serving he was free, 
and for reward the prince gave land in fee. Then none of us did unrewarded go. I had a gift yearly worth fifty pound, which I record because thou shouldest know, I hate received benefits to drown. Besides, I had a stipend for my life, who shortly left the court and took a wife. And now, because the king and queen did use my friendly signs, their liking to display, what men our company would then refuse? Our betters then with us did seek to stay, for lo, it is a path to dignity, with Caesar's friend to be in amity. Then Pembroke and his wife, whose sister was unto the queen, their kinsfolk friended much, and par their brother did them both surpass, who for to pleasure us did never grutch, when these did call us cousin, at each word, the other peers would friendly speech afford. Soon after the king's return from France, the queen's uncle, Par of Horton, resigned his office of Lord Chamberlain, and his place in the council, and though greatly urged by Henry and Catherine, to continue to assist them with his experience and advice, he sighed for the quiet of private life, preferring, he said, to the honors that beset him in his niece's court, the pious, peaceable, hospitable way of the country, where popularity affected him more than he sought it, no man being more beloved by the commonality. End of section 3 Section 4 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter 2, Part 1. One great trial, we may add peril, of Catherine Parr's queenly life, was the frequent presence of her former lover, Sir Thomas Seymour, who was one of the gentlemen of the King's Privy Chamber. The contrast between him and her royal lord must have been painfully apparent, at times, to Catherine. She was surrounded with invidious spies withal, who would have been only too happy to be able to report a word, a look, or even a sigh, to the king, as evidence of her preferment for the handsome Seymour. But the high principles and consummate prudence of the queen carried her triumphantly through an ordeal, which some princesses might not have passed without loss of life and fame. The conduct of Seymour was rash, inconsistent, and selfish. He was the most restless, and at the same time the most blundering, of intriguers. He had shared in the spoils of the sequestered abbeys, though in a lesser degree than his brother, the Earl of Hertford, and was one of those who would have tempted the king to appropriate the revenues of the bishops. It was, however, necessary to find some cause of complaint with that body, and according to Fox, he began at the fountainhead. Sir Thomas Seymour, says our author, who waited on the king, not much favoring Cramner, accused him of wasting his revenues and retrenching all hospitality, in order to gather riches for his wife and children, and that such stipends would be no small profit to his majesty. About a fortnight afterwards, one day, the king having washed before going to dinner, and Sir Thomas Seymour holding the basin, he said to him, Go you out of hand to my lord of Canterbury, and bid him be with me at two o'clock, and fail not. When Seymour went to Lambeth, he found the great hall set out for dinner, and the usual hospitality going forward, and being invited by Cramner to dine, at which meal, all proceeded with the usual state of the former archbishops. Sir Thomas Seymour presently divined that he had been sent on purpose, and, after delivering his message, went back to the king in great haste. Ho! said Henry, when he saw him, dined you not with my lord of Canterbury? Sir Thomas Seymour spied a portentous cloud on the royal brow as he replied, That I did, your majesty, and he will be with your highness forthwith. Then, falling on his knees, he added, I beseech your majesty to pardon me, for I have of late told you an untruth concerning my lord of Canterbury's housekeeping, but I will never henceforth believe the knave, which did put that vain tale in my head, for never did I see in my life so honorable a hall set in the realm, except your majesty's, or so well furnished, according to each degree, 
and himself also most honorably served. Ah, sir, quoth the king, have you now spied the truth? But I perceive which way the wind bloweth. There are a sort of you whom I have liberally given of suppressed abbeys, which, as you have lightly gotten, so you have unthriftily spent, some at dice, other some in gay apparel, and otherwise worse, I fear. And now all is gone. You would fain have me make another sherissance, or gratuity, of the bishop's lands, to satisfy your greedy appetites. Far different from this worldly, self-seeking spirit was the disinterested devotion of the queen to the cause of the Reformation. With nothing to gain, and everything to lose, by her religion, she courageously maintained the opinions to which she had become a convert, and, in her zeal for the translation of the Holy Scriptures, left no means untried for the accomplishment of that good work. She appointed Miles Coverdale to the office of her almoner, and rendered him every assistance in his labor of love. Even that determined pillar of the olden faith, the Princess Mary, her stepdaughter, was won upon by Catherine, to cooperate partially in the undertaking, as will be shown in the memoir of that queen, a circumstance which proves how resistless in their gentleness must have been the manners of the royal matron, whom the Protestant church may well regard as its glory. The learned Nicholas Udall, master of Eton School, was employed by Catherine Parr to edit the translations of Erasmus's paraphrases on the four gospels, in the labor of which the Princess Mary was induced by her royal stepmother to take an active share. The queen thus addresses the Princess Mary on the expediency of appending her name to her translation. I beseech you to send me this beautiful and useful work, when corrected by Mallet, or some other of your household, and at the same time let me know whether it shall be published under your own name or anonymously. In my own opinion, you will not do justice to a work in which you have taken such infinite pains for the public, and would have still continued to do so, as is well known, had your health permitted it. If you refuse to let it descend to posterity, under the sanction of your name, for, since everybody is aware what fatigue you have undergone in its accomplishment, I do not see why you should refuse the praise that all will deservedly offer you in return. The first edition of these paraphrases, of which so important a use was afterwards made by Cramner and Somerset, was published, according to Stripe, in 1545, at the sole expense of Queen Catherine Parr. In this dedication to his royal patroness, Udall remarks, On the great number of noble women at that time, in England, given to the study of devout science and of strange tongues, it was a common thing, he quaintly adds, to see young virgins so noozled and trained in the study of letters, that they willingly set all other pastimes at naught for learning's sake. It was now no news at all to see queens and ladies of most high estate and progeny, instead of courtly dalliance, to embrace virtuous exercises, reading and writing, and with most earnest study, early and late, to apply themselves to the acquiring of knowledge. Fortunately for Catherine Parr, and those fair and gentle students, who were encouraged by the example of that learned queen, to seek the paths of knowledge, they flourished in days when the acquirements of ladies were regarded as their glory, not their reproach. Learning in women was then considered next unto holiness, and the cultivation of the female mind was hailed by the wise, the good, the noble of England, as a proof of the increasing refinement of the land. In later centuries, invidious ignorance has succeeded in flinging the brand of vulgar opprobrium on such women as Sir Thomas More, Erasmus, Udall, and Ascham, all but deified. Margaret Roper, Catherine Parr, and the divine lady Jane Grey would inevitably have been stigmatized as blue stockings if they had lived in the 19th instead of the 16th century. When Catherine Parr was first called to the unenviable distinction of sharing the throne of Henry the Eighth, the poverty of the crown precluded the king from indulging his love of pomp and pageantry in any of the public feats and rejoicings which had been so frequent in the first thirty years of his reign. The expense of a coronation for the new queen was out of the question, and, though she was dowered in the same proportion as her predecessors had been, 
it must have been a source of comfort to Catherine that she enjoyed a fine income as the widow of Lord Burrow and Lord Latimer, independently of her royal allowance as Queen Consort of England. Henry's pecuniary distresses had led him to the fallacious expedient of raising the nominal value of the currency of the realm, and afterwards of issuing a fresh coinage, in which the proportion of alloy exceeded that of the silver. This purblind proceeding gave the death blow to trade by ruining the national credit and involving himself, his subjects, and successors in tenfold difficulties. In the autumn of 1545, Henry claimed the assistance of Parliament, but the subsidy granted not satisfying the rapacious and needy sovereign, the revenues of all the hospitals and colleges in England were placed at his disposal by the time-serving and venial legislators of whom it was composed. The University of Cambridge, dreading the spoliation with which it was threatened, implored the protection of their learned queen. Catherine, who was not forgetful of the affection and respect which had ever been manifested for her person and character by this erudite body, exerted her utmost influence with her royal husband to avert the storm that impended over that ancient nursery of learning and piety. The letter in which Her Majesty informs the members of the university of the success of her intercession with the king, in their behalf, is exceedingly curious, and the advice she offers as to the nature of their studies is equally creditable to her head and heart. Letter from Queen Catherine Parr To our right trusty, dear and well-beloved Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor of my Lord the King's Majesty's University of Cambridge, and to the whole said university there. Your letters I have received, presented on all your behalfs, by Mr. Dr. Smythe, your discreet and learned advocate, and as they be Latinly written, which is signified unto me by those that be learned in the Latin tongue, so, I know, you could have uttered your desires and opinions familiarly in your vulgar tongue, aptest for your intelligence, albeit you seem to have conceived, rather partially than truly, a favorable estimation both of my going forward and dedication to learning, which to advance, or at least conserve, your letters move me. This passage must not be considered by the reader as any contradiction of her attainments as a Latin scholar, because, notwithstanding her denial of learning, the queen meant not to be taken at her word, as ignorant of the language in which the university had addressed her, for she uses, in the course of the letter, a very apt Latin quotation. You show me how agreeable it is to me, being in this worldly estate, not only for mine own part to be studious, but also a maintainer and cherisher of the learned state, bearing me in hand, or insisting, that I am endowed and perfected with those qualities which ought to be in a person of my station. Truly this, your discreet and politic document, I as thankfully accept as you desire that I should embrace it, and forasmuch as I do here, all kind of learning doth flourish among you in this age, as it did amongst the Greeks at Athens, long ago. I desire you all not so to hunger, for the exquisite knowledge of profane learning, that it may be thought that the Greek university was but transposed, or now in England revived, forgetting our Christianity, since their excellency did not only attain to moral and natural things. But rather, I gently exhort you to study and apply those doctrines, as means and apt degrees, to the attaining and setting forth Christ's reverent and sacred doctrine, that it may be laid against you in evidence, at the tribunal of God, how you were ashamed of Christ's doctrine. For this Latin lesson, I am taught to say of St. Paul, Non me podet evangeli, to the sincere setting forth whereof, I trust, universally in all your vocations and ministries you will apply, and conform your sundry gifts, arts and studies, in such end and sort, that Cambridge may be accounted rather a university of divine philosophy than of natural and moral, as Athens was, upon the confidence of which your accomplishment of my expectation, zeal, and request, I, according to your desires, have attempted my lord the king for the establishment of your livelihood and possessions, in which, notwithstanding his majesty's property and interest, through the consent of the high court of parliament, 
his highness being such a patron to good learning doth tender you so much that he would rather advance learning and erect new occasion thereof than confound your ancient and godly institutions so that such learning may hereafter ascribe her very original whole conversation to our sovereign lord the king her only defence and worthy ornament the prosperous estate and princely government of whom long to preserve i doubt not but every one of you will in the daily invocation call upon him who alone and only can dispose to every creature scribbled by the rude hand of her that prayeth to the lord and immortal god to send you all prosperous success in godly learning and knowledge from my lord the king's majesty's manor of greenwich the twenty sixth of february catherine the queen k p the triumph which catherine parr's virtuous influence obtained in this instance over the sordid passions of henry and his greedy ministers ought to endear the name of the royal patroness of learning to every mind capable of appreciating her magnanimity and moral courage the beauty the talents and rare acquirements of catherine parr together with the delicate tact which taught her how to make the most of these advantages enabled her to retain her empire over the fickle heart of henry for a longer period than the fairest and most brilliant of her predecessors but these charms were not the most powerful talisman with which the queen won her influence it was her domestic virtues her patience her endearing manners that rendered her indispensable to the irritable and diseased voluptuary who was now paying the severe penalty of bodily tortures and mental disquiet for the excesses of his former life henry had grown so corpulent and unwieldy in person that he was incapable of taking the slightest exercise much less of recreating himself with the invigorating field sports and boisterous pastimes in which he had formerly delighted the days had come unexpectedly upon him in which he had no pleasure his body was so swollen and enfeebled by dropsy that he could not be moved to an upper chamber without the aid of machinery hitherto the excitement of playing the leading part in the public drama of royal pomp and pageantry had been with sensual indulgences the principal objects of his life deprived of these and with the records of an evil conscience to dwell upon in the weary hours of pain his irascibility and impatience would have goaded him to frenzy but for the soothing gentleness and tender attentions of his amiable consort catherine was the most skilful and patient of nurses and shrunk not from any office however humble whereby she could afford mitigation to the sufferings of her royal husband it is recorded of her that she would remain four hours on her knees beside him applying fomentations and other palliatives to his ulcerated leg which he would not permit any one to dress but her she had already served an apprenticeship to the infirmities of sickness in her attendance on the deathbeds of her two previous husbands and had doubtless acquired the art of adapting herself to the humours of male invalids a royally born lady might have been of little comfort to henry in the days of his infirmity but catherine parr had been educated in the school of domestic life and was perfect in the practice of its virtues and its duties she sought to charm the ennui which oppressed the once magnificent and active sovereign in the unwelcome quiet of his sick chamber by inducing him to unite with her in directing the studies and watching the hopeful promise of his beloved heir prince edward the following letter addressed to catherine by her royal stepson bears witness to the maternal kindness of the queen and the affection of the precocious student prince edward to catherine parr most honourable and entirely beloved mother i have me most humbly recommended to your grace with like thanks both for that your grace did accept so gently my simple and rude letters and also that it pleased your grace so gently to vouchsafe to direct unto me your loving and tender letters which do give me much comfort and encouragement to go forward in such things wherein your grace beareth me on hand that i am already entered i pray god i may be able to satisfy the good expectation of the king's majesty my father and of your grace whom god have ever in his most blessed keeping your loving son e prince 
there is extant a latin and a french letter addressed to the queen in the same filial style the arrival of the plantipotenaries to negotiate a peace between england and france in the commencement of the year fifteen forty six caused the last gleam of royal festivity and splendor that was ever to enliven the once magnificent court of henry the eighth claude d'ambau the admiral who had a few months previously attempted a hostile descent on the isle of wight and attacked the english fleet was the ambassador extraordinary on this occasion he was received with great pomp at greenwich where he landed and on hounslow heath he was met by a numerous cavalcade of nobles knights and gentlemen in king henry's service headed by the young heir of england prince edward who though only in his ninth year was mounted on a charger and performed his part in the pageant by welcoming the admiral and his suite in the most gracious and engaging manner on bow embraced and kissed the princely boy and all the french nobles were loud in their commendations of the beauty and gallant bearing of this child of early promise prince edward then conducted the embassy to hampton court where for ten days they were feasted and entertained with great magnificence by the king and queen henry on this occasion presented catherine parr with many jewels of great value that she might appear with suitable eclat as his consort to the plantipotenaries of france he also provided new and costly hangings and furniture for her apartments as well as plate which she naturally regarded as her own property but a long and vexatious litigation took place with regard to these gifts after the death of the king as will be shown in its proper place the increasing influence of catherine with king henry and the ascendancy she was acquiring over the opening mind of the future sovereign was watched with jealous alarm by the party most inimical to the doctrines of the reformation Rodesley, the lord chancellor who had been the base suggester to henry the eighth of a breach of faith to anne of cleves and afterwards pursued the monarch's fifth unhappy queen with the zest of a bloodhound till her young head was laid upon the block waited but for a suitable opportunity for effecting the fall of catherine parr gardiner bishop of winchester was his confederate in this intention but so blameless was the conduct so irreproachable the manners of the queen that as in the case of daniel it was impossible for her deadliest foes to find an occasion against her except in the matter of her religious opinions in these she was opposed to henry's arbitrary notions who was endeavouring to erect the dogma of his own infallibility on the ruins of papacy every dissent from his decisions in points of faith had been visited with the most terrible penalties in his last speech to parliament he had bitterly complained of the divisions in religion which distracted his realm for which he partly blamed the priest some of whom he sarcastically observed were so stiff in their old mumpsimus and others so busy with their sumpsimus that instead of preaching the word of god they were employed in railing at each other and partly the fault of the laity whose delight it was to censor the proceedings of their bishops priests and preachers if you know continued the royal polemic that any preach perverse doctrine come and declare it to some of our council or to us to whom is committed by god authority to reform and order such cases and behaviors and be not judges yourselves of your own fantastic opinions and vain expositions and although you be permitted to read holy scriptures and to have the word of god in your mother tongue you must understand it is licensed you so to do only to inform your conscience your children and families and not to dispute and to make scripture a railing and taunting stock against priests and preachers i am very sorry to know and hear how irreverently the precious jewel the word of god is disputed rhymed sung and jangled in every alehouse and tavern contrary to the true meaning and doctrine of the same this speech was a prelude to the rigorous enforcement of the six articles the most interesting victim of the fiery persecution that ensued in the spring and summer of fifteen forty six was the young beautiful and learned anne askew she was a lady of honourable birth and ancient lineage and having become a convert to the new faith was for that cause violently driven from her house 
by her husband, Mr. Kime of Lincolnshire. She then resumed her maiden name, and devoted herself to the promulgation of the religious opinions she had embraced. It was soon known that the queen's sister, Lady Herbert, the Duchess of Suffolk, and other great ladies of the court, countenanced the fair gospeler, nay more, that the queen herself had received books from her, in the presence of Lady Herbert, Lady Turwitt, and the youthful Lady Jane Grey, which might bring her majesty under the penalty of the statute against reading heretical works. The religious opinions of a young and beautiful woman might, perhaps, have been overlooked by men, with whom religion was a matter of party, not conscience. But the supposed connection of Anne Askew with the queen caused her to be singled out, for the purpose of terrifying or torturing her into confessions, that might furnish a charge of heresy or treason against her royal mistress. The unexpected firmness of the Christian heroine baffled this design. She endured the utmost afflictions of Rodesley's vindictive fury, without permitting a syllable to pass her lips that might be rendered subservient to this purpose. Anne Askew had been supported, in prison, by money which had been conveyed to her, from time to time, by persons supposed to be in the service of the ladies of the Queen's bedchamber, and the Lord Chancellor's inquisitorial cruelty was especially exercised, in his attempts to exhort, from the hapless recipient of this charity, the names of her secret friends. It is well known, that when Sir Anthony Nevitt, the lieutenant of the tower, endeavored by his directions to the jailer, to modify the ferocious, and it seems illegal, requisition of Chancellor Rodesley, to inflict severe agonies on the tender but unshrinking victim, his lordship threw off his gown, and with the assistance of his pitiless accomplice, Rich, worked the rack, till, to use Anne's own words, they well nigh plucked her joints asunder. When the lieutenant of the tower found his authority thus superseded, he promptly took boat, and proceeding to the king, indignantly related to him the disgusting scene he had just witnessed. Henry affected to express great displeasure that a female should have been exposed to such barbarity, but he neither punished the perpetrators of the outrage, nor interposed his authority to preserve Anne Askew from a fiery death. Indeed, if the contemporary author, quoted by Speed, is to be credited. Henry had himself ordered Anne Askew to be stretched on the rack, being exasperated against her for having brought prohibited books into his palace, and imbued his queen and his nieces, Suffolk's daughters, with her doctrine. The terrible sentence, which consigned the dislocated frame of the young and lovely Anne Askew, a living prey to the flames, shook not the lofty self-devotion of the victim. Several persons professing the reform doctrine were condemned to die at the same time, among whom were two gentlemen of the royal household, William Morris, the king's gentleman usher, and Sir George Bagg of the privy chamber. The following touching particulars of their last meeting have been recorded by a survivor. I, being alive, narrates John Loud, tutor to Sir Robert Southwell, and a gentleman of Lincoln's Inn, must needs confess of her departed to the Lord. There was a sad party of victims, and their undaunted friends, gathered in the little parlor at Newgate. Sir George Bagg was with Lassels, a gentleman of a right worshipful house, in Nottinghamshire, at Gatford near Worksop, the day before his execution and that of Anne Askew, who had, says the narrator, an angel's countenance and a smiling face. Lassels was in the little parlor by Newgate. He mounted up in the window seat and sat there. He was merry and cheerful in the Lord, and Sir George Bagg sat by his side. One Belenian, a priest, likewise burnt, was there. Three of the Throckmortons were present, Sir Nicholas being one of them. By the same token a person unknown to me said, Ye are all marked men that come to them. Take heed to your lives. The Throckmortons were, to be remembered, the near kinsmen of the queen, and confidential members of her household. They were her elevés and converts withal, to the faith of which she was the nursing mother. Undismayed by the warning they had received, when they came to comfort Anne Askew, and her fellow captives in prison, these heroic brethren ventured to approach her, when she was born to her funeral pyre, in Smithfield, 
for the purpose of offering her sympathy and encouragement. But they were again warned that they were marked men and compelled to withdraw. In a far different spirit came Rodesley, Russell, and others of the ruthless clique to witness the last act of the tragedy and to tempt the weakness of woman's nature by offering her the king's pardon on condition of her recanting. She treated the proposal with the scorn it merited, and her fearless demeanor encouraged and strengthened the resolution of the three men, who shared with her the crown of martyrdom. The male victims were not subjected to torture. They appear to have suffered on matters of faith, unconnected with politics, and as you may be regarded as a sacrifice to the malignity of the party, who failed in making her an instrument in their machinations against the queen. The terror and anguish which must have oppressed the heart of the queen at this dreadful period may be imagined. Not only was she unable to avert the fate of the generous Anne Askew and the other Protestant martyrs, but she was herself, with some of her nearest and dearest connections, on the verge of the like peril. Sir George Bagg, who was involved in the same condemnation with Anne Askew and those who suffered with her, was a great favorite with the king, who was wont to honor him, in moments of familiarity, with the endearing appellation of his pig. Henry does not appear to have been aware of Bagg's arrest till informed of his condemnation. He then sent for Rodesley and rated him, for coming so near him even to his privy chamber, and commanded him to draw out a pardon. Bag, on his release, flew to thank his master, who, seeing him, cried out, Ah, my pig, you are here safe again. Yes, sire, said he, and if your majesty had not been better than your bishops, your pig had been roasted ere this time. Notwithstanding this rebuff, Rodesley and his coadjutors presumed to come somewhat nearer to the king than an attack on members of his household, for they struck at the wife of his bosom. It was shrewdly observed by a contemporary that Gardner had bent his bow to bring down some of the head deer. Victims of less distinguished note were destined to fall first, but it was plain to all that it was to compass the disgrace and death of the queen that the fires of persecution had been rekindled, Rodesley and Gardner having masked an iniquitous political intrigue under the name of religion. The queen's sister, Lady Herbert, had been secretly denounced to Henry, as an active instrument in controverting his edict touching heretical works. This was a subtle prelude for an attack upon the queen herself, for when Henry had reason to suppose she received and read books forbidden by his royal statutes, he was prepared to take every difference in opinion expressed or insinuated by her in the light not only of heresy, but treason. Henry's anger was always the most deadly and dangerous, when he brooded over an offense in silence. Queen Catherine had been accustomed, in their hours of domestic privacy, to converse with him on theological subjects, in which he took great delight. The points of difference in their opinions, and the ready wit, and eloquence with which the queen maintained her side of the question, gave piquancy to these discussions. Henry was at first amused and interested, but controversies between husband and wife are dangerous pastimes to the weaker vessel, especially if she chanced to have the best of the argument. On subjects of less importance to his eternal welfare, Catherine might possibly have enough tact to leave the victory to her lord. But, laboring as she saw him, under a complication of incurable maladies, and loaded with a yet more fearful weight of unrepented crimes, she must have been anxious to awaken him to a sense of his accountability to that almighty judge, at whose tribunal it was evident he must soon appear. With the exception of his murdered tutor, Fisher, Henry's spiritual advisers, whether Catholics or reformers, had all been false to their trust. They had flattered his worst passions and lulled his guilty conscience by crying, Peace, peace, when there was no peace. Catherine Parr was, perhaps, the only person for the last ten years who had the moral courage to speak, even in a modified manner, the language of truth in his presence. Henry, who was neither Catholic nor Protestant, had a sumsimus of his own, which he wished to render the national rule of faith, and was, at last, 
exceedingly displeased that his queen should presume to doubt the infallibility of his opinions. One day she ventured, in the presence of Gardiner, to remonstrate with him on the proclamation he had recently put forth, forbidding the use of a translation of the scriptures, which he had previously licensed. This was at a time when his constitutional irascibility was aggravated by a painful inflammation of his ulcerated leg, which confined him to his chamber. Perhaps Catherine, in her zeal for the diffusion of the truths of Holy Writ, pressed the matter too closely, for the king showed tokens of mislike, and cut the matter short. The queen made a few pleasant observations on other subjects, and withdrew. Henry's suppressed choler broke out, as soon as she had left the room. A good hearing it is, said he, when women become such clerks, and much to my comfort, to come in mine old age, to be taught by my wife. Gardiner, who was present, availed himself of the scornful sally to insinuate things against her majesty, which a few days before he durst not, for his life, have breathed to the king. For, says a contemporary author, never handmaid sought more to please her mistress than she to please his humor, and she was of singular beauty, favor, and comely personage, wherein the king was greatly delighted. But Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, Lord Chancellor Rodesley, and others of the king's privy chamber, practised her death, that they might the better stop the passage of the gospel, yet they durst not speak to the king touching her, because they saw he loved her so well. But now that an offence had been given to the king's egotistical self-idolatry, he was ready to listen to anything that could be said, in disparagement of his dutiful and conscientious wife, her tender nursing, her unremitting attentions to his comfort, together with her amiable and affectionate conduct to his children, were all forgotten. Gardiner flattered him, to the top of his bent, on his theological knowledge and judgment, in which he declared, that his majesty excelled the princes of that, and every other age, as well as all the professed doctors of divinity, insomuch, that it was unseemly for any of his subjects, to argue with him so malapertly, as the queen had just done, that it was grievous for any of his counsellors to hear it done, since those who were so bold in words would not scruple to proceed to acts of disobedience, adding, that he could make great discoveries, if he were not deterred by the queen's powerful faction. In short, he crept so far into the king at that time, says Fox. He and his fellows, so filled Henry's mistrustful mind with fears, that he gave them warrant to consult together about drawing articles against the queen, wherein her life might be touched. Then they thought it best to begin with such ladies as she most esteemed, and were privy to all her doing, as the Lady Herbert, afterwards Countess of Pembroke, her sister, the Lady Jane, who was her first cousin, and the Lady Turwit, all of her privy chamber, and to accuse them of the six articles, and to search their closets and coffers, that they might find somewhat to charge the queen, which being found, the queen should be taken, and carried by night, in a barge, to the tower, of which advice the king was made privy by Gardiner. This purpose was so finely handled, that it grew within few days of the time appointed, and the poor queen suspected nothing, but after her accustomed manner, visited the king, still to deal with him touching religion as before. At this momentous crisis, when the life of the queen might be said to hang on a balance so fearfully poised, that the descent of a feather would have given it a fatal turn, the bill of articles that had been framed against her, together with the mandate for her arrest, were dropped by Rodesley from his bosom, in the gallery at Whitehall, after the royal signature of the king had been affixed. Fortunately, it happened that it was picked up by one of the attendants of the queen, and instantly conveyed to her majesty, whose sweetness of temper and gracious demeanor had endeared her to all her household. End of section four. Section five of Lives of the Queens of England, volume five, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter 2, Part 2. 
it is impossible but that shuddering recollections of the fell decree which doomed henry's second queen anne boleyn to be either burned or beheaded at the king's pleasure and of the summary proceedings by which his last queen catherine was hurried to the block without even the ceremony of a trial must have pressed upon her mind as she glanced at these appalling documents her virtue it is true could not be impugned as theirs had been but she had disappointed the expectation so confidently stated by the king in the act for settling the succession to the crown that their union might be blessed with offspring in that very act there was an ominous clause in case of failure of issue by her which secured a precedency over his daughters to the children he might have by any other queens she had been henry's wife three years and was still childless and as she had not brought a family to either of her former husbands the reproach of barrenness might not unreasonably be ascribed to her by the king it was doubtless to the full as great a crime in his sight as her heresy and it is not improbable that it was even cited in the list of her misdemeanors as the untimely death of catherine of aragon's sons had been impiously construed into evidences that the marriage was displeasing in the sight of god when henry was desirous of another wife when catherine parr became aware from the perusal of the paper so providentially brought to her that a bill for her attainer was prepared and saw that the king had treacherously given his sanction to the machinations of her foes then she concluded that she was to be added to the list of his conjugal decapitations and fell into a hysterical agony she occupied an apartment contiguous to that of the sick and froward monarch and as she fell from one fit into another her shrieks and cries reached his ears finding they continued for many hours either moved with pity or as dr lingard shrewdly suggests incommoded by the noise he sent to inquire what was the matter catherine's physician dr wendy having penetrated the cause of her majesty's indisposition informed the royal messenger that the queen was dangerously ill and that it appeared that her sickness was caused by distress of mind when the king heard this he was either moved with unwanted feelings of compassion for the sufferings of his consort or reminded by his increasing infirmities which had confined him for the last two days to his bed of her unrivalled skill as a nurse and feeling perhaps for the first time how much he should miss her in that capacity if death deprived him of her services he determined to pay her a visit this act of royal condescension was the more remarkable because it was attended with great personal inconvenience to himself for he was carried in a chair into queen catherine's apartment being at that time unable to walk he found her heavy and melancholy and apparently at the point of death at which he evinced much sympathy as if really alarmed at the idea of losing her perhaps he had not till then discovered that she was dearer to him than her fairer and more passionately but briefly loved predecessors anne boleyn and catherine howard the hysterical agonies of those unhappy ladies had produced no such relentings in his vindictive breast though they had been duly reported to him but then to be sure he was out of hearing of their cries catherine parr had besides been twice married before and being a woman of great sense and observation had acquired more experience in adapting herself to the humour of a froward lord than either the gay reckless coquette anne boleyn or the young unlettered howard on this occasion she testified a proper degree of gratitude for the honour of his visit which she assured him had greatly revived and rejoiced her she also adroitly offered an opening for an explanation of the cause of henry's displeasure by expressing herself much distressed at having seen so little of his majesty of late adding that her uneasiness at this was increased by her apprehensions of having been so unhappy as to have given him some unintentional offence henry replied only with gracious and encouraging expressions of his good will during the rest of this critical interview catherine behaved in so humble and endearing a manner and so completely adapted herself to the humour of her imperious lord that in the excitement caused by the reaction of his feelings henry betrayed to her physician the secret of the plot against her life 
the physician being both a good and prudent person acted as a mediator with his sovereign in the first instance and is said to have suggested to the queen the proper means of securing a reconciliation with henry the next evening the queen found herself well enough to return the king's visit in his bedchamber she came attended by her sister lady herbert and the king's young niece lady jane gray who carried the candles before her majesty henry welcomed her very courteously and appeared to take her attention in good part but presently turned the conversation to the old subject of controversy for the purpose of beguiling her into an argument catherine adroitly avoided the snare by observing that she was but a woman accompanied with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of her sex therefore in all matters of doubt and difficulty she must refer herself to his majesty's better judgment as to her lord and head for so god hath appointed you continued she as the supreme head of us all and of you next unto god will i ever learn not so by saint mary said the king ye are become a doctor kate to instruct us and not to be instructed of us as oftentime we have seen indeed replied the queen if your majesty have so conceived my meaning has been mistaken for i have always held it preposterous for a woman to instruct her lord and if i have ever presumed to differ with your highness on religion it was partly to obtain information for my own comfort regarding certain nice points on which i stood in doubt and sometimes because i perceived that in talking you were better able to pass away the pain and weariness of your present infirmity which encouraged me to this boldness in the hope of profiting withal by your majesty's learned discourse and is it so sweetheart replied the king then are we perfect friends he then kissed her with much tenderness and gave her leave to depart on the day appointed for her arrest the king being convalescent sent for the queen to take the air with him in the garden catherine came attended as before by her sister lady jane gray and lady tyrwhitt presently the lord chancellor Rodesley, with forty of the guard entered the garden with the expectation of carrying off the queen to the tower for he had not received the slightest intimation of the change in the royal caprice the king received him with a burst of indignation saluted him with the unexpected address of beast fool and knave and sternly withdrawing him from the vicinity of the queen he bade him avaunt from his presence catherine when she saw the king so greatly incensed with the chancellor had the magnanimity to intercede for her foe saying she would become a humble suitor for him as she deemed his fault was occasioned by mistake ah poor soul said the king thou little knowest kate how evil he deserveth this grace at thy hands on my word sweetheart he hath been to thee a very knave catherine parr treated the authors of the cruel conspiracy against her life with the magnanimity of a great mind and the forbearance of a true christian she sought no vengeance although the reaction of the king's uxorious fondness would undoubtedly have given her the power of destroying them if she had been of a vindictive temper but though henry was induced through the intercession of catherine to overlook the offence of Rodesley, he never forgave gardiner the part he had taken in this affair which proved no less a political blunder than a moral crime it was the death-blow of his credit with the king who not only struck his name out of his council book but forbade him his presence gardiner notwithstanding this prohibition had the boldness to present himself before the sovereign on the terrace at windsor among his former colleagues when henry observed him he turned fiercely to his chancellor and said did i not command you that he should come no more among you my lord of winchester replied Rodesley, has come to wait upon your highness with the offer of a benevolence from his clergy this was touching the right cord for money never came amiss to the rapacious and needy monarch from any quarter henry condescended to receive the address and to accept the bribe but took no further notice of the bishop than to strike his name out of the list of his executors henry cancelled that of twirlby bishop of winchester also because he said the latter was schooled by gardiner so careful was the king to leave neither power nor influence in the counsel of his successors to the man 
who had tempted him to close his reign with the murder of his innocent wife. Henry is said to have exhibited many public marks, of course, but confiding fondness for Queen Catherine Parr in his latter days. He was accustomed to call her sweetheart, and to lay his sore leg on her lap before the lords and ladies-in-waiting, and sometimes, it is said, he so forgot the restraints of royalty as to do so in the presence of the whole court. The queen, who was still a very pretty little woman, and quite young enough to have been his daughter, was careful to receive these rude endearments, as flattering marks of the favor of her royal lord. Yet after the fearful warning she had received from the capricious nature of his love, and the treachery of his disposition, she must have regarded herself as a poor pensioner on the bounties of an hour. How indeed could the sixth wife of Henry pillow her head on his cruel bosom, without dreaming of axes and flames, or fearing to see the curtains withdrawn by the pale spectres of his former matrimonial victims? Her wifely probation, as Queen Consort of England, was, however, near its close, for Henry's own tragedy was rapidly drawing to a termination. This last act was to be stained with the blood of the most accomplished nobleman in his dominions, the gallant Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, the cousin of his two beheaded queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, and the friend and brother-in-law of his passionately loved son, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond. Surrey has generally been regarded as the victim of the Seymour party, who had obtained a great ascendancy in the council, since Gardiner had committed the false step of practicing against the life of the queen. Catherine Parr, though she had labored, at the peril of being sent to the scaffold, to obtain toleration and liberty of conscience for those of her own religion, had hitherto carefully abstained from implicating herself with the intrigues of either party. Now she naturally threw the weight of her quiet influence into the scale of those who supported the doctrine of the Reformation. With this party, which was headed by the Seymours, her brother, the Earl of Essex, and her sister's husband, Lord Herbert, were allied. A mortal hatred subsisted between the newly aggrandized family of Seymour and the house of Howard. The high-spirited heir of Norfolk, in whose veins flowed the blood of Charlemagne and the Plantagenets, was known to look with contempt on the new nobility, and had rashly expressed his intention of avenging the insolence with which he had been treated by the Earl of Hertford, when a convenient season should arrive. The precarious state of the sovereign's health warned the Seymours to make the most of the power which they had got into their hands. Among the absurd charges that were brought against Surrey, one must have been artfully framed to cause disquiet to Queen Catherine, which was, that he had conceived the monstrous project of marrying his beautiful sister, the Duchess Dowager of Richmond, to the king, although she was the widow of that monarch's reputed son Henry, Duke of Richmond. Stranger still, the young lady herself, out of revenge, as it is supposed, to her noble brother, for having prevented her father from bestowing her in marriage on the Admiral Sir Thomas More, of whom she was deeply enamored, came forward as a witness against him, and deposed, that he had instructed her how to behave herself, that she might obtain private interviews with the king, and so endear herself in his favor, that she might rule as others had done. As Henry had already married two fair ladies of the Howard lineage, through whose influence the Blanche Lion had for a brief period triumphed over all rivals in the court, the foes of Surrey and his aged father calculated that this odious accusation might possibly obtain sufficient credit to excite the indignation of the people and the jealousy of the queen, so far, at any rate, as to deter her from interceding in the behalf of the victims of their murderous policy. The unmerited fate of the gallant and accomplished Surrey has been ever considered as one of the darkest blots of the crime-stained annals of Henry the Eighth. It is somewhat remarkable that this monarch, who had received a learned education, made pretensions to authorship, and affected to be a patron of the Bell Letters, sent the three most distinguished literary characters of his court, Sir Thomas More, Lord Rockford, and Surrey, to the block, from feelings of private and personal malice, and in so illegal a manner, that the executions of all three deserve no gentler name than murder. Surrey was beheaded on the 19th of January, 1547, 
Henry then lay on his deathbed, and his swollen and feeble hands having been long unequal to the task of guiding a pen, a stamp, with the facsimile of the initials H.R., was affixed to the death warrant in his presence. In like manner was that of the execution of the Duke of Norfolk signed. This aged nobleman claimed a threefold relationship to the king, as the husband of his maternal aunt, the Princess Anne Plantagenet, and as the uncle of two of Henry's queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. According to the custom of those times, he had no doubt been occasionally called by the king, his uncle Norfolk. Yet the last act of Henry's life was to dispatch a messenger to the lieutenant of the tower, with an order for the execution of the unfortunate duke, early on the following morning. This was on the evening of the 26th of January. A more irrevocable fiat had, however, gone forth against the relentless tyrant, and, ere that morning dawned, which was to have seen the last of the hoary head of Norfolk fall on the scaffold, he himself was a corpse. When the physicians announced to those in attendance on the sovereign that the hour of his departure was at hand, they shrunk from the peril of incurring the last ebullition of his vindictive temper by warning him of the awful change that awaited him. The queen, worn out with days and nights of fatiguing personal attendance on her wayward lord, during the burning fever which had preyed upon him for more than two months, was in all probability unequal to the trial of witnessing the last fearful scene, for she was not mentioned as having been present on that occasion. Sir Anthony Denny was the only person who had the courage to inform the king of his real state. He approached the bed, and leaning over it, told him, that all human aid was now vain, and that it was meet for him to review his past life, and seek for God's mercy through Christ. Henry, who was uttering loud cries of pain and impatience, regarded him with a stern look, and asked, What judge had sent him to pass this sentence upon him? Then he replied, Your physicians. When these physicians next approached the royal patient to offer him medicine, he repelled them in these words, after the judges have once passed sentence on a criminal, they have no more to do with him, therefore be gone. It was then suggested that he should confer with some of his divines. I will see no one but Cramner, replied the king, and not him as yet. Let me repose a little, and as I find myself so, shall I determine. After an hour's sleep, he awoke, and becoming faint, commanded that Cramner, who had withdrawn to Croydon, should be sent for with all haste. But the precious interval had been wasted, and before the archbishop entered, Henry was speechless. Cramner besought him to testify by some sign his hope in the saving mercy of Christ. The king regarded him steadily for a moment, wrung his hand, and expired. To vet bears testimony to the dying monarch's remorse of conscience, for the murder of Anne Boleyn in particular, and of his other crimes in general. Harpsfield describes him as afflicted with visionary horrors at the hour of his departure, for that he glanced with rolling eyes and looks of wild import towards the darker recesses of his chamber, muttering to himself, Monks! Monks! But whether this ejaculation implied that his disordered fancy had peopled vacancy with cowled figures, or that he was desirous of summoning monks to assist at his last orisons, must forever remain a mystery. Warned of the moment of approaching disillusion, says another writer, and scorched with the death thirst, he craved a cup of white wine, and, turning to one of his attendants, he exclaimed, All is lost! These were his last words. The same author avers that Henry was preparing an accusation against his queen, on the old charge of heresy, which was only prevented by his death. If this were indeed the case, it would sufficiently account for the silence of contemporaries touching Catherine Parr's proceedings at the time of her royal husband's death. This throws some light, too, on the general remark of the historians of that period, that Catherine's life was providentially preserved, by the decease of Henry at a critical period for her, and that it was only by a special good luck that she was the survivor. The only notice of the queen which occurs at this period is contained in a letter addressed to her on the 10th of January by Prince Edward, in which he thanks her for her New Year's gift, the pictures of herself and the king his father, which will delight him, he says, 
to contemplate in their absence. He calls her illustrious queen and dearest mother. The youthful heir of England was at Hertford, with his preceptors, at the time of the last illness of his royal father. Henry the Eighth expired at two o'clock in the morning of January 28th, 1547, at his royal palace of Westminster, in the thirty-eighth year of his reign, and the fifty-sixth of his age. This important event was kept secret, till the Earl of Hertford had obtained possession of the person of his royal nephew, the young King Edward the Sixth, and arranged his plans for securing the government of England in his name. The Parliament met on the twenty-ninth, according to an adjournment, which had been moved during the life of the Sovereign, and received no intimation of his demise till Monday, the last day of January, when Rodesley, the Chancellor, announced, to the assembled peers and commons, the death of their late dread lord, which, says the deceitful record, was unspeakably sad and sorrowful to all hearers, the chancellor himself being almost disabled, by his tears, from uttering the words. A part of Henry's will was then read by Sir William Paget, Secretary of State, and the Parliament was declared by the chancellor to be dissolved by the demise of the crown. When the will of Henry the Eighth was opened, the queen expressed the utmost surprise on learning that she was not appointed to the regency of the realm, and the care of the person of the young king. She complained bitterly of the counsellors and executors of King Henry, and of those persons under whose influence his last testament had been made, but they paid no attention to her displeasure. In his will, Henry places the children he may have by his queen Catherine Parr, in the order of succession, immediately after his only son, Prince Edward, giving them precedency of the princesses Mary and Elizabeth. If, therefore, the queen had borne a posthumous daughter to Henry, a civil war would unquestionably have been the result. The words are, And per default of lawful issue of our son, Prince Edward, we will that the said imperial crown, and other premises, after our two deceases, shall fully remain and come to the heirs of our entirely beloved wife, Queen Catherine, that now is, or of any other our lawful wife, that we shall hereafter marry. The last sentence seems ominous enough to the childless queen, implying that Henry meant to survive her, and was seriously providing for the contingency of his issue by a seventh queen. The preamble to the legacy he bequeathed to Catherine Parr contains, however, a very high testimony to her virtues. And for the great love, obedience, chastity of life, and wisdom, being in our forenamed wife and queen, we bequeath unto her for her proper life, and as to shall please her to order it, three thousand pounds in plate, jewels, and stuff of the household goods, and such apparel as it shall please her to take of such as we have already. And further, we give unto her one thousand pounds in money, and the amount of her dower and jointure, according to our grant in Parliament. This legacy, when the relative value of money is considered, as well as the destitution of the exchequer at the time, will not be thought so inadequate a bequest as it appears. Catherine Parr was amply dowered by Parliament, and by the King's patents, and she had two dowers besides, as the widow of the Lord's Borough and Latimer. She was supposed to have made great savings while she was queen consort. After the death of the king, she received all the honors due to his acknowledged widow. He left too, be it remembered. But she was prayed for as queen dowager, in the presence of the young king, by her old enemy Gardner, in the following prayer for the royal family. I commend to God Queen Catherine, dowager, my lady Mary's grace, and my lady Elizabeth's grace, your majesty's dear sisters. On the 7th of February, after Henry the Eighth's death, King Edward the Sixth wrote a Latin letter of condolence to his widowed stepmother, superscribed, Regina Catherine, calling her his dear mother and concluding, Farewell, venerated queen. The news of Henry's death was received with exultation at Rome. The Pope asked Cardinal Pole, why he did not rejoice with the rest at the death of this great enemy of the church. Pole replied, that nothing would be gained by that event, for the young King Edward had been educated by preceptors of Lutheran and Zwinglian principles, that the council of regency was composed of persons of the same class, and to complete all, 
his uncles and the queen mother catherine parr were more obstinate in their heresies than all the rest while henry's body lay in state gardiner held a controversy with lord oxford's players who were located at southwark his own diocese these players chose to act a splendid play gardiner thought it more decent as he said to perform a solemn dirge for his master as beseemeth whilst he lay unburied he applied to the justice of peace against the players who mean says he to see which shall have more resort them or i adding that if he could not prevent the acting of the play he could and would prevent the people from going to see it while the king's body was above ground the following account of the pompous and certainly very catholic obsequies of henry the eighth is taken from a book in the college arms the chest wherein the royal corpse was laid stood in the midst of the privy chamber with lights and divine service was said about him with masses obsequies and continual watch made by the chaplains and gentlemen of the privy chamber in their course and order night and day for five days till the chapel was ready where was a goodly hearse with eighty square tapers every light containing two feet in length and in whole one thousand eight hundred or two thousand weight in wax garnished with pencils escutcheons banners and banneroles of descents and at the four corners banners of saints beaten in fine gold upon damask with a majesty for example canopy over of rich cloth of tissue and valance of black silk and fringe of black silk and gold the barriers without the hearse and the sides and floor of the chapel were covered with black cloth to the high altar and the sides and ceiling set with the banners and standards of st george and others the second of february the corpse was removed and brought into the chapel by the lord great master and officers of the household and their place within the hearse under a pall of rich cloth of tissue garnished with scutcheons and a rich cloth of gold set with precious stones it continued there twelve days with masses and dirges sung and said every day norroy each day standing at the choir door and beginning with these words in a loud voice of your charity pray for the soul of the high and mighty prince our late sovereign lord and king henry the eighth february fourteenth the corpse was removed for interment there is an appalling incident connected with that journey which we copy from a contemporary manuscript among the sloan collection the king being carried to windsor to be buried stood all night among the broken walls of sion and there the leaden coffin being cleft by the shaking of the carriage the pavement of the church was wetted with henry's blood in the morning came plumbers to solder the coffin under whose feet i tremble while i write it says the author was suddenly seen a dog creeping and licking up the king's blood if you ask me how i know this i answer william Grivel, who could scarcely drive away the dog told me and so did the plumber also it appears certain that the sleepy mourners and choristers had retired to rest after the midnight dirges were sung leaving the dead king to defend himself as best he might from the assaults of his ghostly enemies and some people might think they made their approaches in a currish form it is scarcely however to be wondered that a circumstance so frightful should have excited feelings of superstitious horror especially at such a time and place for this desecrated convent had been the prison of his unhappy queen catherine howard whose tragic fate was fresh in the minds of men and by a singular coincidence it happened that henry's corpse rested there the very day after the fifth anniversary of her execution there is a class of writers too who regard the accident which just had been related as a serious fulfillment of friar pato's denunciation against henry from the pulpit of greenwich church in 1553 when that daring preacher compared him to ahab and told him to his face that the dogs would in like manner lick his blood in a very different light henry was represented by bishop gardiner in the adulatory funeral sermon which he preached at windsor on the sixteenth of february on the text blessed are the dead who die in the lord in which he set forth the loss both high and low had sustained in the death of so good and gracious a king but to return to the ceremonial the corpse being conveyed with great pomp to st george's chapel windsor castle 
was when interred let down into the vault by means of a vice with the help of sixteen tall yeomen of the guard the same bishop gardiner standing at the head of the vault proceeded in the burial service and about the same stood all the head officers of the household as the lord great master the lord chamberlain lord treasurer lord comptroller sergeant porter and the four gentlemen ushers in ordinary with their staves and rods in their hands and when the mould was brought and cast into the grave by the officiating prelate at the words pulvis pulveri chinis chinere then first the lord great master and after him the lord chamberlain and all the rest break their staves in shivers upon their heads and cast them after the corpse into the pit with exceeding sorrow and heaviness not without grievous sighs and tears after this de profundis was said the grave covered over with planks and garter attended by his officers stood in the midst of the choir and proclaimed the young king's titles and the rest of his officers repeated the same after him thrice then the trumpet sounded with great melody and courage to the comfort of all them that were present acting as a cordial to the official weepers it may be presumed after their hydraulic efforts were concluded on the banners carried at henry the eighth's funeral the arms of his late wife queen jane were displayed quartered with his likewise a banner of the arms of queen catherine parr his widow these being the only wives he acknowledged out of six end of section five Section six of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume five, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter two, Part three. During the brief period of her royal widowhood, Catherine Parr, now Queen Dowager, resided at her fine jointure house at Chelsea, on the banks of the Thames, with its beautiful and extensive gardens occupied the pleasant spot now called cheney pier some of the noble trees in mr deuce's gardens appear coeval with that epoch and are perhaps the same under whose budding verdure queen catherine was accustomed to hold her secret meetings with her adventurous lover sir thomas seymour ere royal etiquette would allow her to give public encouragement to his suit faulkner assures us that at the time of catherine parr's residence at chelsea place there was but one passable road in the village which was a private way to the royal residence across the open fields it crossed a footbridge called in ancient records blandell bridge afterwards the scene of many murders by highwaymen which caused the name to be corrupted in vulgar parlance to bloody bridge across this dangerous track the lord admiral must have taken his nocturnal path to the queen seymour renewed his addresses to catherine so immediately after king henry's death that she was wooed and won almost before she had assumed the widow's hood and barb and sweeping sable pall which marked the relict of the departed majesty of england seymour had opportunities of confidential communication with the widowed queen even before the funeral of the royal rival for whom she had been compelled to resign him when lady latimer for he was a member of the late king's household and had been appointed by henry's will one of the council of regency during the minority of the young king his person and characteristics are thus described by hayward the lord sudley he had been elevated to that title by his nephew edward the sixth was fierce in courage courtly in fashion in personage stately in voice magnificent but somewhat empty in matter he was still in the prime of life and possessed of the peculiar manners calculated to charm the softer sex though he had made more than one attempt to secure a splendid alliance he had the art to make the queen dowager believe that he was still a bachelor for her sake catherine after having been the wife of three mature widowers in succession to the last of whom that joyless bauble a crown had tricked her into three years six months and fourteen days of worse than egyptian bondage found herself in her thirty-fifth year still handsome and apparently more passionately beloved than ever by the man of her heart 
Womanlike, she gave him full credit for constancy and disinterested love, and found it difficult to withstand his ardent pleadings, to reward his tried affection, by resigning to him the hand which had been plighted to him, before her marriage with the king. The postscript of the following letter, evidently not the first billet due, the widowed queen had penned to Seymour, contains an interesting comment on her feelings on the occasion of their previous separation, and the painful struggle it had caused. My lord, I send you my most humble and hearty commendations, being desirous to know how ye have done since I saw you. I pray you to be not offended with me, in that I send sooner to you than I said I would, for my promise was but once in a fortnight. Howbeit the time is well abbreviated, by what means I know not, except weeks be shorter at Chelsea than in other places. My lord, your brother hath deferred answering such requests, as I made to him till his coming hither, which he saith shall be immediately after the term. This is not the first promise I have received of his coming, and yet unperformed. I think my lady hath taught him that lesson, for it is her custom to promise many comings to her friends, and to perform none. I trust in greater matters she is more circumspect. And thus, my lord, I make my end, bidding you most heartily farewell, wishing you the good I would myself, from Chelsea. P.S. I would not have you to think, that this mine honest good will, toward you, to proceed from any sudden motion of passion, for, as truly as God is God, my mind was fully bent, the other time I was at liberty, to marry you before any man I know. Howbeit God withstood my will therein, most vehemently for a time, and through his grace and goodness, made that possible which seemed to me most impossible, that was, made me renounce utterly mine own will, and to follow his will most willingly. It were long to write all the process of this matter, if I live, I shall declare it to you myself. I can say nothing, but as my lady of Suffolk saith, God is a marvellous man. By her that is yours to serve and obey during her life, Catherine the Queen, K.P. Endorsed. The Queen's letter from Chelsea to my Lord Admiral. The answer to the Lord Admiral of her former loves. Seymour, who was determined not to lose Catherine a second time, would brook no delays, not even those which propriety demanded. The following letter was written by Queen Catherine, in reply to one of his love letters, wherein, among other matters, their immediate marriage appears to have been warmly urged by the Admiral. My Lord, as I gather by your letter, delivered to my brother Herbert, ye are in some fear how to frame my lord your brother to speak in your favour the denial of your request shall make his folly more manifest to the world which will more grieve me than the want of his speaking i would not wish you to importune his good will if it come not frankly at the first it shall be sufficient once to require it and then to cease I would desire you might obtain the king's letters in your favor, and also the aid and furtherance of the most notable of the council, such as ye shall think convenient. Which thing, obtained, shall be no small shame to your brother and loving sister, in case they do not the like. My lord, whereas ye charge me with a promise, written with mine own hand, to change the two years into two months, I think ye have no such plain sentence written with my hand. I know not whether ye be a paraphraser or not. If ye be learned in that science, it is possible you may of one word make a whole sentence, and yet not at all times alter the true meaning of the writer, as it appeareth by this your exposition upon my writing. When it shall be your pleasure to repair hither, ye must take some pain to come early in the morning, that ye may be gone again by seven o'clock, and so I suppose ye may come without suspect. I pray you let me have knowledge overnight, at what hour ye will come, that your portress may wait at the gate to the fields for you. And thus, with your most humble and hearty commendations, I take my leave of you for this time, giving you like thanks for your coming to court when I was there, from Chelsea. P.S. I will keep in store till I speak with you my lord's large offer, for Faustern, at which time I shall be glad to know your further pleasure therein. By her that is, and shall be, your humble, true, and loving wife, during her life, 
Catherine the Queen, K.P. Although the precise date of Catherine Parr's fourth nuptials is uncertain, it is evident that the admiral's eloquence prevailed over her punctilio at a very early period of her widowhood by persuading her to consent to a private marriage. Letty affirms that exactly thirty-four days after King Henry's death, a written contract of marriage and rings of betrothal were exchanged between Catherine and Sir Thomas Seymour, but the marriage was not celebrated till some months later. According to Edward the Sixth journal, this event took place in May, but it was certainly not made public till the end of June. Great censure has been passed on Queen Catherine for contracting matrimony again so soon after the death of her royal husband. But, in the first place, she owed neither love nor reverence to the memory of a consort, who had held a sword suspended over her by a single hair for the last six months of their union, and in the next, Henry himself had previously led her into a similar breach of wittily decorum by inducing her to become his wife, within almost as brief a period after the death of her second husband, Lord Latimer, as her marriage with Seymour after his own. It appears evident, from the tenor of the following reverential letter, dated May 17th, from Seymour to Queen Catherine, which we give verbatim, that they had been privately married for some days, and that, at the time it was written, he was doubtful, from the cross-questioning of her sister, Lady Herbert, whether the Queen had confided the secret to her, or circumstances had been whispered abroad, which had led to unpleasant reports as to the nature of his nocturnal visits to Her Majesty. Seymour to Catherine Parr. After my humble commendation unto your highness, yesternight I supped at my brother Herbert's, of whom, for your sake besides mine own, I received good cheer, and after the same I received from your highness, by my sister Herbert, your commendations, which were more welcome than they were sent. And after the same, she, Lady Herbert, waited further with me touching my lodging with your highness at Chelsea, which I denied lodging with your highness, but that indeed I went by the garden as I went to the Bishop of London's house, and at this point stood with her a long time, till at last she told me further tokens, which made me change color, who, like a false wench, took me with the manner. Then remembering what she was, and knowing how well ye trust her, examine whether those things came from your highness or were feigned. She answered, that they came from your highness, and he, Lord Herbert, that he knew it to be true. For the which I render unto your highness my most humble and hearty thanks, for by her company, in default of yours, I shall shorten the weeks in these parts, which heretofore were four days longer in every one of them, than they were under the plummet at Chelsea. Besides this commodity, I may also inform your highness, by her, how I do proceed in my matter, although I should take my old friend, Walter Errol. I have not as yet attempted my strength, for that I would be first thoroughly in credit, ere I would move the same. But beseeching your highness that I may not so use my said strength, that they shall think, and hereafter cast in my teeth, that by their suit I sought and obtained your good will, for hitherto I am out of all their dangers for any pleasure that they have done for me, worthy of thanks, and, as I judge, your highness may say the like. Wherefore mine advice will keep us, so nothing mistrusting the goodness of God, but we shall be able to live out of their danger, as they shall out of ours. Yet I mean not to use their friendship to bring our purpose to pass, as occasion shall serve if I knew by what mean I might gratify your highness, for your goodness to me, showed at our last lodging together, it should not be slack to declare mine lady again, and to that intent that I might be more bound unto your highness, that once in three days I might receive three lines and a letter from you, and as many lines and letters more, as shall seem good unto your highness. Also, I shall humbly desire your highness to give me one of your small pictures, if ye have any left, who with his silence shall give me occasion to think on the friendly cheer that I shall receive when my suit shall be at an end, and thus, for fear of troubling your highness with my long and rude letter, I take my leave of your highness, wishing that my hap may be one so good, that I may declare so much by mouth at the same hour that this was writing, which was twelve of the clock in the night, 
this tuesday the seventeenth of may at st james's i wrote your highness a line in my last letter that my lord of somerset was going to that shire who hath been sick which by the blank thereof and as i understand may get thither as to-morrow from him whom ye have bound to honour love and in all lawful things obey t seymour etc endorsed the lord admiral to the queen in this lover-like and romantic manner did the fair queen dowager and her secretly wedded lord pass the merry month of may which according to king edward's diary was their bridal month the oft-repeated assertion that catherine wedded seymour so immediately after the death of her royal husband that had she proved a mother so soon as she might have done it would have been a doubt whether the child should have been accounted the late king's or the admiral's rests wholly on the charge that was brought after her decease against seymour in his indictment catherine for her own sake would scarcely have married till full three months had elapsed since the death of the king as her issue whether male or female by the tenor of henry the eighth's will would have been heir presumptive to the crown of england and she was too prudent and at the same time too ambitious to have risked the benefit and dignity she would have obtained by a contingency that might have ultimately given her the rank and power of a queen mother may was certainly the earliest period in which she could with any degree of safety to say nothing of propriety contract matrimony with her former lover and even this notwithstanding the precedent afforded by the parallel case of the precipitate marriage of mary queen of france with charles brandon was a great breach of royal etiquette seymour at length became impatient of the restraints that attended his clandestine intercourse with his royal bride and applied to the princess mary for her advice and influence in the matter in her dry and very characteristic reply the princess commences with allusions to some amplification of her establishment which the interest of lord seymour in the council of guardianship and regency had expedited my lord after my hearty commendations these shall be to declare to you that according to your accustomed gentleness i have received six warrants from you by your servant this bearer or the bearer of this for the which i do give you my hearty thanks by whom also i received your letter wherein as methinketh i perceive strange news concerning a suit you have in hand to the queen for marriage for the sooner obtaining whereof you seem to think that my letters might do you a favour my lord in this case i trust your wisdom doth consider that if it were for my nearest kinsman and dearest friend on live or alive of all other creatures in the world it standeth least with my poor honour to be a meddler in this matter considering whose wife her grace was of late and besides that if she be minded to grant your suit my letter shall do you but small pleasure on the other side if the remembrance of the king's majesty my father whose soul god pardon will not suffer her to grant your suit i am nothing able to persuade her to forget the loss of him who is as yet very rife in mine own remembrance wherefore i shall most earnestly require of you or the premises considered to think none unkindness in me though i refuse to be a meddler any ways in this matter assuring you that wooing matters set apart wherein being a maid i am nothing cunning if other ways it shall lie in my power to do you pleasure i shall be as glad to do it as you to require it both for his blood's sake that you be of and also for the gentleness which i have always found in you as knoweth almighty god to whose tuition i commit you from wainstead this saturday at night being the fourth of june your assured friend to my power mary the princess elizabeth was at that time residing at chelsea with queen catherine to whose maternal care she had been consigned by the council of the young king it is very likely that she was very well acquainted with the whole affair for even if the queen had not made her a confidant her acute powers of observation and natural talent for intrigue would undoubtedly have enabled her to penetrate the cause of the handsome seymour's mysterious visits and admissions through the postern gate of the gates at chelsea 
In the latter end of May, Queen Catherine was sojourning at St. James's Palace for a few days, and while there, she wrote the young king a Latin letter on the subject of her great love for his late father, Henry the Eighth. This was rather an extraordinary subject for the royal widow to dilate upon, since she was at the very time married to Seymour. She added to her letter many quotations from scripture, and expressed an earnest desire that the young monarch would answer the epistle, which he did, in the same learned language. The following is a translation of Edward's letter. That of Catherine Parr is lost, but the answer gives a clear idea of its contents. As I was so near to you, and saw you, or expected to see you every day, I wrote no letter to you, since letters are tokens of remembrance and kindness between those who are at a great distance. But, being urged by your request, I would not abstain longer from writing. First, that I may do what is acceptable to you, and then to answer the letter you wrote to me when you were at St. James's, in which, first you set before my eyes the great love you bear my father the king, of most noble memory, then your good will towards me, and lastly, your godliness and knowledge and learning in the scriptures. Proceed, therefore, in your good course. I continue to love my father, and to show the same great kindness to me which I have ever perceived in you. Cease not to love and read the scriptures, but persevere in always reading them, for in the first, you show the duty of a good wife and a good subject, and in the second, the warmth of your friendship, and in the third, your piety to God. Wherefore, since you love my father, I cannot but much esteem you, since you love me, I cannot but love you in return, and since you love the word of God, I do love and admire you with my whole heart. Wherefore, if there be anything wherein I may do you a kindness, either in word or deed, I will do it willingly. Farewell, this 30th of May. The artless young sovereign was in the end not only induced to recommend his wily uncle to his widowed stepmother for a husband, but led to believe that it was actually a match of his own making. In the innocence of his heart, Edward wrote the following letter with his own hand to Queen Catherine, in which he expresses himself highly obliged to her for acceding to his wish by marrying his uncle. The dignity with which the monarch, in his tenth year, offers his royal protection to the mature bride and bridegroom is truly amusing. To the Queen's Grace We thank you heartily, not only for the gentle acceptation of our suit moved unto you, but also for the loving accomplishing of the same, wherein you have declared, not only a desire to gratify us, but to declare the good will, likewise that we bear to you in all your requests. Wherefore ye shall not need to fear any grief to come, or to suspect lack of aid in need, seeing that he being mine uncle, is of so good a nature, that he will not be troublesome any means unto you, and I of such mind, that for divers just causes I must favor you. But even as without cause you merely require help against him, whom you have put in trust with the carriage of these letters, so may I merely return the same request unto you, to provide that he may live with you also without grief, which hath given him wholly unto you, and I will so provide for you both, that if hereafter any grief befall, I shall be a sufficient succor in your godly or praiseable enterprises. Fear ye well, with much increase of honor and virtue in Christ. From St. James, the five-and-twenty day of June. Edward. Endorsed in an antique hand. The King's Majesty's Letter to the Queen, After Marriage, June twenty-fifth, 1548. Young Edward, in his journal, notices the anger of the Lord Protector at the marriage of the Admiral with the Queen Dowager. Somerset and his council loudly condemned the presumption of the audacious Seymour, in daring to contract this lofty alliance, without leave or license of those who exercised the authority of the crown. They did what they could to testify their hostility, by withholding from Queen Catherine all the jewels that had been presented to her by the late king, under the pretext that they were not personal property, but heirlooms to the crown. This was touching the lady on a very tender point. Can a bride forget her ornaments? Is a scriptural query, founded on the characteristic attachment of females for these glittering toys. 
neither the equanimity nor the philosophy of this learned queen was proof against such a provocation as the detention of the costly endowments which had formed a portion of her conjugal wages during the perilous term of her servitude to her royal husband's caprices the indignant remonstrances of the royal dowager were unavailing her jewels were never restored and that their detention was no less illegal than vexatious may be gathered from the following observation of the lord admiral my brother is wondrous hot in helping every man to his right save me he maketh a great matter to let me have the queen's jewels which you see by the whole opinion of the lawyers ought to belong to me and all under pretence that he would not the king should lose so much as if it were a loss to the king to let me have mine own the loss of her jewels was neither the only affront nor the only wrong to which the queen dowager was subjected from her powerful brother-in-law he had fixed his mind on obtaining a lease of her favorite manor of faustern for a person of the name of long and we have seen with what scorn catherine in her first letter to the admiral speaks of his brother's large offer for faustern the protector however strong in the authority of his office actually caused long to be admitted as a tenant of her majesty's demesne in defiance of her wish to retain the property in her own hands catherine gives a lively account of her wrath at this outrage in the following letter to her husband she says my lord this shall be to advertise you that my lord your brother hath this afternoon made me a little warm it was fortunate we were so much distant for i suppose else i should have bitten him what cause have they to fear she adds playfully having such a wife to-morrow or else upon saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon i will see the king when i intend to utter all my choler to my lord your brother if you shall not give me advice to the contrary for i would be loath to do anything to hinder your matter i will declare to you how my lord hath used me concerning faustern and after i shall most humbly desire you to direct mine answer to him in that behalf it liked him to-day to send my chancellor to me willing him to declare to me that he had brought master long's lease and that he doubted not but i would let him enjoy the same to his commodity wherein i should do to his succession no small pleasure nothing considering his honour which this matter toucheth not a little for so much as i at sundry times declared unto him that only cause of my repair into those parts was for the commodity of the park which else i would not have done he notwithstanding hath so used the matter with giving master long such courage that he hath refused to receive such cattle as are brought here for the provision of my house and so in the meantime i am forced to commit them to the farmers my lord i beseech you send me word with speed how i shall order myself to my new brother and thus i take my leave with my most humble and hearty commendations wishing you all your godly desires and so well to do as i would myself and better from chelsea in great haste by your humble true and loving wife in her heart catherine the queen k p whether catherine enjoyed the satisfaction of telling the protector her mind in the presence of his royal nephew does not appear but she was probably frustrated in her intention of obtaining an interview with the young king by the party most interested in keeping them apart surely so rich a scene as that which she meditated would have been recorded if it had ever taken place somerset is supposed to have been excited to this injurious treatment of the widow of his royal master and benefactor henry the eighth by the malice of his duchess who had always borne envious ill-will against catherine parr many and various are the accounts given by historians of the cause of the fatal animosity borne by these ladies towards each other open hostility between them broke out after the marriage of catherine with the admiral in consequence of the duchess of somerset refusing any longer to fulfil her office of bearing up the train of the queen dowager alleging that it was unsuitable for her to submit to perform that service for the wife of her husband's younger brother according to lloyd the duchess not only refused to bear up the queen's train but actually jostled with her for precedence so that continues he quaintly what between the train of the queen and the long gown of the duchess they raised so much dust at court as at last 
put out the eyes of both of their husbands, and caused their executions. The pretense on which the Duchess of Somerset founded her presumptuous dispute for precedency with the Queen Dowager in the court of Edward the Sixth was that as the wife of the protector and guardian of the realm, she had a right to take place of every lady in England. It is possible that, with the exception of the ladies of the royal family, she might. But the act of Henry the Eighth, whereby it was provided that Anne of Cleves should take precedency after his queen, and the princesses his daughters, of every other lady in the realm, settle the matter of Catherine Parr's precedency beyond contravention, and the arrogant duchess was compelled to yield, but never forgave the mortification. According to Halen, the Duchess of Somerset was accustomed to inveigh, in the bitterest manner, against Queen Catherine, and actually expressed herself concerning her in the following coarse and detracting language. Did not Henry the Eighth marry Catherine Parr in his doting days, when he had brought himself so low by his lust and cruelty, that no lady that stood on her honor would venture on him? And shall I now give place to her, who in her former estate was but Latimer's widow, and who is now fain to cast herself for support on a younger brother? If Master Admiral teach his wife no better manners, I am she that will. The tender affection which the young king lavished on the queen dowager, and his reverence for her talents, virtue and piety, excited, of course, the jealousy and ill will, not only of the Duchess of Somerset, but of her husband also, and the vulgar insolence of the former was systematically exerted to keep so powerful a rival from court. The king was certainly far more attached to his uncle Thomas Seymour than to the protector, and Catherine Parr had always been to him in the place of the mother whom he had never known. Allied with them was his best-loved sister, Elizabeth, and his amiable and highly gifted cousin, Lady Jane Grey, who were both the élèves of the queen and residing in her house. The project of uniting Lady Jane Grey with Edward the Sixth originated with Catherine Parr, who had directed her education in such a manner as to render her a suitable companion for the royal scholar. The aspiring protector desired to match King Edward with his own daughter, the learned Lady Jane Seymour, and to obtain Lady Jane Grey for his son. His plans were, however, frustrated by a private arrangement between the Admiral and the Marquess of Dorset, the preliminaries of which were thus arranged. Soon after the death of King Henry, one Harrington, a confidential officer of Sir Thomas Seymour, came to the Marquess of Dorset's house at Westminster, and proposed to him to enter into a close friendship and alliance with his master, who was like to come to very great authority. He advised Dorset to permit his daughter, Lady Jane Grey, to reside with Sir Thomas Seymour, because he would have the means of matching her much to his comfort. "'With whom will he match her?' asked Dorset. "'Mary,' quoth Harrington, "'I doubt not you shall see him marry her to the king.' Upon these persuasions, Dorset visited the admiral that day week at Seymour Place, who gave such explanations of his prospects that Dorset struck a bargain with him, sent for his daughter, and consigned her to him as an inmate of his house, in which she remained during the life of Catherine Parr. Queen Catherine's cupbearer, Nicholas Throckmorton, continued to follow her fortunes from the time of King Henry's decease. The Throckmorton manuscript furnishes the following details connected with Catherine's fourth marriage. My sovereign lost, the queen I did attend, the time when widow, mourning she did rest, and while she married was unto her end, I willingly obeyed her highness's hest, whom me esteemed and thought my service good, whereas in truth to small effect it stood. Her husband, fourth, was uncle to the king, Lord Seymour, high by office admiral, in praise of whom loud peals I ought to ring, for he was hardy, wise, and liberal. His climbing high disdained by his peers was thought the cause he lived not out his years. Her house was deemed a second court of right, because there flocked still nobility. He spared no cost his lady to delight, or to maintain her princely royalty. End of section six.
Section 7 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Catherine Parr, Chapter 2, Part 4. After Queen Catherine had been the wife of her beloved Seymour some months, there was a prospect of her becoming a mother. Her raptures at the anticipation of a blessing which had been denied to all of her other marriages carried her beyond the bounds of discretion, and her husband was no less transported than herself. The feelings of paternity with them amounted to passion. During a brief separation, while Seymour was at court, vainly soliciting of his brother the restoration of Queen Catherine's property, among which not only the late king's gifts, but those of her mother, were unjustly detained, he writes in a very confidential and loving strain to his teeming consort, after my humble commendations and thanks for your letter, as I was perplexed heretofore with unkindness, apprehending I should not have justice in all my causes, from those that I thought would have been partial to me, even so, the receiving of your letter revived my spirits, partly for that I do perceive you be armed with patience, howsoever the matter may fall, but chiefest, here he proceeds to exult in fierce hopes, that his expected son, should God give him life to live as long as his father, will revenge his wrongs. Now, continues he, to put you in some hope again. This day, a little before the receiving your letter, I have spoken to my lord Somerset, whom I have so well handled that he is somewhat qualified, and although I am in no hopes thereof, yet I am in no despair. I have also broken to him for your mother's gift. He makes answer, that at the finishing of the matter you shall either have your own again, or else some recompense as ye shall be content withal. I spake to him of your going down into the country on Wednesday, who was sorry thereof, trusting that I would be here all to-morrow, to hear what the Frenchman will do. But on Monday, at dinner, I trust to be with you. As for the Frenchmen, I have no mistrust that they shall be any let, or hindrance, of my going with you this journey, or any of my continuing there with your highness. Thus, till that time, I bid your highness most heartily well to fare, and thank you for your news, which were right heartily welcome to me. He then expresses his wishes that both the queen, and his expected progeny, whom he insists is to be a boy, may be kept in health, with good diet and walking, and concludes in these words. And so I bid my most dear and well-beloved wife, most heartily well to fare. From Westminster, this Saturday, the ninth of June. Your Highness's most faithful loving husband, T. Seymour. The Queen was then at Hanworth, one of the royal manors belonging to her dower. From whence, Seymour escorted her to his principal baronial residence, Sudley Castle. The jealousy with which the Duke of Somerset regarded his brother, the Admiral, operated to prevent, as far as he could, the slightest intercourse between him and their royal nephew, the young king. The admiral, however, who was bent on superseding Somerset in the office of protector, contrived to keep up a secret correspondence with Edward, and to supply him with money, of which he was kept almost destitute. One of the agents of this correspondence was John Fowler, a gentleman of Edward's privy chamber. The following letter shows how vigilantly the young king was beset, and the jealous care taken by Somerset and his satellites, to prevent his writing to that beloved stepmother, to whom his heart yearned with not less than filial tenderness. John Fowler to my Lord Admiral. I most humbly thank your lordship for your letter, dated the 15th of this present, which letter I showed to the king's majesty, and whereas, in my last letter to your lordship, I wrote unto you, if his grace could get any spare time, his grace would write a letter to the queen's grace and to you. His highness desires your lordship to pardon him, for his grace is not half a quarter of an hour alone, but in such leisure as his grace had, his majesty hath written, here enclosed, his commendations to the queen's grace, and to your lordship, that he is so much bound to you that he must needs remember you always, and as his grace may have time, you shall well perceive by such small lines of recommendations with his own hand. Enclosed within Fowler's letters are the royal notes alluded to, 
written by Edward's own hand, on torn and shabby scraps of paper, betraying both the scarcity of that article in the royal escritory, and the stealthy manner in which they were penned. The first is a mysterious request for money addressed to his uncle. My lord, send me, per Latimer, as much as ye think good, and deliver it to Fowler. Edward. The second of these small lines is, My lord, I thank you, and I pray you to have commended me to the queen. There is in the context of Fowler's letter an allusion to Queen Catherine's situation, with a friendly wish for the birth of the son, of whom both parents were so fondly desirous. He says, My lady of Somerset is brought to bed of a goodly boy, and I trust in Almighty God, the Queen's grace shall have another. Fowler's letter is dated July 19th, from Hampton, where the young king then was. Seymour's great object was to get a letter written by King Edward, complaining of the arbitrary conduct of the protector, and the restraint in which he was kept by him. Edward had actually consented to write the letter, which the admiral was to lay before the parliament, but before this could be done, the plot was betrayed to the protector. The admiral was called before the council to answer for his proceedings. He defied them, but when he was threatened with imprisonment in the tower, he made submissions to his brother. A hollow reconciliation took place for the present, and eight hundred pounds per annum was added to his appointments by the protector, in the hope of conciliating him. As long as Queen Catherine lived, the admiral was too powerful for his foes. Perhaps he did not sufficiently appreciate her value, even in a political and worldly view, till it was too late. The residence of the Princess Elizabeth under their roof was fatal to the wedded happiness of Seymour and Catherine. The queen, forgetful that a blooming girl in her fifteenth year was no longer a child, had imprudently encouraged the admiral to romp with her royal stepdaughter in her presence. Mrs. Ashley, the Princess Elizabeth's governess, in her deposition before the Privy Council, gives a strange picture of the coarse manners of the times, in which such proceedings could be tolerated in a palace, and with royal ladies. At Chelsea, after my lord Thomas Seymour was married to the queen, he would come many mornings into the said Lady Elizabeth's chamber, before she was ready, and sometimes before she did rise, and if she were up, he would bid her good morrow, and ask how she did, and strike her on the back familiarly, and so go forth to his chamber, and sometimes go through to her maidens and play with them. And if the princess were in bed, he would put open the curtains and bid her good morrow, and she would go further in the bed. And one morning he tried to kiss the princess in her bed, and this deponent was there, and bade him go away for shame. At Hanworth for two mornings, the queen, Catherine Parr, was with him, and they both tickled my lady Elizabeth in her bed. Another time at Hanworth, he romped with her in the garden, and cut her gown, being black cloth, into a hundred pieces, and when Mrs. Ashley came up and chid Lady Elizabeth, she answered, She could not strive withal, for the queen held her while the Lord Admiral cut the dress. Another time, Lady Elizabeth heard the master key unlock, and knowing his Lord Admiral would come in, ran out of her bed to her maidens, and then went behind the curtain of her bed, and my lord tarried a long time in hopes she would come out. Mrs. Ashley could not tell how long. She, Mrs. Ashley, was told these things were complained of, and that the Lady Elizabeth was evil spoken of. Then the Lord Admiral swore, God's precious soul, I will tell my Lord Protector how I am slandered, and I will not leave off, for I mean no evil. At Seymour Place, when the Queen slept there, he did use a while to come up every morning in his nightgown and slippers. When he found my Lady Elizabeth up and at her book, then he would look in at the gallery door, and bid her good morrow, and so go on his way. And the deponent told my Lord it was an unseemly sight to see a man so little dressed in a maiden's chamber, with which he was angry, but he left it. At Hanworth, the Queen told Mrs. Ashley, that my Lord Admiral looked in at the gallery window, and saw my Lady Elizabeth with her arms about a man's neck. Upon which, Mrs. Ashley questioned her charge regarding it, and the Lady Elizabeth denied it, weeping, and bade them ax all her women, if there were any man who came to her excepting Grindal, my Lady Elizabeth's schoolmaster. 
Howbeit, Mrs. Ashley thought, the queen being jealous, did feign the story, to the intent that Mrs. Ashley might take more heed in the proceedings of Lady Elizabeth and the Lord Admiral. The governess added, that her husband, Mr. Ashley, who, it seems, was a relative of Anne Boleyn, did often give warning, that he feared the princess did bear some affection to the Lord Admiral, as she would sometimes blush when she heard him spoken of. Elizabeth herself told Perry, the cofferer of her household, that she feared the admiral loved her but too well, and the queen was jealous of them both, and that, suspecting the frequent access of the admiral to her, she came suddenly upon them when they were alone, he having her in his arms. Queen Catherine was greatly offended with them both, and very sharply reproved the princess's governess for her neglect of her duty to her royal pupil, in permitting her to fall into such reprehensible freedom of behavior. Conjugal jealousy apart, Catherine Parr had great cause for anger and alarm, for the princess was under her especial care, and if aught but good befell her at the tender age of fifteen, great blame would, of course, attach to herself, especially if the admiral, for whom she had already outraged popular opinion, by marrying with indecorous precipitation, were the author of her young stepdaughter's ruin. It is just possible that the actual guilt incurred by the unhappy queen, Catherine Howard, in her girlhood, did not amount to a greater degree of impropriety than the unseemly romping which took place almost every day at Chelsea, between the youthful princess Elizabeth and the bold bad husband of Catherine Parr. It does not appear that any violent or injurious expressions were used by Catherine Parr, but she saw the expediency of separating her household from that of the princess, and acted upon it without delay. There is no reason to believe that she cherished vindictive feelings against Elizabeth, for she continued to correspond with her in a friendly and affectionate manner, as the princess herself testifies in a playful and somewhat familiar letter which is here subjoined. Lady Elizabeth to the Queen. Although your highness's letters be most joyful to me, in absence, yet considering what pain it is for you to write, your grace being so sickly, your commendations were enough in my lord's letter. I must rejoice at your health, with the well liking of the country, with my humble thanks that your grace wished me with you till I was weary of that country. Your highness were like to be cumbered if I should not depart till I was weary of being with you although it were the worst soil in the world, your presence would make it pleasant. I cannot reprove my lord for not doing your commendations in his letter, for he did it, and although he had not, yet I will not complain on him, for he shall be diligent to give me knowledge from time to time, how his busy child doth, and if I were at his birth, no doubt I would see him beaten, for the trouble he hath put you to. Master Denny and my lady, with humble thanks, prayeth most entirely for your grace, praying the Almighty God to send you a most lucky deliverance, and my mistress wisheth no less, giving your highness most humble thanks for her commendations. Written with very little leisure, this last day of July, your humble daughter, Elizabeth. This letter, dated within six weeks of the Queen's death, affords convincing evidence she was on amicable terms with her royal stepdaughter. She had not only written kindly to Elizabeth, expressing a wish that she were with her at Sudley, but she had even encouraged the admiral to write, when not well enough herself, to continue the correspondence, a proof that Catherine Parr, though she had considered it proper to put a stop to the dangerous familiarity with which her husband had presumed to demean himself towards her royal charge, did not regard it as anything beyond a passing folly. But even if her heart had been torn with a temporary pang of jealousy, she was too amiable to blight the opening flower of Elizabeth's life, by revealing a feeling so injurious to the honor of the youthful princess. It was not, however, Elizabeth, but the young and early wise Lady Jane Grey, who became the companion of Catherine Parr at Sudley Castle, when she withdrew thither to await the birth of her child. Lady Jane continued with Queen Catherine, till the melancholy sequel of her fond hopes of maternity. Sudley Castle was royal property that had been granted to the admiral by the regency on the death of King Henry. It was suspected that lands thus illegally obtained were held on a doubtful tenure. One day, when Queen Catherine was walking in Sudley Park with her husband and Sir Robert Turwitt, she said, Master Turwitt, 
will you see the king when he cometh to full age will call in his lands again as fast as they be now given away from him mary said master tyrwhitt then will sudley castle be gone from your lord admiral mary rejoined the queen i do assure you he intends to offer to restore them and give them back freely when the time comes queen catherine had a princely retinue in attendance upon her in her retirement at sudley castle of ladies-in-waiting maids of honour and gentlewomen in ordinary besides the appointments for her expected nursery and lying-in chamber and more than a hundred and twenty gentlemen of her household and yeomen of the guard she had several of the most learned men among the lights of the reformation for her chaplains and she caused divine worship to be performed twice a day or oftener in her house notwithstanding the distaste of the admiral who not only refused to attend these devotional exercises himself but proved a great let and hindrance to all the pious regulations his royal consort strove to establish this opposition came with an ill grace from seymour who for political purposes professed to be a reformer and had shared largely in the plunder of the old church but in his heart he had no more liking for protestant prayers and sermons than queen catherine's deceased lord king henry a few days before her confinement catherine received the following friendly letter from the princess mary madam although i have troubled your highness lately with sundry letters yet that notwithstanding seeing my lord marquess who hath taken the pains to come to me at this present intendeth to see your grace shortly i could not be satisfied without writing to the same and especially because i purpose to-morrow with the help of god to begin my journey towards norfolk where i shall be farther from your grace which journey i have intended since whitsuntide but lack of health hath stayed me all the while which although it be as yet unstable nevertheless i am enforced to remove for a time hoping with god's grace to return again about michaelmas at which time or shortly after i trust to hear good success of your grace's condition and in the meantime shall desire much to hear of your health which i pray almighty god to continue and increase to his pleasure as much as your own heart can desire and thus with my most humble commendations to your highness i take my leave of the same desiring your grace to take the pain to make my commendations to my lord admiral from beaulieu the ninth of august your highness's most humble and assured loving daughter mary the lord marquess mentioned by mary was queen catherine's only brother william parr marquess of northampton his guilty and unhappy wife the heiress of essex was then at sudley castle under some restraint and in the keeping of her royal sister-in-law this unpleasant charge must have greatly disquieted the last troubled months of catherine parr's life on the thirtieth of august fifteen forty eight catherine parr gave birth at sudley castle to the infant whose appearance had been so fondly anticipated both by seymour and herself it was a girl and though both parents had confidently expected a boy no disappointment was expressed on the contrary seymour in a transport of paternal pride wrote so eloquent a description of the beauty of the new-born child to his brother the duke of somerset that the latter added the following kind postscript to a stern letter of expostulation and reproof which he had just finished writing to him when he received his joyous communication after our hearty commendations we are right glad to understand by your letters that the queen your bedfellow hath a happy hour and escaping all danger hath made you the father of so pretty a daughter and although if it had pleased god it would have been both to us and we suppose also to you a more joy and comfort if it had this the first-born been a son yet the escape of the danger and the prophecy and good hansel of this to a great sort of happy sons which as you write we trust no less than to be true is no small joy and comfort to us as we are sure it is to you and to her grace also to whom you shall make again our hearty commendations with no less gratulation of such good success thus we bid you heartily farewell from sion the first of september fifteen forty eight your loving brother e somerset from this letter it is evident that lord thomas had been casting horoscopes and consulting fortune-tellers who had promised him long life and a great sort of sons 
It is difficult to imagine that the admiral, however faulty his morale might be on some points, could cherish evil intentions against her who had just caused his heart to overflow for the first time with the ineffable raptures of paternity. The charge of his having caused the death of Queen Catherine by poison can only be regarded as the fabrication of his enemies. Neither is there the slightest reason to believe that the unfavorable symptoms, which appeared on the third day after her delivery, were either caused or aggravated by his unkindness. On the contrary, his manner towards her, when she was evidently suffering under the grievous irritability of mind and body, incidental to pure pearl fever, appears from the deposition of Lady Turwit, one of the most faithful and attached of her ladies, to have been soothing and affectionate. Let the reader judge from the subjoined record of that sad scene in the chamber of the departing queen. Two days before the death of the queen, says Lady Turwit, at my coming to her in the morning, she asked me where I had been so long, and said unto me that she did fear such things in herself, that she was sure she could not live. I answered, as I thought, that I saw no likelihood of death in her. She then, having my lord admiral by the hand, and divers others standing by, spake these words partly, as I took, idly, or meaning in delirium. My lady Turwit, I am not well handled, for those that be about me care not for me, but stand laughing at my grief, and the more good I will to them, the less good they will to me. Whereunto my lord admiral answered, Why, sweetheart, I would you no hurt. And she said to him again aloud, No, my lord, I think so. And immediately she said to him in his ear, But, my lord, you have given me many shrewd taunts. These words I perceived, she spake with good memory, and very sharply and earnestly, for her mind was sore disquieted. My lord admiral, perceiving that I heard it, called me aside and asked me what she said, and I declared it plainly to him. Then he consulted with me, that he would lie down on the bed by her, to look if he could pacify her unquietness with gentle communication, whereunto I agreed and by the time he had spoken three or four words to her, she answered him roundly and sharply, saying, My lord, I would have given a thousand marks to have had my full talk with Hewick, Dr. Hewick, the first day I was delivered, but I durst not for displeasing you. And I, hearing that, perceived her trouble to be so great, that my heart would serve me to hear no more. Such like communication she had with him the space of an hour, which they did hear that sat by her bedside. It is probable that the alarming charge in Catherine's life had been caused, not by any sinister practices against her life, but by whispers previously circulated among the gossips in her lying-in chamber, relating to her husband's passion for her royal stepdaughter, and his intention of aspiring to the hand of the princess, in case of her own decease. Her malady was pure pearl fever. A sense of intolerable wrong was constantly expressed by her, yet she never explained the cause of her displeasure. She alluded to her delivery, but strange to say, never mentioned her infant. Wild and gloomy fantasies had superseded the first sweet gushings of maternal love in her troubled bosom, and she appeared unconscious of the existence of the babe she had so fondly anticipated. This symptom, with ladies in her situation, is generally the forerunner of death. On the very day when the scene occurred, described by Lady Turwit, Catherine Parr dictated her will, which is still extant in the prerogative office. It is dated September 5th, 1548, and it is to the following effect, that she, then lying on her deathbed, sick of body but of good mind, and perfect memory and discretion, being persuaded, and perceiving the extremity of death to approach her, gives all to her married espouse and husband, wishing them to be a thousand times more in value than they were or been. There are no legacies, and the witnesses are two well-known historical characters, Robert Hewick, M.D., and John Parkhurst. This is a nuncupative or verbal will. It was not signed by the dying queen, which we find was usually the case with deathbed royal wills at that era. The witnesses were persons of high character, and even sacred authority in a sick chamber, being the physician and the chaplain. The latter became subsequently a bishop of the Reformed Church, highly distinguished for his Christian virtues. In after life, 
Parkhurst always mentioned Catherine Parr, with great regard as his most gentle mistress. Was it likely that such a man would perjure himself for the sake of enriching Seymour? Yet the affectionate language of the will is inconsistent with the suspicions and reproaches which Lady Tyrwhitt affirmed that the dying queen threw out against her lord on the very day of its date, namely September 5th, 1548. Both these facts are depositions on oath made by two most respectable witnesses on the same day. A partisan might charge either Lady Tyrwhitt or Bishop Parkhurst with direct perjury and say, that Catherine Parr could not have spoken according to both depositions. But the physiologist comes to the aid of the historian, and, from Lady Turwitt's hint of delirium, will truly allow that a wandering brain could utter such and many other inconsistencies. As Lady Turwitt affirms that she entered the Queen's apartment in the morning, when the Lord Admiral was by the bedside, with a patient's hand in his, it is likely that she came in just after the will had been made. Let us consider the state of Catherine Parr's mind at this juncture. Dr. Hewick had recently revealed to her her danger, her words, being persuaded of the approach of death, in her will, distinctly intimate this fact. The result was an instant testamentary deposition of her property, in which she at the same time exerted her peculiar privilege, as Queen Dowager, of bequeathing her personal effects, though a married woman, and showed her passionate love to her husband, for she left him all, wishing them, her goods, a thousand times more than they have or been. Her words are evidently written as uttered, with all imperfections. He was the sole object of her thoughts. Her newborn infant was forgotten, a lapse of memory on the part of its mother, which doomed it to beggary before it could speak. All these circumstances certainly occurred in a short space of time, and doubtless occasioned great hurry of spirits. The Queen's ladies knew not of her danger. Lady Turwitt says she did not. The Queen in her will says she herself had been persuaded of it. Then came the revulsion of feeling. The Queen, on recollection, was not reconciled to death, and began to question angrily whether she had a right to die, whether her death was not caused by carelessness or malice. Lady Turwitt saw she spoke deliriously, her mind wandered, and former jealousies and affronts, hitherto successfully concealed, biased her speech. She thought that her husband, to whom she had bequeathed her all, was exulting in her removal. She fancied, and that part of the narrative plainly reveals delirium, for such fancies are symptomatic, that he, she loved so well, stood deriding her misery. He acted considerately, soothing her as a nurse soothes a sick wayward child, but his manner, as described by Lady Turwitt, was that of a person, in possession of intellect, humoring the sad vagaries of a mind diseased. Catherine Parr expired on the second day after the date of her will, being the seventh after the birth of her child. She was only in the thirty-sixth year of her age, having survived her royal husband, Henry the Eighth, by one year, six months, and eight days. Her character is thus recorded by a contemporary quoted by Stripe. She was endued with a pregnant wittiness joined with right wonderful grace of elegance, studiously diligent in acquiring knowledge, as well of human discipline as also of the holy scriptures, of incomparable chastity, which she kept not only from all spot, but from all suspicion, by avoiding all occasions of idleness, and condemning vain pastimes. Further also, in his church history, panegyrizes this queen in the highest terms of commendation. The official announcement of Queen Catherine Parr's death, together with the program of her funeral, is copied from a curious contemporary manuscript in the College of Arms. Lady Jane Grey, who was with Queen Catherine at Sudley Castle, at the time of her death, officiated at her funeral solemnity as chief mourner, which is certified in this document. Abbreviate of the interment of the Lady Catherine Parr, Queen Dowager, late wife to King Henry the Eighth, and after wife to Sir Thomas, Lord Seymour of Sudley, and High Admiral of England. Item, on Wednesday, the 5th of September, between 2 and 3 of the o'clock in the morning, died the aforesaid Lady, late Queen Dowager, at the castle of Sudley, in Gloucestershire, 1548, and lieth buried in the chapel of the said castle. 
Item, she was sered and chested in lead accordingly, and so remained in her privy chamber until things were in readiness. The chapel was hung with black cloth, garnished with scutcheons of marriages, namely King Henry the Eighth and her, in pale under the crown, her own in lozenge under the crown. Also the arms of the Lord Admiral, and hers in pale without the crown. The rails were covered with black cloth, for the mourners to sit within, with stools and cushions accordingly, and two light discussions stood upon the corpse during the service. The order in proceeding to the chapel. First, two conductors in black, with black staves, then gentlemen and esquires, then knights, then officers of the household, with their white staves, then the gentlemen ushers, then Somerset Herald, in the tabard coat, then the corpse, borne by six gentlemen in black gowns, with their hoods on their heads, then eleven staff torches, borne on each side by yeomen, round about the corpse, and at each corner a knight for assistance, four, with their hoods on their heads, and then Lady Jane, daughter to the Lord Marquess Dorset, chief mourner, her train borne up by a young lady, then six other lady mourners, two and two, then yeomen three and three, in rank, then all other follow the manner of the service in the church. Item, when the corpse was set within the rails, and the mourners placed, the whole choir began, and sung certain psalms in English, and read three lessons, and after the third lesson, the mourners, according to their degrees, and that which is a custom, offered into the alms-box, and when they had done, all other, as gentlemen or gentlewomen, that would. The offering done, Dr. Coverdale, the Queen's almoner, began his sermon, which was very good and godly, and in one place thereof, he took occasion to declare unto the people, how they should none there think, say, or spread abroad, that the offering which was there done, was done anything to benefit the dead, but for the poor only, and also the lights, which were carried and stood about the corpse, were for the honor of the person, and for none other intent nor purpose and so went through with his sermon, and made a godly prayer, and the whole church answered, and prayed the same with him in the end. The sermon done, the corpse was buried, during which time the choir sung Te Deum in English, and this done, the mourners dined, and the rest returned homeward again, all which aforesaid was done in the morning. This curious document presents the reader with the form of the first royal funeral solemnized according to Protestant rites. Queen Catherine's epitaph was written in Latin by her chamberlain, Dr. Parkhurst, afterwards Bishop of Norwich. The translation by an anonymous author is elegant. In this new tomb the royal Catherine lies, flower of her sex, renowned, great, and wise, a wife by every nuptial virtue known, a faithful partner once of Henry's throne. To Seymour next her plighted her hand she yields, Seymour, whose Neptune's trident justly wields, from him a beauteous daughter blessed her arms, an infant copy of her parents' charms. When now seven days this infant flower had bloomed, heaven in its wrath the mother's soul resumed. The erudite writer, who has collected many interesting particulars, in the Archaeologica of the Life of this Queen, says, she was tormented and broken-hearted with the pride of her sister-in-law and the ill-temper of her husband whom she adored to the last no instance of personal incivility or harshness on the part of the lord admiral towards catherine parr has however been recorded without indeed the shrewd taunts she mentioned in her delirium were matters of fact if so like many other ill-tempered husbands he was resolved no one should revile his wife but himself for he was wont to affirm, with his usual terrible oath, that no one should speak ill of the queen, or if he knew it, he would take his fist to the ears of those who did, from the lowest to the highest. The charge of his having hastened her death is not only without the slightest proof, but really opposed to the general evidences of history. The fatal termination of the queen's illness was not anticipated, even by her husband, and how great a shock it was to him, may be gathered from the fact, that in his first perplexity, all his political plans were disarranged, and he wrote to the Marquess of Dorset, to send for Lady Jane Grey, as he meant to dismiss his household, but before a month was over, he wrote again to the Marquess, saying, 
by my last letters written at a time when with the queen's highness's death i was so amazed that i had small regard either to myself or my doings and partly then thinking that my great loss must presently have constrained me to have dissolved my whole house i offer to send my lady jane unto you whensoever ye send for her but having more deeply considered the matter he found he could continue his establishment where shall remain he adds not only the gentlewomen of the queen's highness's privy chamber but also the maids which wait at large and other women who were about her in her lifetime with a hundred and twenty gentlemen and yeomen the ambition of lord admiral seymour still projected placing a royal partner at the head of his establishment at present he invited his aged mother lady seymour to superintend this vast household and he concluded his letter to dorset with the assurance that if he would restore lady jane grey as his inmate lady seymour should treat her as if she were her daughter after this letter seymour came to bradgate and says lord dorset he was so earnestly in hand with me and my wife that he would have no nay so that we were contented for her to return to his house at the same time and place he renewed the favorite project of the deceased queen and himself that edward the sixth should marry lady jane grey adding that if he could get the king at liberty this marriage should take place thus the fair girl was restored to the guardianship of lord admiral seymour and actually remained under his roof till his arrest and imprisonment in the tower end of section seven section eight of lives of the queens of england volume five by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain catherine parr chapter two part five after the death of queen catherine a deceitful message of condolence was sent to the lord admiral by the duchess of somerset who intimated at the same time that if any grudge were borne by her to him it was all for the late queen's cause and now she was taken away by death it would undoubtedly follow unless the fault were in himself that she the duchess would bear as good will to him as ever she did before the lord admiral accepted the overture for a time and paid his brother a visit but soon after gave pretty evident proof that his enmity to somerset and his party was far from being dismissed by the death of catherine parr indeed it amounted almost to insanity after he was deprived of the restraining influence of her sound sense and prudent counsels the renewal of this hostility took place soon after proving catherine parr's will which was done december sixth fifteen forty eight the old dispute touching faustern was still a sore point and he fiercely pursued the suit that had been commenced during catherine's life for the restoration of the jewels and stuff which had been detained from her by the protector and his counsel so thoroughly persuaded was the widower of queen catherine of the justice of the claim that he appealed to no meaner witness than the princess mary requiring her to testify whether the disputed jewels and furniture were a bona fide gift made by the deceased king her father to catherine parr or only a loan in his letter to the princess he says the queen's highness whose soul god hath did oft times in her lifetime declare unto me upon occasion of talk between us of such jewels and other things as were kept from her possession by my lord my brother somerset she said your grace knew and could testify how and after what sort the king's majesty used to part with things to her namely those jewels which he delivered to her against the french admirals coming in and forasmuch as it may fortune a further communication will hereafter be had for the due trial of her title unto them i do most humbly beseech your grace that it will please you to employ so much pains at my poor request as to make me some brief note of your knowledge in two or three lines as to whether his majesty king henry did give her highness catherine parr those jewels and other things that were delivered to her at the french admiral's coming in and other times both before and after or else whether he did but lend them for a time to be returned home again after those triumphs finished 
for which time and turn some few in number suppose they were only delivered assuring your grace that your opinion declared shall not only much satisfy me in this matter but also bind me during my life to be at your grace's commandment with anything that lieth in me this application was made a little before christmas the princess mary was too prudent to allow herself to be involved in the dispute and merely in her reply bore testimony to the great love and affection that her late lord and father did bear unto her grace queen catherine a testimony of some importance to the biographers of catherine parr but not what seymour required to establish his right to the contested articles whiteman one of the admiral's servants subsequently deposed that he was employed by him in copying letters to the keeper of st james's palace and others requiring them to bear witness as to the fact whether the jewels were given to queen catherine by king henry or only lent for the honor of the crown while she presided at the feats that were given at hampton court to the french ambassador claude d'ambau who concluded the peace between england and france in fifteen forty six as before related seymour made great search among queen catherine's papers at her late royal residence at hanworth in the hope of finding some record affording decisive evidence of the gift it is to be feared that among the great sort of old papers belonging to the late queen catherine of which he spake to his servant whiteman he recklessly destroyed as useless and perhaps dangerous many a precious letter and record of her queenly as well as her early life and of her first and second marriages whereof so few particulars are now to be obtained the limits of this work will not admit of detailing the particulars of the intrigues which led to the fall of the lord admiral suffice it to say that he had organized measures for supplanting his elder brother the duke of somerset in the office of guardian to king edward the youthful majesty of england was actually brought before his own council to be made a witness against his best beloved uncle for the purpose of bringing him to the block edward confessed that the lord admiral had privily supplied him with sums of money of which he had been kept destitute by the protector and also that he had been accustomed to censure the proceedings of the protector and to desire his removal at another time says the young king within these two years at least the admiral lord thomas seymour said to me ye must take upon yourself to rule for ye shall be able enough as well as other kings and then ye may give your men somewhat for your uncle somerset is old and i trust will not live long i answered it were better he should die it is worthy of observation that the marquess of northampton catherine parr's brother her brother-in-law herbert earl of pembroke and her cousin nicholas throckmorton all remained the fast friends of the lord admiral after her death which they would scarcely have done had they suspected him of unkindness to her much less of hastening her death the throckmorton manuscript thus mentions him but when my queen lay buried in her grave to Musselborough field i mourning went the gladsome victory to us god gave home with those tidings i in haste was sent the admiral my spokesman was at home who stayed his nephew's safety to regard he was at all essays my perfect friend and patron too until his dying day when men surmised that he would mount too high and seek the second time aloft to match ambitious hearts did steer something too nigh off went his head they made a quick dispatch but ever since i thought him sure a beast that causeless labor to defile his nest thus guiltless he or seymour though malice went to pot not answering for himself nor knowing cause it is more than probable that the charge of poisoning queen catherine parr was devised in order to induce the king by whom she had been so fondly beloved to sign the warrant for the execution of her unhappy husband seymour was far from submitting to death like his contemporaries with an approbative speech setting forth the justice of his sentence he knew that he had been doomed lawlessly and he loudly proclaimed the fact on the scaffold before he laid his head on the block he told an attendant of the lieutenant of the tower to bid his man speed the thing he wot of this speech was overheard and seymour's servant was arrested and threatened till he confessed that his master had obtained some ink in the tower and had plucked off an aglet from his dress 
with the point of which he had written a letter to each of the princesses, Mary and Elizabeth, which he had hidden within the sole of a velvet shoe. The shoe was opened, and the letters found, which were, as was natural, full of bitter complaints against his brother, and all who had caused his destruction. Latimer preached a very uncharitable funeral sermon for Seymour, in which he said, that it was evident God had clean forsaken him. Whether he be saved or not, I leave it to God, but surely he was a wicked man, and the realm is well rid of him. Latimer accused Lord Thomas Seymour, that when Queen Catherine, his wife, had daily prayer morning and afternoon in his house, he would get him out of the way, and was a contemner of the common prayer. Among his misdeeds, it was mentioned that a woman, in 1540, being executed for robbery, declared that the beginning of her evil life was being seduced and deserted by Lord Thomas Seymour. He made no religious profession on the scaffold, and according to the account given in his funeral sermon, he died irksomely, dangerously, and horribly. These accusations against the unfortunate husband of Catherine Parr are somewhat softened by the religious and philosophic verses he was known to write the week before his death. Forgetting God, to love a king, hath been my rod, or nothing else in this frail life, being a blast of care and strife till it be past. Yet God did call me in my pride, lest I should fall, and from him slide, for whom he loves he must correct, that they may be of his elect. Then death, hasten thee, thou shalt me gain, immortally with God to reign. Lord, send the king in years as Noah, in governing this realm in joy, and after this frail life such grace, that in my bliss he may find place. Lord Seymour was beheaded on Tower Hill, March 20th, 1549. There was only an interval of two years, one month and three weeks, between the death of Catherine's third husband, Henry the Eighth, and the execution of her fourth, who survived her just six months and fourteen days. The only child of Queen Catherine and Lord Seymour was named Mary. It is probable that Lady Jane Grey was her godmother, as she was at Sudley Castle at the time of her birth, and acted as chief mourner at the funeral of her royal mother. As the sole representative of both parents, the young Mary Seymour ought to have been the heiress of great wealth, and even if the act of attainer, which had been passed on her father, operated to deprive her of the broad lands of Sudley, and the rest of his possessions, she was fully entitled to inherit the large fortune of the Queen Dowager, her mother, if she had had friends to assert her rights. The high-born infant lady, says Stripe, destitute already both of her mother, Queen Catherine, and her lately executed father, remained a little while at her uncle Somerset's house, at Sion, and then, according to her father's dying request, was conveyed to Grimsthorpe, in Lincolnshire, where Catherine, Dowager Duchess of Suffolk, lived. There she was brought, with her governess, Mrs. Aglianby, her nurse, two maids and other servants, consonant to the high quality to which, for their own misery, her unfortunate parents had been advanced. Her uncle, the Duke of Somerset, upon her leaving Sion, promised that a certain pension should be settled upon her for her maintenance, and that a portion of her nursery plate and furniture, brought to Sion House, was to be sent after her, when she went to Grimsthorpe. So the Duchess of Somerset promised Mr. Bertie, a gentleman in the service of the Duchess of Suffolk, whom the lady subsequently married, but, consonant to the contestable conduct of the Somerset family, these promises in behalf of the poor orphan were never fulfilled. Catherine, Duchess of Suffolk, had been honored with the friendship of the deceased queen, and she had, by her favor and protecting influence, been preserved from the fiery persecution which had marked the closing years of Henry the Eighth's reign, and she had the greater need of a powerful patroness, since she had, by her cutting raillery, provoked the enmity of both Bonner and Gardiner. She held the same religious tenets as the late queen, whom she professed to regard as a saint, and it may have been expected that she would have cherished the orphan babe of her royal friend with not less than maternal tenderness. The worldly spirit and sordid temper of the young duchess are, however, sufficiently apparent in her letters to her friend Cecil, on the subject of the encumbrance and expense of the hapless little one, who had become the unwelcome recipient of her charity. To Mr. Cecil, 
It is said that the best means of remedy to the sick is first plainly to confess and disclose the disease wherefore lieth for remedy, and again, for that my disease is so strong that it will not be hidden, I will discover me unto you. First I will, as it were under Benedictite and in high secrecy, declare unto you that all the world knoweth, though I go never so covertly in my net, what a very beggar I am. This sickness, as I have said, I promise you, increaseth mightily upon me. Amongst other causes whereof is, you will understand not the least, the queen's child hath lain, and yet doth lie at my house, with her company about her, wholly at my charges. I have written to my lady Somerset at large, which was the letter I wrote, note this, with my own hand unto you, among other things for the child, that there may be some pension allotted unto her, according to my lord's grace's promise. Now, good Cecil, help at a pinch all that you may help. My lady also sent me word at Whitsuntide last, by bar too, that my lord's grace, at her suit, had granted certain nursery plate, should be delivered with the child, and lest there might be stay for lack of a present bill, or list, of such plate and stuff, as was there in the nursery, I send you here enclosed, of all parcels as were appointed out for the child's only use, and that ye may the better understand, that I cry not before I am pricked, I send you Mistress Egonley's letter unto me, who, with the maids, Norice and others, daily call on me for their wages, whose voices mine ears may hardly bear, but my coffers much worse. Wherefore I cease, and commit me and my sickness to your diligent care, with my hearty commendations to your wife. At my manor of Grimsthorpe, the 27th of August, your assured loving friend, K. Suffolk. This curious letter is endorsed thus. To my loving friend, Mr. Cecil, attendant upon my Lord Protector's grace. From my Lady of Suffolk's grace, to Mr. Blank, concerning the Queen's child, nursed at her house at Grimsthorpe, with a bill of plate belonging to the nursery, Anno duo, Edward the Sixth. From the terms of the letter it appears, that even the paltry modicum in the list subjoined, of the good and stately gear, which of right belonged to the neglected infant of Queen Catherine Parr, was withheld by her rapacious uncle Somerset, and his pitiless wife. A bill of all such plate and other stuff, as belongeth to the nursery of the queen's child, First, two pots of silver, all white. Item, three goblets, silver, all white. One salt, silver, parcel gilt. A masser, or wooden cup, with a band of silver, parcel gilt. Eleven spoons, silver, all white. Item, a quilt for the cradle, three pillows and one pair of fustians. Three feather beds, three quilts, three pair of fustians. Item, a tester of scarlet, embroidered with a counterpoint, or counterpane, of silk serge, belonging to the same, and curtains of crimson taffeta. Item, two counterpoints of imagery for the nurse's bed. Item, six pair of sheets of little worth, six fair pieces of hangings within the inner chamber, four carpets for windows, ten pieces of hangings of the twelve months within the outer chamber. Item, two cushions, cloth of gold, and a chair of cloth of gold, two wrought stools and a bedstead gilt, with a tester and counterpoint, with curtains belonging to the same. The fair hangings and the embroidered scarlet tester and counterpane were doubtless wrought by the skillful hands of the royal mother and her ladies-in-waiting, to adorn the apartments and the cradle of the fondly expected babe, whose birth cost her her life. How little did poor Catherine anticipate that before that child had completed its first year of life, it was to be deprived of both parents, plundered of its princely inheritance, and even of the small remnant of plate and tapestry belonging to its nursery appointments, and thrown, a helpless burden, on the sufferance of a forgetful friend. In the list of the little Mary Seymour's effects is the following item. Two milk beasts which were belonging to the nursery, the which it may please your grace, Somerset, to white, or no, may be bestowed upon the two maids towards their marriages, which shall be shortly. Item, one loot. Eleven months after the date of this application, the persevering duchess writes again to her friend Cecil, assuring him that she had wearied herself with her letters, 
to the protector and his lady on the same subject and that she must again trouble him to press her suit to them both in these my letters to my lady she says i do put her in remembrance for the performance of her promise touching some small pension for my kindness to the late queen's child for it is with a dozen servants living all together at my charge the continuance of which will not bring me out of debt this year my lord marquess of northampton to whom i should deliver her hath as bad a back for such a burden as i have he would receive her but not willingly if he must receive her train the conduct of the marquess of northampton was even more heartless than that of the duchess of suffolk toward his sister's orphan daughter since he was the person who was by nature bound to cherish and protect her person and to vindicate her right to inherit the possessions of her deceased parents but he having obtained for himself a grant of a portion of his infant niece's patrimony was unwilling to give her and her attendants a home the brother of catherine parr united with her soi disant friend catherine duchess of suffolk in editing and publishing the devotional writings of that queen though they grudged a shelter and food to her only child the destitution of the unoffending infant of queen catherine was completed by an act of parliament entitled an act for disinheriting mary seymour daughter and heir of the late lord sudley admiral of england and the late queen another act for restitution of mary seymour passed january twenty first fifteen forty nine three edward the sixth yet we find her uncle retained possession of sudley the historical records connected with queen catherine's only child close with this act her aunt the learned anne countess of pembroke the only sister of catherine parr died in the year fifteen fifty one at baynard's castle so that the little lady mary seymour could not have found a home with her and whether she was actually transferred to her unwilling uncle the marquess of northampton or remained which is more probable under the care of the duchess of suffolk is not known stripe says she died young lodge affirms but on what authority he does not state that the only child of the admiral lord thomas seymour by queen catherine parr died in her thirteenth year there is however more reason to believe that she lived to be a wife and a mother the statements with which i have been favored by johnson lawson esq of grove villa clevedon and his brother henry lawson esq of hereford the sons of the late very reverend johnson lawson dean of battle in sussex vicar of throwley and rector of cranbrook in kent afford at any rate presumptive evidence that they derived their descent from this lady the authentic records of this fact appears to have been destroyed among a mass of interesting genealogical papers that were in the possession of a clergyman of the lawson family and on his death were consigned to the flames by his widow as she had no children to give them to she said one precious manuscript fragment of the pedigree had however fortunately escaped the notice of this destructive dame who would certainly have been branded by anthony a wood with the epitaph of a clownish woman and it contains a family record of the marriage and posterity of the daughter of catherine parr copy of the manuscript fragment entitled a good account of my pedigree given me by my grandmother july twenty sixth seventeen forty nine paul johnson a gentleman of good family and estate residing at his mansion at fordwich in the county of kent also having another name nethercourt in the isle of tanet married margaret hayman of the baronet's family of kent and norfolk their son silas johnson married the daughter of sir edward bushel who had married the only daughter of the duke of somerset's younger brother lord seymour which daughter the lord seymour had by queen catherine parr whom he married after the death of henry the eighth whose queen she was the above sir edward bushel's daughter was a great fortune to silas johnson and their daughter mary johnson mary the reverend francis drayton of little chart in kent where he and his wife lie buried from that marriage the records of the pedigree down to lawson are very clear and certain and need not lengthen this statement whether from any records or knowledge or tradition the old grandmother declaring the marriage of catherine's daughter to sir edward bushel is impossible now to say but it seems that silas johnson by his marriage with their daughter mary bushel obtained a great fortune 
together with some relics of Catherine Parr's personal property, which have continued in the Lawson family, their descendants ever since. They are thus described by Johnson Lawson, Esquire, in whose possession they are at present. A fine damask napkin, which evidently was made for and brought from Spain by Catherine of Aragon, the first queen of Henry the Eighth. The beautiful pattern therein exhibits the spread eagle with the motto plus altre four times, and on the dress of four men blowing trumpets, attired in the Spanish garb as matadors, are the letters K.I.P., probably Catherine Infanta Princess. And this napkin, in the palace of Henry the Eighth must have passed through the hands of six queens, including Catherine Parr. The second relic is the royal arms of the King Henry, engraved on copper in cameo, which were set in the center of a large pewter dish. The table service in those times was usually pewter. In the absence of those bona fide vouchers of the marriage of the young lady Mary Seymour, which had been destroyed by time, by accident, or wanton ignorance, it may be conjectured that the Duchess of Suffolk, after her marriage with Richard Bertie, and her subsequent flight from the Marian persecution, provided for her youthful protege by an honorable marriage with Sir Edward Bushel, though certainly much beneath the alliances which would have courted her acceptance, had she not been wrongfully deprived of the great wealth she ought to have inherited as the only child of Queen Catherine Parr. The Lawsons, who claimed their descent from the daughter of Catherine Parr, are a branch of the ancient family of the Lawsons of Yorkshire and Westmoreland, and bear the same arms. Queen Catherine Parr was originally interred in the north side of the altar of that then splendid chapel of Sudley, and a mural tablet of sculptured alabaster was placed above her tomb. The chapel is now despoiled, desecrated, and in ruins. The roofless walls alone remain. The notice of Queen Catherine's death and interment, from the document in the Herald's office, having been published in Rood's History of Gloucestershire, some ladies, who happened to be at Sudley Castle in May 1782, determined to examine the ruined chapel. Observing a large block of alabaster fixed in the north wall of the chapel, they imagined that it might be the back of a monument that had once been fixed there. Led by this hint, they had the ground open not far from there, and not above a foot from the surface, they found a leaden envelope, which they opened in two places, on the face and breast, and found it to contain a human body wrapped in sear cloth. Upon removing the portion that covered the face, they discovered the features, particularly the eyes, in the most perfect state of preservation. Alarmed with this sight, and with the smell which came from the sear cloth, they ordered the earth to be thrown in immediately, without closing over the sear cloth and lead which covered the face, only observing enough of the inscription to convince them it was the body of Queen Catherine. In the same summer, Mr. John Lucas, the person who rented the land on which the ruins of the chapel stand, removed the earth from the leaden coffin, which laid at the depth of two feet, or little more, below the surface. On the lid appeared an inscription, of which the following is a true copy. K.P., here lieth Queen Catherine, sixth wife to King Henry the Eighth, and after the wife of Thomas Lord Sudley, High Admiral of England, and uncle to King Edward the Sixth. She died September, 1548. Mr. Lucas had the curiosity to rip up the top of the coffin, and found the whole body, wrapped in six or seven linen seer cloths, entire and uncorrupted, although it had been buried upwards of two centuries and a half. He made an incision through the sear cloths, which covered one of the arms of the corpse, the flesh of which at that time was white and moist. The perfect state in which the body of Queen Catherine Parr was found affords a convincing evidence that her death was not occasioned by poison, for in that case, almost immediate decomposition would have taken place, rendering the process of embalming ineffectual, if not impracticable. The repose of the Berry Queen was again rudely violated by ruffian hands in the spring of 1784, when the royal remains were taken out of the coffin and irreverently thrown on a heap of rubbish and exposed to public view. An ancient woman, who was present on that occasion, assured my friend, Miss Jane Porter, some years afterwards, that the remains of costly burial clothes were on the body, not a shroud, but a dress, as if in life. Shoes were on the feet, 
which were very small, and all her proportions extremely delicate, and she particularly noticed that traces of beauty were still perceptible in the countenance, of which the features were at that time perfect, but by exposure to the air and other injurious treatment, the process of decay rapidly commenced. Through the interference of the vicar, the body was reinterred. In October 1786, a scientific exhumation was made by the Reverend Treadwell Nash, F.A.S., and his interesting and valuable report has been published in the Archaeologica, from which the following abstract is given. In 1786, October 14, having obtained leave from Lord Rivers, the owner of Sudley Castle, with the Honorable J. Summer Cox, the writer proceeded to examine the chapel. Upon opening the ground and tearing up the lead, the face was found totally decayed. The teeth, which were sound, had fallen. The body was perfect, but out of delicacy was not uncovered. Her hands and nails were entire, of a brownish color. The queen must have been of low stature, as the lead that enclosed her corpse was just five feet four inches long. The seer cloth consisted of many folds of linen, dipped in wax, tar, and gums, and the lead fitted exactly to the shape of the body. It seems at first extraordinary that she should be buried so near the surface, but we should consider that the pavement, and perhaps some earth, had been taken away since she was first interred. As she was buried within the communion rails, probably the ground was three feet higher than the rest of the chapel. I could heartily wish more respect was paid to the remains of this amiable queen, and would willingly, with proper leave, have them wrapped in another sheet of lead and coffin, and decently interred in another place, that at least her body might rest in peace, whereas the chapel where she now lies is used for the keeping of rabbits, which make holes, and scratch very irreverently about the royal corpse. The chapel seems a beautiful miniature of that belonging to Eton College. The last time the coffin of Queen Catherine Parr was open, it was discovered that a wreath of ivy had entwined itself round the temples of the royal corpse, a berry having fallen there, and taken root at the time of her previous exhumation, and there had silently, from day to day, woven itself into this green, sepulchral coronal. A lock of hair, which was taken from the head of Queen Catherine Parr, after it had lain in the dust and darkness of the grave for nearly two centuries and a half, was kindly sent for my inspection by Mrs. Constable Maxwell. It was of exquisite quality and color, exactly resembling threads of burnished gold in its hue. It was very fine, and with inclination to curl naturally. The ruined chapel of Sudley, with the very small remains of the castle, now a farmhouse, were visited by me, says Mr. Lawson, A.D. 1828, and I am sorry to report that Queen Catherine's remains have not been redeposited with the honor and historical respect due to the royal and noble lady. For, instead of their being replaced within the walls of their own grave, and secured from further intrusion, they are buried in a lean-to building outside the north wall, in which divine service is sometimes performed, to preserve the rite as a parochial church. How much better it would be to restore the chapel itself, for this purpose, and to erect a suitable monument to the memory of Catherine Parr. Surely some mark of consideration and grateful respect is due from this country to the memory of our first Protestant queen, and, if the owner of the soil which covers her sacred dust does not endeavor to preserve her remains from further outrage, the bishop of the diocese is called upon to devise some suitable protection, for the desecrated grave of this royal lady, to whom the Church of England owes the preservation of the University of Cambridge. With Catherine Parr closes the records of the Queen Consorts of England. The next two queens of England, Mary I and Elizabeth, were sovereigns, and with the Queen of James I, Anne of Denmark, the series of queens of Great Britain will commence. End of section 8《Section 9 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary, First Queen Regnant of England and Ireland, Chapter 1, Part 1. 
Mary, our first queen regnant, was the only child of Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon, who reached maturity. She first saw the light on the banks of the Thames, at Greenwich Palace, on Monday, at four in the morning, February 18th, 1516. As she was a healthy babe, her birth consoled her parents for the loss of the two heirs male, who had preceded her, nor in her childhood was her father ever heard to regret her sex. The queen confided her to the care of her beloved friend, the Countess of Salisbury, Margaret Plantagenet, and the royal infant's first nourishment was supplied by one of the lady's family. Catherine, the wife of Leonard Pole, was Mary's wet nurse. The princess was, according to custom, baptized the third day after her birth. The silver font, in which the children of Elizabeth of York and Henry the Seventh had been christened, once more traveled from Christ Church, Canterbury, to the Grey Friars, adjacent to the Greenwich Palace. Carpets were spread for the royal babe's procession, from the palace to the font, which was placed in the Grey Friars Church, guarded by Knight's Banneret. The godmothers were the Princess Catherine Plantagenet and the Duchess of Norfolk. The infant was carried by the Countess of Salisbury, the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, both uncles of the princess by marriage, walked on each side of her. Cardinal Wolsey was godfather. She was named Mary after the favorite sister of Henry the Eighth. When the baptism was finished, the Countess of Salisbury knelt at the altar, with her infant charge in her arms, who received the preliminary rite of confirmation or bishoping, the Countess being her sponsor at that ceremony. Various rich presents were bestowed on the Princess Mary by her sponsors and relatives, who assisted at her baptism. Cardinal Wolsey gave a gold cup. Her aunt, Mary Tudor, gave her niece and name child a pomander of gold. The Princess Catherine gave a gold spoon. The Duchess of Norfolk presented a primer, being a book richly illumined, of Catholic offices of devotion. Mary was reared, till she was weaned, in the apartments of the queen her mother, and the first rudiments of her education were commenced by that tender parent as soon as she could speak. Both Henry and Catherine were in the habit of dandling Mary, and holding her in their arms after dinner. Sebastian Justiniani, the Venetian ambassador, observes in his dispatches, dated March 1st, 1518, that Henry the Eighth came to his palace called Windsor, about twenty miles from London, and dined there. The king then took from the arms of the serene Queen Catherine his little daughter, at that time about two years old, and carried her to Cardinal Wolsey, and to our ambassador, who kissed her hand. The nursery establishment of the princess was occasionally stationed at Ditton Park, in Buckinghamshire, the royal infant was often ferried over the Thames to Windsor Castle, when her parents sojourned there. Her education must have commenced at a very tender age, if her early attainments in music may be taken in evidence. After the first months of her infancy, no more payments occurred to Catherine Pole, as her wet nurse, but the care of her person was consigned to Lady Margaret Bryan, the wife of Sir Thomas Bryan, who was called the Lady Mistress. This lady superintended the temperate meals of the royal infant, which consisted of one dish of meat, with bread. The Countess of Salisbury was state governess, and head of the household, the annual expenses of which amounted to eleven hundred pounds. Sir Weston Brown was chamberlain. Richard Sidnor, treasurer and accountant. Alice Baker, gentlewoman of the bedchamber, at a salary of ten pounds and Alice Wood, laundress, at thirty-three shillings half-yearly. Sir Henry wrote, priest, was chaplain and clerk of the closet, at an allowance of six pence per day. Ditton Park and Hanworth were the earliest residences of the princess's childhood, but while her parents were absent in France, at the celebrated field of cloth of gold, she seems to have kept court in royal state at their palace of Richmond. Here the Privy Council frequently visited her, and sent daily details of her health and behavior to her absent parents, or to Cardinal Wolsey. Some foreign strangers were introduced by the order of the king to the royal child, who, though little more than three years old, had to sit up in state, greet them courteously and rationally, 
and, finally, to amuse them by playing on the virginals. She must have been a musical prodigy, if, at that tender age, she could play a tune correctly on a musical instrument. The visits of three Frenchmen of rank to the princess is thus described by the Privy Council. After they had been shown everything notable in London, they were conveyed in a barge by the Lord Berners and Lord Darcy to Richmond, where they repaired to the princess and found her right honorably accompanied with noble personages, as well spiritual as temporal, and her house and chambers furnished with a proper number of goodly gentlemen and tall yeomen. Her presence chamber was attended, besides the lady governess and her gentlewomen, by the Duchess of Norfolk and her three daughters, the Lady Margaret, wife to the Lord Herbert, the Lady Grey, Lady Neville, and Lord John's wife. In the great chamber were many other gentlewomen, well apparelled. And when the gentlemen of France came into the presence chamber to the princess, her grace in such wise showed herself unto them, in welcoming and entertaining them with most goodly countenance, proper communication, and pleasant pastime, in playing on the virginals, that they greatly marveled and rejoiced at the same, her tender age considered. The infant royal performer must have been exceedingly docile and well-trained, not only to receive and speak properly to foreign strangers, but to play her tunes when required. The instrument here mentioned was the first rude idea our ancestors had formed of a piano. It was a miniature keyed instrument, contained in a box about four feet long, with an ivory or boxwood finger board, limited to two or three octaves, and was, when wanted, placed on a table before the performer. When the little princess had exhibited her infantine skill on this instrument, refreshments were served to the foreign guests, of strawberries, wine, wafers, and ipocras. The council, in another letter, thus mentions the princess again. Since our last writing we have sundry times visited and seen your dearest daughter the princess, who, God be thanked, is in prosperous health and convalescence, and like as she increaseth in days and years, so doth she in grace and virtue. General history is not silent regarding Mary's infantine musical attainments. In the Italian history of Polino, it is asserted that Mary played on the arpicordo, which is the same name as the harpsichord. The Italian seems to designate by it the instrument called by the chroniclers, clavichord. This she used to play on, he adds, when a very little child, and she had so far mastered the difficulties as to have a light touch, with much grace and velocity. When her royal parents returned to England, Mary went back to her nursery at Ditton Park, but she made a long visit to the king and queen the succeeding Christmas. She was a very lovely infant, her complexion rosy and her eyes brown, and right merry and joyous. It is not probable that the king, who was passionately fond of children, could part from an attractive prattler of that age. Accordingly, she remained at Greenwich till after her fourth birthday. The Christmas gifts made to the princess that year were numerous, and some of them very costly. There was, however, but one article calculated to please a little child. This was a rosemary bush hung with spangles of gold, brought for her by a poor woman of Greenwich. It was, perhaps, like the Christmas tree, which gives such delight to the German children. Cardinal Wolsey sent her a gold cup. The Princess Catherine Plantagenet, two small silver flagons. Queen Mary Tudor, another golden pomander. Her nurse, Lady Margaret Bryan, a crimson purse, tinseled. And the Duke of Norfolk, a pair of silver snuffers. The princess was amused by the performance of a company of children, who acted plays for her diversion, and in her accounts, six shillings eight pence is given to a man who managed the little actors as a reward. This man, it appears, was Haywood, the dramatic author. The succeeding Christmas was spent by the Princess Mary at Ditton Park, where, among the diversions of the season, a lord of misrule, one John Thurgood, was appointed to make mirth for herself and household, with Morris dancers, masks, carillons, and hobby horses. After Christmas she crossed the Thames to Windsor, and there received her New Year's gifts. From the king a standing cup of silver gilt, filled with coin. 
from Cardinal Wolsey, a gold salt set with pearls, and from her aunt, Princess Catherine, a gold cross. The princess made her Candlemas offering that year at Hanworth, and thence proceeded to Richmond, where her mother, the queen, sent her barge, to convey her to Greenwich. The same month she stood godmother to the infant daughter of Sir William Compton, to whom she gave the name of Mary. At the baptism, the lady mistress, Margaret Bryan, distributed thirty-three shillings to the attendants. This office of standing godmother made a pleasing impression on the memory of the princess of five years old. Since it was often reiterated, she must have stood godmother to more than a hundred children. More than one negotiation had been in agitation, for the marriage of the young princess with the dauphin, heir to Francis I, while she was yet in her cradle. But neither Henry the Eighth nor Francis I appear to have been sincere in their intentions. In the summer of 1522, she was brought to Greenwich, where the queen, her mother, holding her by the hand at the hall door of the palace, there introduced her to the emperor Charles V on his landing, with Henry, from his barge at the water stairs. It was the wish of Queen Catherine's heart that this great emperor, her nephew, might become her son-in-law, and all the political arrangements between him and her husband seemed to favor that wish. The emperor, who was then a young man, in his twenty-third year, came expressly to England for betrothal to his cousin Mary, a child of six years old. He passed five weeks in England, so the little princess became well acquainted with him, and learned, young as she was, to consider herself as his empress. By a solemn matrimonial treaty, signed at Windsor, the emperor engaged to marry the princess Mary when she attained her twelfth year. He was in the meantime exceedingly desirous that she should be sent to Spain, that she might be educated as his wife. But the doting affection of her parents could not endure the separation. The emperor's visit caused the expenditure of the princess's establishment to amount to the great sum of one thousand one hundred and thirty nine pounds, six shillings and one and a half pence. The care of Mary's excellent mother was now sedulously directed to give her child an education that would render her a fitting companion to the greatest sovereign of modern history, not only in regard to extent of dominions, but in character and attainments. To Dr. Linacre, a learned physician, who had formerly been one of Prince Arthur's tutors, was entrusted the care of the Princess Mary's health, and some part of her instruction in Latin. The queen, her mother, as appears by her own written testimony, often examined her translations and reading with her. Linacre died when the princess was but eight years of age, having first written a Latin grammar for her use. It was dedicated to her, and he speaks with praise of her docility and love of learning at that tender age. The copy belonging to the princess is now in the British Museum. Queen Catherine requested Ludovicus Vives, a Spaniard of deep learning, who was called by his contemporaries the second quintilian, to draw up a code of instructions for the education of Mary. He sent a treatise in Latin, dedicated to the queen, from Bruges, and afterwards came to England, and at Oxford revised and improved it. He thus addresses Catherine of Aragon. Governed by these my monitions, Maria thy daughter, and she will be formed by them. She will resemble thy domestic example of probity and wisdom, and, except all human expectations fail, holy and good will she be by necessity." Vives points out with exultation the daughters of Sir Thomas More as glorious examples of the effects of a learned and virtuous female education. His rules are rigid. He implores that the young princess may read no idle books of chivalry or romance. He defies and renounces such compositions in Spanish as Amadis du Gaul, Tirante the White, and others burnt by the curate in Don Quixote. He abjures Lancelot du Lac, Paris and Vienne, Pierre Provençal, Margalone and the fairy Messalina. In Flemish he denounces Floris and Blanche, Pyremus and Thisbe. All these and such as these he classes as Libri Pestiferi, corrupting to the morals of females. 
In their places he desires that the young Princess Mary may read the Gospels, night and morning, the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles, selected portions of the Old Testament and the works of Cyprian, Jerome, Augustine and Ambrose, likewise Plato, Cicero, Seneca's Maxims, Plutarch's and Curidian, the Paraphrase of Erasmus, and the Utopia of Sir Thomas More. Among the works of classic poets, he admitted the Pharsalia of Lucan, the tragedies of Seneca, with selected portions of Horace. He deemed cards, dice, and splendid dress, as pestiferous as romances. He gave rules for her pronunciation of Greek and Latin, and advised that lessons from these languages should be committed to memory every day, and read over two or three times before the pupil went to bed. He recommended that the princess should render English into Latin frequently, and likewise that she should converse with her preceptor in that language. Her Latin dictionary was to be either parodi or colopin. He permitted some stories for her recreation, but they were all to be purely historical, sacred, or classic. He instanced the narrative of Joseph and his brethren in the scriptures, that of Papyrus in Aulus Gellens, and Lucretia in Livy. The well-known tale of Griselda is the only exception to his general exclusion of fiction, and that perhaps he took for fact. It is a curious coincidence that Griselda was afterwards considered in England as the prototype of Queen Catherine. The young princess was certainly educated according to the rigorous directions of Vives, and she is a historical example of the noxious effect that over-education has at a very tender age. Her precocious studies probably laid the foundation for her melancholy temperament and delicate health. The Emperor Charles continued extremely desirous that the princess should be sent to Spain for education, a wish which Henry the Eighth parried by declaring that she should, while in England, be brought up and entirely trained as a Spanish lady, and that she should be even accustomed to wear the national dress of the country, whose queen she was expected to be. For this purpose he sent envoys to consult Margaret, regent of Flanders, regarding materials and patterns proper for Spanish costume. As to the education of the Princess Mary, said Henry the Eighth, if the emperor should search all Christendom for a mistress to bring her up, and frame her after the Spanish manner, he could not find one more meet than the queen's grace, her mother, who cometh of the royal house of Spain, and who, for the affection she beareth to the emperor, will nurture her, and bring her up to his satisfaction. But the noble person of the young princess is not meet as yet to bear the pains of the sea, nor strong enough to be transported into the air of another country. In the course of the summer of 1525, when this correspondence took place, rumors reached the court of England that the emperor meant to forsake the Princess Mary, and was privately engaged to Isabel of Portugal. This was probably the first sorrow experienced by Mary, who was observed to grow pale, with apprehension and jealousy, when the change of the emperor's intentions was discussed. The little creature had been persuaded by her maids that she was in love with Charles V, for about this time she sent a pretty message to him, through her father's ambassadors resident in Spain. Cardinal Wolsey thus communicated it, in a letter addressed to them, dated April 7, 1525. I send you herewith an emerald, which my lady Princess Mary sendeth to the emperor, with her most cordial and humble commendations to him. You, at the delivery of the same, shall say, that her grace hath devised this token for a better knowledge to be had, when God shall send them grace to be together, whether his majesty doth keep constant and continent to her, as with God's grace she will to him whereby you may add, that she assured love towards his majesty, hath already raised such passion in her, that it is confirmed by jealousy, which is one of the greatest signs and tokens of love. The emerald, whose color was the symbol of constancy, sent by young Mary, would, it was imagined, fade and pale its brilliant green, if the heart of the betrothed swerved from the affianced lady. Thus, in that time of transition from the chivalric to the political era, did the fond ideality of the minstrel and the troubadour, with which the heads of the maids and pages of honor, 
who waited around the little heiress, were teeming, find his way into the dispatches of the statesman. Ay, and would have had influence, too, had the betrothed princess been taller and older. As it was, the emperor stuck the emerald ring on his little finger as far as it would go, and bade the English ambassadors say, he would wear it for the sake of the princess, asking many questions regarding her health, learning, and appearance, to which the ambassadors answered by zealously discanting upon the manifold seeds of virtues that were in her grace. Even at this time Charles V was burning with indignation at private intelligence, which had reached him, that Henry VIII meditated a divorce from Queen Catherine, and the consequent disinheriting of her daughter. In the course of the same year, Charles broke his contract of betrothal with Mary, and wedded the beautiful Isabel of Portugal. It appears he justified his conduct by a letter full of reproaches to Henry VIII, for his sinister intentions in respect to Mary. Henry took great pains to show him in what a different light he ostensibly regarded his only child, for Mary, if not actually declared Princess of Wales, as some authors have affirmed, assuredly received honors and distinctions which have never, either before or since, been offered to any one but the heir apparent of England. A court was formed for her at Ludlow Castle, on a grander scale than those established either for her uncle Arthur or Edward of York, both acknowledged princes of Wales, and heirs apparent of England. The officers and nobles who composed the Princess Mary's court at Ludlow were employed likewise in superintending the newly formed legislature of Wales, the natives of the principality being at last, by the tardy gratitude of the Tudors, admitted to participation in the privileges of English subjects. The Welsh had been long discontented with the absence of the royal family from any part of their territory, and the sojourn of the heiress of England was intended to conciliate their affections and sanction the new laws. Sir John Dudley, whose ambition afterwards made him so prominent a character as Earl of Warwick and Duke of Northumberland in the next reign, was appointed Chamberlain to the Princess Mary at her new court. Thomas Audley, afterwards Lord Chancellor, and John Russell were members of her council. The Countess of Salisbury resided with her, as she had done from her birth, as head of her establishment and state governess, an office always filled, till the time of James I, by a lady of the blood royal. The princess had besides no less than thirteen ladies of honor, and a crowd of lower functionaries, whose united salaries amounted to seven hundred and forty-one pounds, thirteen shillings, nine pence. End of section nine. Section 10 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary, Chapter 1, Part 2. Mary took leave of her parents at the Palace of Langley, in Hertfordshire, in September, 1525, previously to her departure for Ludlow Castle. Dr. Sampson gives a pleasing description of her person and qualities at this epoch. My lady princess, he says in a letter to Wolsey, came hither on Saturday, surely, sir, of her age, as goodly a child as ever I have seen, and of as good gesture and countenance. Few persons of her age blend sweetness better with seriousness, or quickness with deference. She is at the same time joyous and decorous in manners. In fact, Contemporaries in all portraiture represent Mary at this period of her life as a lovely child, but if human ingenuity had been taxed to the utmost in order to contrive the most cruel contrast between her present and future prospects, it could not have been more thoroughly effaced than by first placing her in viceregal pomp and state as Princess of Wales at Ludlow Castle, and then afterwards blighting her young mind by hurling her undeservedly into poverty and contempt. It was exceedingly probable that Henry meant fraudulently to force a high alliance for Mary before he disinherited her, and therefore took the deceitful step of placing her in a station which had never been occupied, excepting by an heir apparent of England. It was in her court, at Ludlow Castle, 
that Mary first practiced to play the part of queen, a lesson she was soon compelled to unlearn, with the bitterest insults. Her education at the same time went steadily on, with great assiduity. Fresh instructions were given to her counsel regarding her tuition, when she parted from her royal parents. They emanated from the maternal tenderness and good sense of Queen Catherine, whose earnest wish was evidently to render her daughter healthy and cheerful, as well as learned and accomplished. First, above all other things, the Countess of Salisbury, being Lady Governess, shall, according to the singular confidence that the King's Highness hath in her, give most tender regard to all that concerns the person of said princess, her honourable education and training in virtuous demeanour, that is to say, to serve God, from whom all grace and goodness proceedeth. Likewise, at seasons convenient, to use moderate exercise, taking open air in gardens, sweet and wholesome places, and walks, which may conduce unto her health, solace and comfort, as by the said lady governess shall be thought most convenient. And likewise to pass her time most seasons at her virginals, or other musical instruments, so that the same be not too much, and without fatigation, or weariness, to attend to her learning of Latin tongue and French. At other seasons to dance, and among the rest to have good respect to her diet, which is meet, or proper, to be pure, well prepared, dressed, and served with comfortable, joyous, and merry communication, in all honourable and virtuous manner. Likewise, the cleanliness and well-wearing of her garments and apparel, both of her chamber and person, so that everything about her be pure, sweet, clean, and wholesome, as to so great a princess doth appertain, all corruptions, evil airs, and things noisome and unpleasant, to be eschewed. With these instructions, the Princess Mary and her court departed for Ludlow, which Leland describes as a fair manor place, standing in a goodly park, west of the town of Bewdley, on the very knob of the hill. He adds, the castle was built by Henry the Seventh for his son, Prince Arthur. It was probably repaired and decorated, but the castle was previously the grand feudal seat of the Mortimers, as lords of the marches. Richard, Duke of York, as heir of those semi-royal chiefs, resided there, and the young Prince of Wales, afterwards the unfortunate Edward V, was educated and kept his court there, as heir apparent of England, for some years previous to the death of his father, Edward IV. As a great concourse of people was expected at Ludlow Castle during the Christmas festivities, for the purpose of paying respect to the princess, her council thought it requisite that she should keep Christmas with princely cheer. They therefore wrote to the cardinal, intimating the articles requisite, for the use of their young mistress's household. A silver ship, or neff, which was to hold the table napkin for the princess, an alms dish, and silver spice plates, were among these requests. They wanted trumpets, and a rebeck, and hinted a wish for the appointment of a lord of misrule, and some provision for interludes, disguisings, and plays at the feast, and for the banquet at twelfth night. The residence of Mary at Ludlow lasted about eighteen months, varied with occasional visits to Tinken Hill, and to the magnificent unfinished palace of the unfortunate Duke of Buckingham, at Thornbury, lately seized by the king. Her education, meanwhile, proceeded rapidly. Lord Morley, one of the literary nobles of that day, thus alludes to Mary's attainments in a preface to his translation of New Year's Angelical Salutation, one of his works presented to her some years afterwards, when her changed fortune had wholly silenced the voice of flattery. I do well remember, says Lord Morley, addressing the princess, that scant had ye come to twelve years of age, but ye were so rife in the Latin tongue, that wraith, or rarely, doth happen to the woman's sex, that your grace not only could properly read, write, and construe Latin, but furthermore, translate any hard thing of the Latin into our English tongue, and among other your virtuous occupations, I have seen one prayer of your doing of St. Thomas Aquine, that I do assure your grace is so well done, so near to the Latin, that when I look upon it, as I have won the exemplar of it, I have not only marvel at the doing of it, but farther for the well doing of it, 
I have said it, or copied it, in my books, as also in my poor wife's, probably her prayer book, and my children, to them occasion to remember, to pray for your grace. Mary's translation, thus described by her friend, is as follows. The prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, translated out of Latin into English, by the most excellent Princess Mary, daughter to the most high and mighty prince and princess, King Henry the Eighth and Queen Catherine his wife, in the year of our Lord God, 1527, and the eleventh of her age. O merciful God, grant me to covet with an ardent mind those things which may please thee, to search them wisely, to know them truly, and to fulfill them perfectly, to the laud and glory of thy name. Order my living that I may do that, which thou requirest of me, and give me grace that I may know it, and have wit and power to do it, and that I may obtain those things which be convenient to my soul. Good Lord, make my way sure and straight to thee, that I fail not between prosperity and adversity, but that in prosperous things I may give thee thanks, and in adversity be patient, so that I be not lift up with the one, nor oppressed with the other, and that I may rejoice in nothing but in that which moveth me to thee, nor be sorry for nothing but for those which draweth me to thee, desiring to please nobody, nor fearing to displease any besides thee. Lord, let all my worldly things be vile to me for thee, and that all thy things be dear to me, and thou, good Lord, most specially above them all. Let me be weary with that joy which is without thee, and let me desire nothing beside thee. Let the labor delight me which is for thee, and let all rest weary me which is not in thee. Make me to lift my heart oft times to thee, and when I fall, make me to think and be sorry with a steadfast purpose of amendment. My God, make me humble without feigning, merry without lightness or levity, sad or reflective, without mistrust, sober or steady without dullness, fearing without despair, gentle without doubleness, trustful in thee without presumption, telling my neighbors of their faults without mocking, obedient without arguing, patient without grudging, and pure without corruption. My most loving Lord and God, give me a waking heart, that no curious thought draw me from thee. Let it be strong, that no unworthy affection draw me backward, so stable that no tribulation break it, and so free, that no election by violence make any challenge to it. My Lord God, grant me wit to know thee, diligence to seek thee, wisdom to find thee, conversation to please thee, continuance or constancy to look for thee, and finally hope to embrace thee, by thy penance here to be punished, and in our way to use thy benefits by thy grace, and in heaven, through thy glory, to have delight in thy joys and rewards. Amen. There is a childlike simplicity in this translation. At the same time, the perspicuity apparent in the construction proves that Mary had the command of her own language, as well as the knowledge of it, points which do not always meet with proper attention in a classical education. In her missal, from which this early performance is drawn, the young princess has added, I have read, that nobody liveth as he should do, but he that followeth virtue, and I, reckoning you to be one of them, I pray you to remember me in your devotions. Mary, child of K. The princess has added, child of King Henry and Queen Catherine, but as such a sentence, in succeeding years, render the person in whose hand it was written, liable to the pains and penalties of high treason, all the words but those in italics, were subsequently obliterated. While the princess still resided at Ludlow Castle, Henry the Eighth made a desperate attempt to marry her to Francis I, with the intention of revenging himself on the Emperor Charles, and, perhaps, of removing his daughter out of his way before he dismissed her mother. The King of France was under engagements to marry the Emperor's sister, Eleonora of Austria, the widow of Emmanuel the Great, King of Portugal. Wolsey, who could not bear this close alliance between France and Spain, 
prevailed on his royal master to send Dr. Clerk to Louise, Duchess of Savoy, the mother of Francis, for the purpose of proposing a marriage between him and Mary, the then acknowledged heiress of England, an unsuitable marriage, for the princess was, in 1526, but eleven years of age. The marriage with Eleonora had been one of the conditions of Francis's liberation from his captivity, but it now seemed doubtful whether Charles would trust his enemy with an amiable sister, whom he loved so entirely. While the matter was uncertain, Dr. Clerk beset the Duchess Louise, with panegyric on the young Mary's beauty and docility. Howbeit, he says in his dispatch, I observe that Madame Eleonora was now of the age of thirty, and peradventure there should not be found in her so much good nature and humility as my lady princess mary whom now at her age and after her education she might bring up fashion forge and make of her whatever she would assuring her that my said lady princess would be as loving lowly and humble to her as to her own father the lady duchess then held up her hands and with tears declared that i said truth adding, that if it should be my lady princess's chance to be queen of France, she would be as loving again to her as to her own son Francis I. Louise made the most rational proposal of a union between her second grandson, Henry, Duke of Orléans, and the young English princess, but this did not answer Wolsey's purpose, which was to break a family league between Francis and the emperor. The bishop then sought Francis I himself, to whom he descanted, in terms of great hyperbole, on the girlish beauties of Mary, calling her the pearl of the world, and the jewel her father esteemed more than anything on earth. Francis affirmed that he had wished to espouse her before he left France. Sir, responded the bishop, whereat stick ye then? For she is of that beauty and virtue. Here Francis interrupted him, being, perhaps, impatient at hearing all this incongruous flattery, regarding a small child. His words, though couched in a similar strain, have the semblance of satire. I pray you, said the king, repeat unto me none of these matters. I know well her education, her form and her fashion, her beauty and her virtue, and what father and mother she cometh of. I have as great a mind to marry her as ever I had any woman. And then he declared, he had promised Eleonora, and was not free without she refused first. This strange negotiation ended with the king's mother informing the English ambassador, that news had arrived of Queen Eleonora, having laid aside her widow's weeds, and therefore it was evident she looked upon herself as the future queen of France. Francis I, though, by no means anxious to espouse a bride of eleven years old, seemed really desirous of receiving Mary as his daughter-in-law, and at various periods of his life, endeavoring to match her with his son Henry, Duke of Orléans. It was in the course of one of these negotiations, which took place in the succeeding spring of 1527, that, as it was affirmed by Henry the Eighth and Wolsey, doubts of the legitimacy of Mary were first started. The precise time of the withdrawal of the Princess Mary from her court at Ludlow Castle is not defined. It was probably to receive the French ambassadors, who had arrived for the purpose of negotiating her marriage with the second son of France. Many notices exist of her participation in the giddy revelry of her father's court. Among others, occur the following curious verses, quoted here, not for any poetical merit they possess, but for their historical allusions. They were evidently penned by some courtly adulator, who had been present at a ball, at which Mary danced with her royal father, and strange must have been the contrast presented between his colossal figure and her petite and fragile form. Ravished I was, that well was me, O Lord, to me so fain, or willing, to see that sight that I did see, I long full sore again, I saw a king and a princess, dancing before my face, most like a god and a goddess, I pray Christ save their grace. This king to see whom we have sung, his virtues be right much, but this princess, being so young, there can be found none such. So fake and fair she is to see, like to her is none of her age. 
without in grace it cannot be so young to be so sage this king to see with his fair flower the mother standing by it doth me good yet at this hour on them when that think i i pray christ save father and mother and this young lady fair and send her shortly a brother to be england's right heir the tenor of these lines plainly indicates that they were composed at a period when catherine of aragon was still the undoubted queen presiding at the regal festival yet that the lamentations of henry for a son to be england's right heir on which he founded his grand plea for the divorce were beginning to be re-echoed by his flatterers but the princess appeared soon after not only as the partner of her royal sire in the stately paven or minuet of that era but as a dancer in courtly ballets and a performer in comedies no slight infringement of the rigid rules prescribed for her education by ludovicus vives she seems nevertheless to have passed through the trials of this early introduction to display and dissipation without incurring the least blame for levity of conduct on the contrary all parties joined in praising the simplicity and purity of her manners and pursuits among these commendations is one according to the bias of the times which will appear no particular excellency in modern estimation for instance she is praised for dressing on the easter festival according to the old usages of england in the very best apparel she had in order that she might show her gladness at receiving the sacrament this is a curious illustration of the national custom still existing among the lower classes who scrupulously wear their best clothes on easter day and if possible purchase some new apparel the practice of royal personages exhibiting themselves in the costume of stage players had been hitherto unexampled excepting for henry the eighth and the most profligate of the roman emperors nor was the coarse mind of henry satisfied without the females of his family following his example his beautiful sister mary when she first appeared in one of these pantomimic ballets wore a black crape mask as an ethiopian princess she soon became emboldened and freely took her part as a dancer in the court balls and pageants still it was strange that the king should wish a girl young as his daughter was thus to challenge the gaze of strangers she appeared before the french ambassadors at greenwich palace in the spring of fifteen twenty seven with five of her ladies disguised in icelandic dresses and with six lords in the costume of the same country danced lustily about the hall at another banquet and mask before the same ambassadors in may the princess mary issued out of a cave with her seven ladies all apparelled after the roman fashion in rich cloth of gold and crimson tinsel bendy that is the dresses were striped in a slanty direction a roman fashion that may vainly be sought in classic remains their hair was wrapped in cauls of gold with bonnets of crimson velvet on their heads set full of pearls and precious stones mary and her seven ladies then danced a ballet with eight lords some scenic effect was evidently attempted in this performance the princess is said likewise to have acted a part in one of terence's comedies in the original latin for the entertainment of the french ambassadors at hampton court mary was but in her twelfth year at this epoch from which the commencement of her misfortunes may be dated for a few weeks afterwards her mother's divorce became matter of public discussion just at this time may twenty first fifteen twenty seven was born at valladolid philip afterwards the second of spain son of the emperor charles v and isabel of portugal who afterwards became the husband of the princess mary henry the eighth during the protracted discussion of the divorce was at times extremely embarrassed by his affection for mary and her claims on his paternity sometimes he bestowed profuse caresses on her in public and at the first movement of the divorce gave out that the inquiry was made only to settle her claims permanently to the succession the princess meantime remained near her parents in possession of the same state and distinction she had enjoyed since her birth henry thus mentions his daughter in one of his speeches regarding the divorce from her mother although says he we have had the lady mary singular both in beauty and shape by the most noble lady catherine 
yet that marriage cannot be legitimate which gives us such pain and torment of conscience the jealous disposition of henry was probably soon inflamed into rancor when he found in the course of the dispute that his daughter took part with her mother and was moreover the idol of his people who declared on all occasions that king henry might marry whom he would yet they would acknowledge no successor to the crown but the husband of the lady mary wolsey was hated furiously throughout england because he was supposed to be the originator of the divorce and one of the popular rhymes of the day thus sets forth public indignation at the wrongs of the people's darling yea a princess whom to describe it was hard for an orator she is but a child in age and yet she is both wise and sage and beautiful in favor perfectly doth she represent the singular graces excellent both of her father and mother howbeit this disregarding the carter of york is meddling for to divorce them asunder it has been asserted by all contemporaries that queen catherine at one time of her life cherished an ardent desire that her daughter mary should be united in marriage with reginald pole son of the countess of salisbury the noble kinswoman who had constantly resided with the young princess all the biographers of reginald pole declared that mary manifested the greatest partiality to him from her earliest childhood this might have been yet the difference of their ages reginald being born in fifteen hundred was too great for any partiality to have subsisted between them in early life as lovers while there was hope of her daughter becoming the wife of the emperor it was not probable that queen catherine who loved her nephew exceedingly could have wished her to marry reginald pole but when reginald returned to england at the same time that the imperial match was broken off and appeared in her court in his twenty-fifth year possessing the highest cultivation of mind the grandest person and features of that perfect mould of beauty which revived the memory of the heroic plantagenets his ancestors it is possible that the wise queen weighing the disadvantages of wedlock with a foreign monarch might wish mary united to such a protector the match would have been highly popular among the english as the national love for the memory of the plantagenet kings was only equalled by the intense national jealousy of foreign alliances besides which the personal qualities of reginald rendered him the pride of his country he had however a mistrust of the atmosphere of the english court as portentous of storm and change he reminded his royal relatives that he had been educated for the church and withdrew himself into the seclusion of the carthusian convent of sion here reginald abstracted himself from the world by sedulous attention to books but it was observed that he neither took priest's orders nor monastic vows while the perplexities of the divorce engrossed public attention few notices occurred of the princess mary excepting that the queen was occasionally threatened with separation from her child a proof that their intercourse continued both the queen and princess were with the king at tittenhanger during the prevalence of the plague called the sweating sickness in fifteen twenty eight at the ensuing christmas the king gave his daughter twenty pounds to disport her with at ampthill one of her servants received for her use ten pounds to make pastime withal she seems to have spent the year fifteen thirty entirely with her mother for hall occasionally mentions her at greenwich particularly at the close of the year when he says speaking of henry's disappointment at finding himself still remaining the husband of catherine of aragon the king sore lamented his chance he made no mirth or pastime as he was wont to do yet he dined with and resorted to the queen as accustomed he minished nothing of her estate and much loved and cherished their daughter the lady mary these words afford proof that the establishment and royal routine of the mother and daughter continue the same as formerly lady salisbury likewise retained her office and reginald pole her son who had with a single exception of an honourable mission to paris been resident in england for five years must have had frequent opportunities of seeing the princess on account of his mother's residence with her and her near relationship to the royal family mary was now a very lovely girl in her fifteenth year 
she manifested the greatest partiality to her noble and accomplished kinsman, whether as friend or lover, it is scarcely possible to say. But history having linked together the names of Mary Tudor and Reginald Pole, by hints that matrimonial alliance was, at a later time, projected between them, their locality at this momentous period of their career becomes an interesting point of biography. End of section 10. Section 11 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary, Chapter 1, Part 3. Henry the Eighth was very anxious to gain the sanction of the noble-minded Reginald to his pending divorce. When greatly urged to give his opinion on that head, and to accept of the Archbishopric of York, rendered vacant by the death of Wolsey, Reginald, by letter, firmly and respectfully declined this great advancement, adding many arguments against the divorce of Catherine, and the degradation of her daughter. Henry was incensed. He called a disinterested advocate before him in the stately gallery of Whitehall Palace, to account for this opposition. Reginald, who at that time loved the king ardently, could not speak for emotion, and his words, so celebrated for their impassioned eloquence, were stifled in a gush of tears. Yet his broken sentences proved that he was firm in his principles, and manly in his defense of the helpless queen and her daughter. Henry frowned, and his hand often sought the hilt of his dagger. But if his kinsman did not yield to affection or interest, there was little chance of a scion of the Plantagenets, bending to fear. Henry left Reginald weeping, and vented his temper by threats to his brother, Lord Montague, threats which long after were fatally verified. Reginald's brothers loaded him with reproaches, yet he appears to have convinced them that he was right, for Montague, his elder brother, undertook a message of explanation to the king, who had rather taken the contents of the letter which had displeased him, from the report of the Duke of Norfolk, than from his own perusal. Meantime, Henry had conquered his passion, for he was yet a novice in injustice and cruelty. He examined the letter, and after walking up and down thoughtfully for some time, turned to his kinsman, Lord Montague, and said, Your brother Reginald has rightly guessed my disposition. He has given me such good reasons for his conduct, that I am under the necessity of taking all that he has said in good part and, could he but gain on himself to approve my divorce from the queen, no one would be dearer to me. At this period, no separation had taken place of the English church from Rome, and the divorce cause remained wholly undecided. Therefore no religious prejudices were at issue in the bosom of Reginald Pole. It was as yet a simple matter of right or wrong, between a husband, wife, and child and when his opinion was demanded, and not till then, Reginald, the near kinsman of the husband and child, honestly declared what he thought of the justice of the case. If his defense of the oppressed made a powerful impression on the oppressor, what must it have done on the minds of those whose cause he pleaded? The queen, from the commencement of her troubles, had often recurred to the unjust sentence on Reginald Pole's uncle, the last of the Plantagenets. She said that she saw the judgment of God in her afflictions, for a marriage founded in murder was not likely to prosper. She knew that her father, King Ferdinand, had refused the English alliance, till Warwick was executed. The conscientious queen had endeavored to make reparation by the friendship she ever showed to Warwick's sister, the Countess of Salisbury, and by the affection she cultivated between her daughter, Mary, and the children of the Countess. At one period of her life, and this may naturally be deemed the time, Catherine was heard to express a wish that Mary might marry a son of Lady Salisbury, in order to atone for the wrong done to the Earl of Warwick, whose property was taken as well as his life. Reginald Pole used no surreptitious means to realize a wish so flattering to ambition. When the young princess was sixteen, he withdrew from England, finding that his principles could not accord with the measures of the king. 
yet it was supposed that his reluctance to take priest's orders arose from a lingering hope that the wishes of queen catherine might one day be fulfilled an utter silence is maintained alike in public history and state documents regarding that agonizing moment when the princess mary was reft from the arms of her unfortunate mother to behold her no more no witness has told the parting no pen has described it but sad and dolorous it certainly was to the hapless girl even to the destruction of health in the same month that henry the eighth and queen catherine finally parted mary had been ill for a payment was made by her father to dr bartlett of twenty pounds in reward for giving her his attendance another long sickness afflicted the princess the succeeding march when the king again gave a large sum to the physician for restoring his daughter mary's sorrow had thus cast an early blight on her constitution which she never wholly recovered but her troubles had not yet reached their climax for lady salisbury the friend next her mother dear to her heart still resided with her this fact is evident from the letter written by queen catherine in which the recent illness of mary is mentioned and at the conclusion a kind message is sent to lady salisbury in this letter catherine endeavoured with great sweetness to reconcile the princess mary to the loss of the latin lessons she used to give her by commendations of the superior ability of her tutor dr featherston who it is evident still retained his post at the same time she requested occasionally to inspect her daughter's latin exercises the queen's letter concluded with expressions of tender regret at her separation from the king and her daughter but without a word of angry complaint at the cause which she wisely knew would irritate and agonize the mind of her child woburn is the place of date which marks the time as during the queen's residence at the palace of ampthill close to that abbey the succeeding year brought many trials to the unfortunate mother and daughter who were still cruelly kept from the society of each other the king proclaimed his marriage with anne boleyn cranmer pronounced the marriage of queen catherine invalid and the coronation of the rival queen took place another letter written by catherine of aragon to her daughter occurs without date of time or place which we conjecture to have been written at bugden fifteen thirty three about the middle of august daughter i heard such tidings this day that i do perceive if it be true the time is very near when almighty god will provide for you and i am very glad of it for i trust he doth handle you with a good love i beseech you agree to his pleasure with a merry or cheerful heart and be you sure that without fail he will not suffer you to perish if you beware to offend him i pray god that you good daughter offer yourself to him if any pangs come over you strive yourself first make you clean take heed of his commandments and keep them as near as he will give you grace to do for there are you sure armed and if this lady do come to you as it is spoken if she do bring you a letter from the king i am sure in the selfsame letter you will be commanded what to do answer with very few words obeying the king your father in everything save only that you will not offend god and lose your soul and go no further with learning and disputation in the matter and wheresoever and in whatsoever company you shall come obey the king's commandments speak few words and meddle nothing i will send you two books in latin one shall be de vita christi with the declarations of the gospels and the other the epistles of st jerome that he did write to paula and eustochium and in them i trust you will see good things sometimes for your recreation use your virginals or lute if you have any but one thing specially i desire you for the love you owe to god and unto me to keep your heart with a chaste mind and your person from all ill and wanton company not thinking or desiring of any husband for christ's passion neither determine yourself to any manner of living until this troublesome time is past for i do make you sure you shall see a very good end and better than you can desire i would god good daughter that you did know with how good a heart i write this letter unto you i never did one with a better for i perceive very well that god loveth you i beseech him of his goodness to continue it i think it best you keep your keys yourself for whosoever it is 
that is, whosoever keeps her keys, shall be done as shall please them. And now you shall begin, and by likelihood I shall follow. I set not a rush by it, for when they have done the utmost they can, then I am sure of amendment. I pray you recommend me unto my good lady of Salisbury, and pray her to have a good heart, for we never come to the kingdom of heaven but by troubles. Daughter, wheresoever you come, take no pain to send to me, for, if I may, I will send to you. By your loving mother, Catherine the Queen. Hitherto this letter has been deemed a mystery. It is evidently written with conflicting feelings, under the pressure of present calamity, but with the excitement of recently awakened hope of better days. The queen has privately heard of some great, but undeclared benefit to her daughter, which she hints at, to cheer her. Meantime she expects that a lady is to summon Mary by a letter from the king, and that she is shortly to be introduced into trying scenes, where the divorce will be discussed, and her opinion demanded. On these points, she disinterestedly and generously exhorts her not to controvert her father's will. The queen expects her daughter to be surrounded by dissipated company, where temptations will sedulously be brought to assail her, against which she guards her. She likewise anticipates the enemies will be near her, and warns her to keep the keys herself, dreading the surreptitious introduction of dangerous papers into her escritory. Lady Salisbury is still Mary's protectress, but that venerable lady is in trouble, and looking darkly forward to the future. The kind queen sends her a message of Christian consolation, the efficacy of which she had fully tried. All that has been considered mysterious in the letter of Queen Catherine, vanishes before the fact preserved in the pages of the Italian Polino, who declares that Mary was present at Greenwich Palace, and in the chamber of Anne Boleyn, when Elizabeth was born. Setting aside the religious prejudices of the historian, the simple fact that Mary was there is highly probable. Till some days subsequent to the birth of Elizabeth, Henry did not disinherit his eldest daughter, lest, if anything fatal had happened to Queen Anne and her infant, he might have been left without legitimate offspring of any kind. It is very likely that the laws of England required then, as now, that the presumptive heir of the kingdom should be present at the expected birth of an heir apparent to the crown. If Catherine of Aragon's letter be read with this light cast on it, how plain does it appear? The good mother endeavored to fortify her daughter's mind for the difficult situation in which she would have found herself in the chamber of Anne Boleyn, at the birth of the rival heir. Then the beneficial change in Mary's prospects, hinted at by her mother, has reference to the recent decree of the Pope, soon after made public, who, in July, 1533, had annulled the marriage of Henry the Eighth with Anne Boleyn, and forbade them to live together under pain of excommunication, a sentence which likewise illegitimated their offspring, and confirmed Mary in her royal station. This sentence was published in September, as near as possible to the birth of Elizabeth, and secret intelligence of this measure had evidently been given to Catherine of Aragon, when she wrote to Mary. She knew that the decision of Rome had previously settled all such controversies, and it was natural enough that she should expect the same result would take place. It is very clearly to be gathered, from the continued narrative of our Italian authority, that Mary did not adhere to the temperate line of conduct her wise mother had prescribed for her. She was present, says Polino, assisting, with the relatives and friends of Anne Boleyn, in the lying-in chamber, when Lisabetta, or Elizabeth, was born, and there she heard, among the ladies and persons of the court, such secret things, relative to the conduct of the mother, as made her declare that she was sure the infant was not her sister. Thus had Mary, with the natural incautiousness of youth, given ear to all the scandal which Queen Anne's enemies were whispering on this occasion, and Mary's informants, who were probably her deadliest foes, had repeated to Anne Boleyn and the king, any imprudence she, in the excitement of the moment, might utter, or even what she did not utter, but was attributed to her by the surrounding gossips. Too often there is an evil propensity in the human heart, which finds amusement in the formation of dissension where family interests clash. 
the close observer may see this tendency in active operation among gossiping circles even where the promoters of strife have not the least selfish end to gain by success in their endeavors if they would subject themselves to that rigid self-examination which moral justice requires they would find their satisfaction arose from a certain degree of malignant marvelousness which is gratified in watching the agitation of their victims in short they witness a species of improvisator tragedy of which they furnish the plot and machinery if according to the wise scripture proverb a little matter kindleth a great heap when the tale-bearers of private life are pursuing their self-appointed vocation let us consider what the case was in the royal family of england september fifteen thirty three when the matter was so portentous and the heap so enormous the situation of mary when called to court at such a crisis must have been trying in the extreme nor could the most sedulous caution have guided her through the difficulties which beset her path without incurring blame from one party or the other there is however whatever the court gossips might say the witness of her own letter that she never denied the name of sister to the new-born infant for when she was required to give up the title of princess and call elizabeth by no other appellation sister she said she would call the babe but nothing more her father threatened her his threats were useless and he proceeded to aggravate the case by declaring mary's new-born rival his heiress in default of male issue a dignity till then enjoyed by mary who had lately as such exercised authority in the principality of wales but neither threats nor deprivations had the least effect in bending the resolution of mary that her resistance did not spring from an exclusive devotion of her own interest her subsequent concession proved but her love for her injured mother was an absorbing feeling paramount to every other consideration and while catherine of aragon lived mary of england would have suffered martyrdom rather than make a concession against the interest and dignity of that adored parent before the end of september the privy council sent orders to mary who had then returned to beaulieu that she was immediately to lay aside the name and dignity of princess and moreover enjoined her to forbid her servants to address her as such and to withdraw directly to hatfield where the nursery of her infant sister was about to be established the king did not take any ostensible part in this message conduct however singular it may appear was perfectly consistent with the excessive love of approbation apparent in his character even when he was performing acts of the utmost enormity the important message whose effect was to deprive the eldest child of the english crown of her exalted situation was delivered by her chamberlain hussey it purported to be the king's commandment delivered to him by the privy council on the last sunday at greenwich when it is remembered that the princess was but seventeen at this crisis the tact and courage of her reply will excite some surprise she told hussey that she not a little marvelled at his undertaking in his single person unauthorized by commission of council signed by the king or by his majesty's private letters to her such matter of high emprise as minishing her from her state and dignity she not doubting withal that she was the king's true daughter born in good and lawful matrimony and unless she were advertised by letter from the king's own hand that his grace was so minded to diminish her state name and dignity which she trusted he would never do she should never believe the same hussey withdrew to indite a narrative of the scene to his employers of the privy council it is well worthy of remark that in this dispatch he invariably applied the titles of grace and princess to mary though addressing the very persons who had just employed him to deprive her of those distinctions in mary's letter to the privy council she sustained the high tone of a royal lady whose rights of succession were invaded illegally my lords as touching my removal to hatfield i will obey his grace as my duty is or to any other place his grace may appoint me but i protest before you and all others present that my conscience will in no wise suffer me to take any other than myself for princess or for the king's daughter born in lawful matrimony and that i will never wittingly or willingly say or do 
aught whereby any person might take occasion to think that I agree to the contrary. Nor say I this out of any ambition or proud mind, as God is my judge. If I should do otherwise, I should slander the deed of our mother, the Holy Church, and the Pope, who is the judge in this matter, and none other, and should also dishonor the king my father, the queen my mother, and falsely confess myself a bastard, which God defend I should do, since the Pope hath not so declared it by his sentence definitive, to whose final judgment I submit myself. Hussey's dispatch to the council produced a letter, purported to be the royal order, written by the comptroller of the king's household, requiring Mary to leave Beaulieu, and take up her abode at Hertford Castle. From a subsequent order in council, it appears that the king and his ministers were dubious, whether the princely establishment, formed for the infant Elizabeth, was to be fixed at Hatfield or Hertford Castle. Wherever it were to be, it is evident, that no home was to be allowed the fallen Mary, but the spot where she was to draw daily comparisons between her lost dignities and those profusely lavished on the daughter of the rival queen. In this exigence, Mary wrote thus to her father. The Lady Mary to the King in most humble wise i beseech your grace your daily blessing pleaseth the same to be advertised that this morning my chamberlain came and showed me that he had received a letter from sir william paulet comptroller of your household the effect whereof was that i should with all diligence remove to the castle of hertford whereupon i desire to see that letter which he showed me wherein was written that the Lady Mary, the king's daughter, should remove to the place aforesaid, leaving out in the same the name of princess, which, when I heard, I could not a little marvel, trusting, verily, that your grace was not privy to the same letter, as concerning the leaving out of the name of princess. Forasmuch as I doubt not that your grace doth take me, for your lawful daughter, born in true matrimony, Wherefore, if I were to say to the contrary, I should in my conscience run into the displeasure of God, which I hope assuredly that your grace would not that I should do. And in all other things, your grace shall have me always, as humble and obedient daughter and handmaid, as ever was child to the father, which my duty bindeth me to, as knoweth our Lord, who have your grace in his most holy tuition, with much honor and long life to his pleasure from your manor of Beaulieu, October 2nd, by your most humble daughter, Mary, Princess. The king took decided measures to dissolve the household of his daughter at Beaulieu, by sending the Duke of Norfolk, assisted by Lord Marnley, the Earl of Oxford, and his almoner, Bishop Fox, to deal with her, while the Duke of Suffolk and others of the council were breaking up her mother's establishment at Bugden. In the midst of these troubles, Mary's cousin German, James V, solicited her hand, but his suit was refused peremptorily, lest such marriage should interfere with the title of Anne Boleyn's issue. The degradation of the Princess Mary was rendered legal in the beginning of 1534, when the Houses of Parliament passed an act, settling the crown on the king's heir by Queen Anne, whether male or female. Mary's household at Beaulieu, a princely establishment, consisting of no less than 160 individuals, was finally dismissed and dispersed, and the unfortunate princess was severed from those to whose society she had been accustomed during her childhood. Above all, she was torn from her venerable relative, Margaret, Countess of Salisbury, in whose arms she had been encircled in the first days of her existence. This was a blow more bitter than the mere deprivation of rank or titles, Harder than all, when separated from this maternal friend, she was transferred to the nursery palace of Hunsdon, where the infant Elizabeth was established, with a magnificent household, befitting the rank of which Mary had just been deprived. In this residence Mary was located, more like a bondmaiden than the sister of the acknowledged heiress of the realm. Hunsdon had formerly belonged to the family of the Boleyns. It had been recently purchased or exchanged by the king. To this place, the former seat of her family, had Anne Boleyn sent her infant with royal pomp. Nor was she satisfied, unless the fallen princess drew hourly comparisons between her lot and that of the sister, who had supplanted her. 
a fearful thing was thus to tempt the heart of a fellow creature by aggravating grief into passionate anger through the infliction of gratuitous injury but the heart of mary was as yet unscathed by the corrosion of hatred every object of her strong affections was not then destroyed though they were removed and ample proof remains that instead of being aggravated into detesting or injuring her rival sister she amused her sorrows with the playful wiles of the infant and regarded her with kindness this result probably originated in the fact that queen anne boleyn choosing that as far as she could command the former attendants of mary should wait on elizabeth had appointed lady margaret bryan as her governess whatever others might do it is certain that excellent lady did all in her power to soothe the wounded mind of her former charge and promote her kindly feelings to her infant sister the insults heaped by anne boleyn at this crisis on the unfortunate mary weighed heavily on her conscience when she was making up her accounts with eternity what they were rests between god and herself for no specific detail of them exists perhaps the severe inquiry made the summer after mary's removal from beaulieu relative to her correspondence and communication with her friends was among these repented malfactions in a mutilated letter from fitzwilliam treasurer of the king's household to cromwell is an account of a search made in the coffers of mary at hunsdon which were sealed up various papers were seized put into a bag and sent to cromwell together with a purse of purple velvet containing some writings perhaps the very letter from her mother quoted above several persons were at the same time committed to the tower on the charge of holding private intercourse with the lady mary and styling her princess after the prohibition issued against it among these was lady hussey and her examination taken august third is still preserved various ensnaring interrogations were put to lady hussey as how often had she repaired to the lady mary since she had lost the name of princess whether she was sent for and on what occasion she went whether she knew that the lady mary was justly declared by law to be no princess and yet had so called her what moved her so to do whether she had received any tokens or messages from the lady mary and what persons at that time visited her at hunsdon the replies are short and unequivocal the language of one who felt she had done nothing wrong yet sensible of the danger incurred she stated she had visited the lady mary only once since the king had discharged her from beaulieu and that was when lord hussey came up to parliament and the last whitsuntide and the visit then was altogether accidental she owned she had inadvertently called the lady mary twice by the name of princess not from any wish to disobey the law but simply from her having been so long accustomed to it she confessed having received a trifling present from the lady mary among the persons who visited the disinherited princess at hunsdon she deposed was lord morley he was the literary friend whose testimony to mary's early attainments has been already quoted and who to the honour of literature did not forsake the unfortunate notwithstanding his daughter's intermarriage in the boleyn family lady morley mr shakerley and his wife and sir edward bainton were likewise among mary's visitors the poor princess says Helen, had at hunsdon no comfort but in her books she was assisted in her studies by dr voisey whom henry the eighth rewarded for the pains he took with the bishopric of exeter this passage leads to the supposition that dr featherstone who had been employed in mary's education since her infancy had been dismissed with the rest of the attached friends who composed her household at her regretted home of beaulieu the two melancholy years which mary spent at hunsdon under the surveillance of her stepmother were passed in sorrow and suffering the few friends who dared visit her were subjected to the severest espionage their words were malignantly scrutinized and sedulously reported to the privy council the papers of the princess were put under the royal seal and if she were allowed to read she certainly was not permitted to write since in one of her letters penned just after the execution of anne boleyn she apologizes for her evil writing because she had not written a letter for two years her father muttered murderous threats against her 
and his words were eagerly caught and re-echoed by those members of his council whose whole study it was to flatter his willful wishes however wicked they might be if the expressions of king henry had not been appalling to the last degree would the treasurer fitzwilliam have dared to use the revolting terms he did regarding his master's once idolized daughter if she will not be obedient to his grace i would quoth he that her head was from her shoulders that i might toss it here with my foot and so put his foot forward spurning the rushes a graphic exemplification added by two witnesses of his horrible speech which it seems was not resented but received as a dutiful compliment by the father of the young female whose head was thus kicked as a football in the lively imagination of the obedient satellite dark indeed were the anticipations throughout europe regarding the future destiny not only of the unfortunate daughter but of the queen her mother during the year fifteen thirty five the king's envoys wrote home that all men viewed them as englishmen with either pity or horror mason who was resident in spain declared that the people expected to hear every day of the execution of queen catherine and that the princess mary was expected soon to follow her these rumors were vaguely stated in general history only one author and he a foreigner attempts to relate the particular circumstances which instigated henry the eighth to meditate the astounding crime of filiocide gregorio letty affirms that some fortune-teller had predicted the accession of the princess mary to the crown after the death of her father this report being circulated at court was quickly brought to queen anne boleyn and threw her into great agitation she flew to the king and with tears and sobs told him how much afflicted she was at the thought that their child should be excluded from the throne for the sake of mary who was the offspring of a marriage so solemnly pronounced illegal henry who was completely bewitched by her embraced her with all the tenderness possible and to assuage her tears promised not only to disinherit mary but even to kill her rather than such a result should happen fox and every succeeding historian declared that cranmer prevented the king from immolating his daughter if so this must have been the crisis to the princess the matter of her life or death was perhaps of little moment for grief had laid her on a bed of dolorous sickness her mother was on her deathbed desiring with a yearning heart but with words of saintly meekness to be permitted if not to see her merely to breathe the same air with her afflicted daughter she promises solemnly that if mary may be resident near her she will not attempt to see her if forbidden she adds that such measure was impossible since she lacked provisions therefore meaning she had neither horse nor carriage to go out yet she begs the king may be always told that the thing she most desires is the company of her daughter for a little comfort and mirth she would take with me should undoubtedly be half health unto her doleful would have been the mirth and heart-rending the comfort had such interview been permitted between the sick daughter and the dying mother but it was no item in the list of henry's tender mercies the emperor charles v remonstrated sternly on the treatment of his aunt and young kinswoman and the whole ingenuity of the privy council was exerted to hammer out a justification of the ugly case a copy of the dispatch sent to mason much altered and interlined remains in cromwell's hand touching the brute of the misentreaty of the queen and princess such report and brute is untrue then after setting forth king henry's munificence to the mother he by no means boasts of his generosity to the princess but adds our daughter the lady mary we do order and entertain as we think expedient for we think it not meet that any person should prescribe unto us how we should order our own daughter we being her natural father in another dispatch the rumor at the imperial court is indignantly denied that it was the king's intention to marry mary to some person of base blood the death of mary's tender and devoted mother opened the year fifteen thirty six with a dismal aggravation of her bitter lot the sad satisfaction of a last adieu between the dying queen and her only child was cruelly forbidden 
Mary was informed of the tidings of her mother's expected dissolution, and with agonizing tears and plaints, implored permission to receive her last blessing. Yet in vain, for Catherine of Aragon expired without seeing her daughter. Again the continent rung with reprobation of such proceedings. The English resident at Venice wrote to Thomas Starkley, a learned divine at Henry's court, February 5th, 1536, that Queen Catherine's death had been divulged there, and was received with lamentations, for she was incredibly dear to all men for her good fame, which is in great glory among all exterior nations. He concludes in Latin, Great obloquy has her death occasioned, all dread lest the royal girl should briefly follow her mother. I assure you, men speaketh here tragice of these matters, which are not to be touched by letters. Happy would it have been for Mary, happy for her country, if her troublous pilgrimage had closed, even thus tragically, before she had been made the ostensible instrument of wrong and cruelty unutterable to conscientious Protestants. End of section 11. Section 12 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 5, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary, Chapter 2, Part 1. At the very time when all Europe anticipated the destruction of the Princess Mary, a change took place in the current of events that influenced her fortunes. Her stepmother, Queen Anne Boleyn, lost the male heir, who was expected wholly to deprive Mary of all claims to primogeniture, even in the eyes of her most affectionate partisans. Scarcely had Queen Anne uttered the well-known exclamation of triumph on the death of Catherine of Aragon, before indications were perceptible that she had herself lost Henry's capricious favor. Her fall and condemnation followed with rapidity. The day before her tragic death, Anne Boleyn, after placing Lady Kingston in the royal seat as the representative of Mary, fell on her knees before her, and implored her to go to Hunsdon, and in the same attitude to ask, in her name, pardon of the princess, for all the wrongs she had heaped upon her, while in the possession of a stepdame's authority. Lady Kingston certainly went to Hunsdon on this errand, for there is evidence of her presence there, a few days after the execution of Queen Anne, although the unfortunate Anne Boleyn, in her passionate penitence, took upon herself the blame of the ill-treatment her stepdaughter had experienced, yet it is an evident truth, that she was not the sole instrument in the persecution, since, two months after she had lost all power, the cruel system of restraint and deprivation continued to afflict Mary at Hunsdon, but this was artfully relaxed, directly Anne Boleyn was put to death, in order that the princess might lay the whole blame of her sufferings on the unhappy queen, all which was probably the effect of Cromwell's scheming. As the sister of Jane Seymour was the wife of his son, his plan of family ambition was plainly to depress the daughters of the two former queens, in order to favor the chances of Jane Seymour's children, female or male, wearing the crown of England, and being at the same time cousins German to his grandson. This recollection should be always kept in mind, while his conduct to Anne Boleyn at the time of her degradation and death is considered. The letters of Kingston, showing the close espionage Cromwell kept upon her, and the eager manner in which he pursued her divorce, are corroborating circumstances of his inimical feelings towards her. On the other hand, he was the active agent in forcing the Princess Mary to acquiesce in her own illegitimation. His game was a fine one, and very skillfully he played it, working at the same time on the broken spirits of the desolate young girl and the despotic temper of her father, and making both the tools of his ambitious finesse. Meantime, some kind of friendly acquaintance had previously subsisted between the Princess Mary and the new queen, Jane Seymour, but when this commenced is one of the obscure passages in the lives of both which no ray has yet illuminated. Be that as it may, Mary was encouraged to commence the following correspondence, in the hopes that her new mother-in-law 
was favorably disposed to her reconciliation with her father. The event proved that notwithstanding all fair seeming, there was no restoration of Henry's good graces, but by her utter abandonment of her place in the succession, a result which Mary had, even while Anne Boleyn held the ascendant, hitherto successfully avoided. The first letter of this series was addressed to Cromwell, evidently at the very time when Lady Kingston had arrived at Hunsdon, to deliver the dying confession of the unfortunate Anne Boleyn. Mary, according to her own words at the conclusion, took advantage of Lady Kingston's visit to obtain writing materials, of which she had been long deprived. The letter is dated only one week after the execution of Anne Boleyn. Lady Mary to Cromwell. Master Secretary, I would have been a suitor to you before this time, to have been a means for me to the king's grace, my father, to have obtained his grace's blessing and favor. But I perceive that nobody durst speak for me, as long as that woman lived, which is now gone, whom I pray God of his great mercy to forgive. Wherefore, now she is gone, I am bolder to write to you, as one which taketh you for one of my chief friends. And therefore I desire you for the love of God, to be a suitor to me of the king's grace, to have his blessing and license, or leave, to write unto his grace, which shall be a great comfort to me, as God knoweth, who have you evermore in his holy keeping. Moreover, I must desire you to accept mine evil writing, for I have not done so much for this two years, or more, nor could have had the means to do it at this time, but my Lady Kingston's being here. At Hunsdon, 26th of May, by your loving friend, Mary. An intimation followed this epistle, that the king permitted his daughter to write to him, and she accordingly penned a letter, chiefly compounded of supplicating sentences. It must be remembered, that it had become etiquette to offer slavish homage of this kind to royalty, since the days of Henry V. The only fact contained in this letter is comprised in these words. Having received, this Thursday night, certain letters from Mr. Secretary Cromwell, advising me to make my humble submission immediately to yourself, which I durst not do without your gracious license or leave before, and that I should not have soons offend your majesty by denial or refusal of such articles or commandments as it might please your highness to address to me, for the perfect trial of mine heart and inward affections. No notice was vouchsafed to this letter by Henry, and Mary soon after wrote a second, in which she ventured to congratulate him and Jane Seymour on their marriage. Lady Mary to the King in as humble and lowly a manner as is possible for a child to use to her father and sovereign lord, I beseech your grace of your daily blessing, which is my chief desire in this world, and in the same humble wise, acknowledging all the offences that I have done to your grace, since I had first discretion unto offend unto this hour, I pray your grace for the honour of God, and for your fatherly pity, to forgive me them for the which I am as sorry as any creature living, and next unto God, I do and will submit me in all things to your goodness and pleasure, to do with me whatsoever shall please your grace. Humbly beseeching your highness to consider that I am but a woman, and your child, who hath committed her soul only to God, and her body to be ordered in this world, as it shall stand with your pleasure, whose order and direction, whatsoever it shall please your highness to limit and direct unto me, I shall most humbly and willingly stand, content to follow, obey, and accomplish, in all points. And so, in the lowest manner that I can, I beseech your grace to accept me, your humble daughter, which, or who, doth not a little rejoice to hear the comfortable tidings, not only to me, but to all your grace's realm, concerning the marriage which is between your grace and the queen, Jane Seymour, now being your grace's wife and my mother-in-law. The hearing thereof caused nature to constrain me, to be a humble suitor to your grace, to be so good and gracious lord and father to me, as to give me leave to wait upon the queen, and to do her grace such service as shall please her to command me, which my heart shall be as ready and obedient to fulfil, next unto your grace, as the most humble servant that she hath. 
trusting to your grace's mercy to come into your presence whichever hath and shall be the greatest comfort that i can have within this world having also a full hope in your grace's natural pity which you have always used as much or more than any prince christened that your grace shall show the same unto me your most humble and obedient daughter which daily prayeth to god to have your grace in his holy keeping with long life and as much honour as ever had a king and to send your grace shortly a prince whereof no creature living shall more rejoice or heartlier pray for continually than i as my duty bindeth me from hunsdon the first day of june fifteen thirty six by your grace's most humble and obedient daughter and handmaid mary this letter was written on occasion of jane seymour's public appearance as queen may twenty ninth it was accompanied with another to cromwell dated the thirtieth of may thanking him for having obtained leave of writing to her father and praying him to continue his good offices till it may please his grace to permit her approach to his presence at the time his cromwell's discretion may deem suitable but this favour was not granted till after a compliance was extorted from the princess to sign the cruel articles which stigmatized her own birth and her mother's marriage with as many opprobrious terms as henry and his satellites chose to dictate one week afterwards mary wrote another short letter from which may be gathered that her sire had declared that he forgave her all her offences these were truly the injuries with which he had loaded her but he had not yet either written to her or admitted her into his presence favor she humbly sued for in her letter written two days afterwards as follows lady mary to king henry the eighth in as humble and lowly a manner as is possible for me i beseech your most gracious highness of your daily blessing and albeit i have already as i trust in god upon mine humble suit and submission requiring mercy and forgiveness for mine offences to your majesty obtain the same with license to write unto you whereby i have also conceived great hope and confidence that your grace of your inestimable goodness will likewise forgive me my said offences and withdraw your displeasure conceived upon the same yet shall my joy never return perfectly to me nay my hope be satisfied until such time as it may please your grace sensibly to express your gracious forgiveness to me or such towardness thereof and of the reconciliation of your favour by your most gracious letters or some token or message as i may conceive a perfect trust that i shall not only receive my most hearty and fervent desire therein but for a confirmation thereof penetrate an access to your presence which shall of all worldly things be to me most joyous and comfortable for in the same i shall have the fruition of your most noble presence most heartily as my duty requireth desired i do most heartily beseech your grace to pardon me though i presume thus to molest your gracious ears with my suits and rude writing for nature hath had its operation in the same eftsoons therefore most humbly prostrate before your noble feet your most obedient subject and humble child that hath not only repented her offences hitherto but also desired simply from henceforth and wholly next to almighty god to put my state continuance and living in your gracious mercy and likewise to accept the condition thereof at your disposition and appointment whatsoever it shall be desiring your majesty to have pity on me in the granting of mine humble suits and desires who shall continually pray to almighty god as i am most bounden to preserve your grace with the queen and shortly to send you a prince which shall be gladder tidings to me than i can express in writing from hunsdon the tenth of june your majesty's most humble and obedient servant daughter and handmaid mary neither letter had elicited an answer from the king the last was enclosed in a letter from cromwell which contains this remarkable sentence that she took him for her chief friend next to god and the queen so few days had elapsed since jane seymour had become queen that this expression assuredly implies that some friendly communication must have passed between the princess mary and her previously to the death of anne boleyn 
Cromwell continued to urge more unconditional submission, and even sent her a copy of the sort of letter that was to be efficacious with the king. The poor princess, ill in body and harassed in mind, wrote thus to Cromwell three days afterwards. Nevertheless, because you have exhorted me to write to his grace again, and I cannot devise what I should write more, but your own last copy, without adding or minishing, Therefore do I send you by my servant the same word for word, and it is unsealed, because I cannot endure to write another copy, for the pain in my head and my teeth hath troubled me so sore this two or three days, and doth yet so continue, that I have very small rest, day or night. Mary was at this time in deep mourning for her beloved mother. The imperial ambassador visited her during the month of June, 1536, and expressed surprise at the heaviness or mournfulness of her apparel. His errand was to advise her to obey her father unconditionally. She thanked him for his good counsel, and told him she had written to her father. Here a provoking hiatus occurs in the manuscript. Eustachio, who had attended her mother's deathbed, probably delivered some message from the dying queen, relative to the expediency of Mary's submission, but she still had a struggle before she could bring herself to compliance. The ambassador, to whom she had probably forwarded letters in Latin or Spanish, expressed his surprise at her deep learning, and asked her if she was unaided in the composition, which the princess assured him was the case. The visit of the Spanish ambassador was followed by one, from the brother of the new Queen Jane, Edward Seymour, lately created Lord Beauchamp, and appointed Lord Chamberlain for life. He required her to send in a list of the clothing she needed, and added the welcome present of a riding horse, which benefits Mary thus acknowledged. Lady Mary to my lord. My lord, in my heartiest manner, I commend me unto you, as she which, or who, cannot express in writing the great joy and comfort that I have received by your letters, as by the report of my servant, this bearer, concerning the king my sovereign father's goodness toward me, which I doubt not but I have obtained much the better by your continual suit and means. Wherefore, I think myself bound to pray for you during my life, and that I will both do, and will continue, with the grace of God. Sir, as touching mine apparel, I have made no bill, or list. For the king's highness's favor is so good clothing unto me, that I can desire no more, and so I have written to his grace, resting wholly in him, and willing to wear whatsoever his grace shall appoint me. My lord, I do thank you with all my heart, for the horse that you sent me with this bearer, wherein you have done me a great pleasure, for I had never a one to ride upon, sometimes for my health, and besides that, my servant showeth me that he is such a one, that I may, of good right, accept, not only the mind of the giver, but also the gift. And thus I commit you to God, to whom I do and shall daily pray to be with you, in all your business, and to reward you for so exceeding great pains and labors, that you take in my suits. From Hunsdon, the first day of July, your assured loving friend during my life, Mary. Notwithstanding these signs of restoration to his paternal favor, the king had not condescended to notice the letters of the princess, till July 8th, when she either copied or composed the following epistle. Lady Mary to the King my bounden duty most humbly remembered, with like desire of your daily blessing, and semblable thanks upon my knees to your majesty, both for your great mercy lately extended unto me, and for the certain arguments of a perfect reconciliation, which of your most abundant goodness I have since perceived. Whereas, upon mine inward and hearty suit and desire, that it would please your highness to grant me license some time, to send my servant to know your grace's health and prosperity, which I beseech our Lord long to preserve, being the thing that is in this world my only comfort. To my great joy and satisfaction I obtain the same. I have now, to use the benefit of that especial grace, sent this bearer, mine old servant Randall Dodd, in lieu of a token, to present unto your majesty these my rude letters, 
written with the hand of her whom your highness shall ever find true faithful and obedient to you and yours as far as your majesty and your laws have and shall limit me without alteration until the hour of my death and so to bring me again relation of your prosperous estate most humbly beseeching your highness in case i be over hasty in sending so soon to pardon me and to think that i would a thousandfold more gladly be there in the room of a poor chamberer to have the fruition of your presence than in the course of nature planted in this your most noble realm if this sentence has any meaning it is that mary would rather be a domestic servant near her father during his life than heiress to his realm after his death she concludes and thus i beseech our lord to preserve your grace and health with my very natural mother the queen jane and to send you shortly issue which i shall as gladly and willingly serve with my hands under their feet as ever did poor subject their most gracious sovereign from hunsdon the eighth of july fifteen thirty six your grace's most humble and obedient daughter and bond maiden mary henry the eighth knew that his daughter mary was regarded in secret with deep affection by a great majority of his subjects who acknowledged in their hearts notwithstanding all acts of parliament that she was in her present position heiress to the crown and he remained in a furious state of irritation till he had obtained an acknowledgment under her own hand of her illegitimacy since the death of anne boleyn an act of parliament had passed which not only illegitimated the infant elizabeth equally with mary but changed the constitution of the succession to more than eastern despotism by enabling the king in default of heirs by jane seymour to leave his dominions like personal property money plate or furniture to whomsoever he chose to bequeath them it has been surmised that the king by placing his daughters on the same footing with his natural son henry duke of richmond meant to use this privilege in his behalf fortunately for himself and the kingdom this youth was removed by sudden death within a little time after passing this iniquitous act mary promised unconditional submission to all the king required consisting with what she considered the laws of god and the king sent down a deputation of his privy council to apply the cruel test of her obedience the principal articles of which were to acknowledge her mother's marriage incestuous and illegal her own birth illegitimate and his own supremacy over the church absolute it will scarcely excite wonder that mary demurred at signing these bitter requisitions she did not think them consistent with her principles and the council departed without their errand although at the head of them the king observed he had as a favor to her sent his daughter's cousin the duke of norfolk as soon as they departed mary wrote to cromwell a letter expressive of uneasiness of mind which drew from him the following insolent reply madam i have received your letter whereby it appeareth you be in great discomfort and do desire that i should find the means to speak with you how great soever your discomfort is it can be no greater than mine who hath upon the receipt of your letters spoken so much of your repentance for your wilful obstinacy against the king's highness and of your humble submission in all things without exception or qualification to obey his pleasure and laws and knowing how diversely or differently and contrarily you proceeded at the late being of his majesty's counsel with you i am as much ashamed of what i have said as afraid of what i have done insomuch as what the sequel thereof shall be god knoweth thus with your folly you undo yourself and all who have wished you good and i will say unto you as i have said elsewhere that it were a great pity ye be not made an example in punishment if ye will make yourself an example of contempt of god your natural father and his laws by your own only fantasy contrary to the judgments and determination of all men that ye must confess to know and love god as much as you do except ye will show yourself altogether presumptuous wherefore madam to be plain with you as god is my witness i think you the most obstinate and obdurate woman all things considered that ever was and one that is so perversely deserveth the extremity of mischief 
I dare not open my lips to name you, unless I have some ground, that it may appear you were mistaken, meaning evidently misunderstood, or at least repentant for your ingratitude and miserable unkindness, and ready to do all things that ye be bound unto, by your duty and allegiance, if nature were excluded from you, in degree with every other common subject. And therefore, I have sent you a certain book of articles, whereunto if you will set your hand and subscribe your name, you shall undoubtedly please God, the same being conformable to his truth, as you must conceive in your heart, if you do not dissemble. Upon the receipt whereof, again from you, with a letter declaring that you think in heart what you have subscribed with hand, I shall, as soons, venture to speak for your reconciliation. But if you will not with speed, leave off all your sinister counsels, which have brought you to the point of utter undoing, without remedy, I take my leave of you for ever, and desire that you will never write or make means to me hereafter. For I shall never think otherwise of you than as the most ungrateful person to your dear and benign father. I advise you to nothing, but I beseech God never to help me, if I know it not to be your bounden duty, by God's laws and man's laws, that I must needs judge that person, who shall refuse it not meet to live in a Christian congregation. To the witness thereof, I take Christ, whose mercy I refuse, if I write anything but what I have professed in my heart, and know to be true. The overbearing style of this epistle effected the end for which Cromwell had labored so long, and terrified Mary into signing the articles she had previously rejected. The young princess had been universally accused of meanness, because she yielded to these threats and reproaches, and signed the articles mentioned in this letter. But those who blame her can scarcely have dispassionately examined the whole circumstances of the case. While her mother lived, she was utterly inflexible. Neither bribes nor the deadliest menaces could shake her firmness, into the slightest acknowledgment which compromised that beloved mother's honor. As to her own individual interest, it either remained the same as in her mother's lifetime, or approximated nearer to the crown, since the degradation of her sister Elizabeth, and the death of Anne Boleyn's son. Therefore it is vain to attribute her renunciation of her rights to any cause, excepting a yearning desire to be once more enfolded in a parental embrace. She was gone, whose noble mind would have been pained by her daughter's voluntary degradation and Mary had no one left but herself, who could be injured by her compliance. Henry had been used to caress his daughter fondly when domesticated with her. There is no testimony that he ever used personally an angry word to her. She loved him tenderly, and, with natural self-deception, attributed all the evil wrought against her mother and herself to the machinations of Anne Boleyn. She thought, if she were restored to the society of the king, instead of lingering her life away in the nursery prison at Hunsdon, she should regain her former interest in his heart, and she signed the prescribed articles, which are as follows. Lady Mary's Submission The confession of me, the Lady Mary, made upon certain points and articles underwritten, in the which, as I do now plainly and with all mine heart, confess and declare mine inward sentence, belief and judgment, with a due conformity of obedience to the laws of the realm, so minding for ever to persist and continue in this determination, without change, alteration, or variance. I do most humbly beseech the King's Highness, my father, whom I have obstinately and unobediently offended in the denial of the same heretofore, to forgive mine offences therein, and to take me to his most gracious mercy. First, I confess and acknowledge the King's Majesty to be my Sovereign Lord and King, in the imperial crown of this realm of England, and to submit myself to His Highness, and to all and singular laws and statutes of this realm, as becometh a true and faithful subject to do, which I shall obey, keep, observe, advance, and maintain, according to my bounden duty, with all the power, force, and qualities, that God hath endued me during my life. Signed, Mary. Item, I do recognize, accept, take, repute, and knowledge the King's Highness, to be supreme head in earth, 
under Christ, of the Church of England, and do utterly refuse the Bishop of Rome's pretended authority, power, and jurisdiction, within this realm heretofore usurped, according to the laws and statutes made in that behalf, and of all the king's true subjects humbly received, admitted, obeyed, kept, and observed, and also do utterly renounce, and forsake all manner of remedy, interest, and advantage, which I may by any means claim by the bishop of Rome's laws, process, jurisdiction, or sentence, at this present time, or in any wise hereafter, by any manner, title, color, mean, or case, that is, shall or can be devised for that purpose. Signed, Mary. Item, I do freely, frankly, and for the discharge of my duty towards God, the King's Highness and his laws, without other respect, recognize and acknowledge that the marriage heretofore had between his majesty and my mother, the late Princess Dowager, was by God's law and man's law, incestuous and unlawful. Signed, Mary. Rodesley was the person who brought the rejected articles for Mary's reconsideration. He had authority to promise, in case of compliance, that her household should be re-established, with every consideration, to her respectability and comfort. This privy counsellor, likewise, brought express orders that Mary should no longer call Elizabeth princess, but sister, an injunction which Mary in her next letter alluded to with something like archness, but at the same time with sisterly kindness to the motherless infant. Surely there is something of touching simplicity in the sentence where she says, And, now you think it meet, I shall never call her by any other name but sister. Good Mr. Secretary, how much I am bound to you, which have not only travailed, when I was most drowned in folly, to recover me before I sunk, and was utterly past recovery, and so to present me to the face of grace and mercy, but desireth not since, with your good and wholesome counsels, so to arm me from any relapse, that I cannot, unless I were too willful and obstinate, whereof there is now no spark in me, fall again into any danger. But leaving the recital of your goodness apart, which I cannot recount, I answer the particulars of your credence sent by my friend, Mr. Rodesley. First, concerning the princess, Elizabeth, so I think I must call her yet, for I would be loath to offend. I offered, at her entry to that name and honor, to call her sister, but it was refused, unless I would add the other title unto it, which I denied then, not more obstinately than I am sorry for it now, for that I did therein offend my most gracious father and his just laws. And now you think it meet, I shall never call her by any other name than sister. Touching the nomination of such women as I would have about me, surely, Mr. Secretary, what men or women soever the King's Highness shall appoint to wait upon me, without exception, shall be to me right heartily welcome. Albeit to express my mind to you, whom I think worthy to be accepted for your faithful service done to the King's Majesty and to me, since they have come into my company, I promise you, on my faith, Margaret Bainton and Susanna Clare Sue, have, in every condition, used themselves as faithfully, painfully, and diligently, as ever did women in such a case, as sorry when I was not so conformable as became me, and as glad, when I inclined to duty, as could be devised. One other there is that was some time my maid, whom for her virtue I love, and could be glad to have in my company, and that is Mary Brown, and here be all that I will recommend, and my estimation of this shall be measured at the King's Highness, my most merciful father's pleasure and appointment, as reason is. For mine opinion, touching pilgrimages, purgatory, relics, and such like, I assure you I have none at all, but such as I shall receive from him who hath mine whole heart in his keeping, that is, the King's most gracious Highness, my most benign father, who shall imprint in the same, touching these matters and all other, with his inestimable virtue, high wisdom, and excellent learning, shall think convenient and limit unto me, to whose presence, I pray God, I may come once ere I die, for every day is a year till I have a fruition of it. Beseeching you, good Mr. Secretary, to continue mine humble suit, 
for the same, and for all other things whatsoever they be, to repute my heart so firmly knit to his pleasure, that I can by no means vary from the direction and appointment of the same. And thus most heartily fare you well. From Hunsdon, this Friday, at ten o'clock of the night, your assured loving friend, Mary. The continued discussions as to the right of the daughters of Henry the Eighth to the title of princess, led to the conviction that at this era that title was only bestowed on the heiress presumptive of the crown of England, or at the very utmost, to the eldest daughter of the sovereign, though it is doubtful whether she ever possessed it during existence of brothers. Elizabeth of York was called My Lady Princess before the birth of her brothers, and perhaps retained the title after they were born, but her sisters were only called Lady Sicily, Lady Anne, etc., instead of the Princess Sicily, etc., as they would have been in modern times. It seems doubtful if any of the daughters of Henry the Third, Edward the First, Edward the Third, or Henry the Fourth, were ever termed princess by their contemporaries. But the rank of all the daughters of the English crown was designated by the elegant address of grace, which was likewise the epithet used in speaking to and of the king and queen. At the same time that Mary wrote the letter to Cromwell just quoted, she addressed the following one to her father. Lady Mary to the King. My bounden duty most humbly remember to your most excellent majesty, whereas I am unable and insufficient to render and express to your highness those most hearty and humble thanks for your gracious mercy and fatherly pity, surmounting mine offences at this time, extended towards me. I shall lie prostrate at your noble feet humbly, and with the very bottom of my heart beseech your grace to repute that in me, which in my poor heart, remaining in your most noble hand, I have conceived and professed towards your grace, whilst the breath shall remain in my body. That is, that as I am in such merciful sort recovered, being almost lost in mine own folly, that your majesty may as well accept me, justly your bounden slave by redemption, as your most humble and obedient child and subject. My sister Elizabeth is in good health, thanks to our Lord, and such a child toward, as I doubt not, but your highness shall have cause to rejoice in time coming, as knoweth Almighty God, who send your grace, with the queen my good mother, health, with the accomplishment of your desires, from Hunsdon, the twenty-first day of July, your highness's most humble daughter and faithful subject, Mary. This letter, dated the twenty-first of July, 1536, may be considered as the concluding one of the curious historical series, connected with Mary's forced renunciation of her birthright. The opening phrases are couched in the species of formula, prescribed to Mary from the commencement of the correspondence, in which the most servile terms of verbal protestations are studied, as offerings at the throne of the despot. But the letter ends in a manner, that will startle many a preconceived idea of the disposition of Mary in the minds of the readers, who are willing to be guided by facts, not invective. Noble, indeed, it was of Mary thus to answer the agonized cry for forgiveness from the dying Anne Boleyn, by venturing a word in season in behalf of her forlorn little one. Even this generous trait has been inveighed against, as an act of mean flattery to the parental pride of Henry, and, had it happened during the prosperity of Elizabeth, so it might have been considered. But, mark how a plain matter of chronology places a good deed in its true light. So far from feeling any pride as the father of Elizabeth, Henry had just disowned her as a princess of his line, and horrid doubts had been murmured, that she was the child of Lord Rockford, and not even to be ranked as the king's illegitimate daughter. Who can, then, deny that it was a bold step of sisterly affection, on the part of Mary, to mention the early promise of the little Elizabeth, as she does in this letter, in terms calculated to awaken paternal interest in the bosom of her father? End of section 12section thirteen of lives of the queens of england volume five by agnes and elizabeth strickland 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary, Chapter 2, Part 2 Nothing now prevented the settlement of Mary's household. It was effected on a scale of the lowest parsimony, when compared to the extravagant outlay of her annual expenditure as an infant, and when she kept her court at Ludlow Castle. Yet she expressed herself cheerfully and gratefully to Rodesley, in the following letter, in which she informed him that he was the fourth man to whom she had ever written. It will be observed, she mentions with great interest a faithful servant of her mother. Mr. Rodesley, I have received your letters by this bearer, which compel me to do that thing that I never did to any man except the King's Highness, my Lord Privy Seal, and once to my Lord Basham, or Beauchamp, Edward Seymour. That is to say, write to you, to give you thanks for your great goodness and gentleness besides all other times, now showed to me, as well as sending this messenger for my quietness, as in entertaining my servant, Randall Dodd. Furthermore, there is another, who, as I hear say, also much beholding to you, that is Anthony Roke, for although he be not my servant, he was my mother's, and is an honest man, as I think. I do love him well, and would do him good. Sir, besides all these things, I think myself much beholden to you, for remembering my cook, whom, I think plainly, I have obtained much sooner by your good means. For as I take you to be my second suitor, as God knoweth, who help you in all your business. From Hunsdon, this Thursday at nine of the clock, in the morning, your friend to my power during my life, Mary. Mary, at the conclusion of these painful trials, settled in some degree of peace and comfort, holding a joint household with her little sister at Hunston. The persons nominated to attend her at this time continued in her service the principal part of her life. These were four gentlewomen, four gentlemen, two chamberers, a physician, a chaplain, five yeomen, four grooms of the chamber, one footman, four grooms of the stable, a laundress, and a wood hewer. Her mother, Queen Catherine, had, at the hour of her death, but three maids, as appears by her last letter to her husband. Two of these were anxious to enter Mary's service. One of them, Elizabeth Harvey, applied to the council for permission, but was refused by the king. The other, Elizabeth Darrell, to whom Queen Catherine had left three hundred marks, had said she saw no hope of Lady Mary yielding to the king's requisitions, and therefore petitioned for a situation in the service of Queen Jane Seymour. In the midst of all her degradations, Mary was regarded with the utmost sympathy by her country. Poets offered her their homage, and celebrated the beauty of her person, at a time when no possible benefit could accrue to any one by flattering her. John Haywood, one of the earliest dramatists of England, wrote the following stanzas in her praise, which occur in a poem of considerable length, entitled, A Description of a Most Noble Lady, Ad Viewed by John Haywood. Give place, ye ladies, all be gone, give place in bower and hall, for why? Behold, here cometh one, who doth surpass ye all. The virtue of her looks excels the precious stone, ye need none other books to read or look upon. If the world were sought full far, who could find such a white? Her beauty shineth like a star within the frosty night. Her color comes and goes, with such a goodly grace, more ruddy than the rose within her lovely face. Nature hath lost the mold, whence she her form did take, or else I doubt that nature could so fair a creature make. In life as Diane chaste, in truth Penelope, in word and deed steadfast, what need I more to say? Mary was her own mistress, and had the command of her own time, after the establishment of her household, though doubtless she looked up to the excellent Lady Margaret Bryan as her guide and protectress, who continued in the office of governess to her little sister, Elizabeth, with whom Mary kept house jointly for three years to a certainty. The manner in which Mary passed her time there, and her course of daily studies, nearly coincided with the rules laid down for her by Vives, her mother's learned friend. She commenced the day with the perusal of the scriptures. She then spent some hours in the study of languages, 
and devoted a third portion to the acquirement of knowledge of an extraordinary kind, considering her sex and station. Crispin, Lord of Mehervé, who was resident in England in the year 1536, and was author of a chronicle of current events in French verse, has declared therein that the Princess Mary studied astronomy, geography, natural philosophy, and the mathematics, and read the orators, the historians, and the poets of Greece and Rome in their native languages. She used to read over with her chaplain the daily service, she finished the day by working with her needle and playing on the lute, the virginals, or the regals, three instruments on which she excelled. Latin she wrote and spoke with ease. It was the medium of communication with all the learned of that day, not only on scientific subjects, but as a universal language in which the ecclesiastics and the leading characters of all nations were able to confer. She likewise spoke and wrote in French and Spanish, she was well acquainted with Italian, but did not venture to converse in it. In music she particularly excelled, for the rapidity of her touch on the manichord and lute. Mr. Paston was paid as her teacher on the virginals, and Philip Van Wilder, of the King's Privy Chamber, as her instructor on the lute. The expense of such instruction appears to have been as high as forty shillings per month. In the autumn of 1536, notwithstanding the disinheriting statutes lately passed, overtures were renewed for the marriage of Mary with Henry, Duke of Orleans, hence being perpetually thrown out by her father, of the possibility of her restoration to her place in the succession. Mary had, perhaps, a preoccupied heart, for one of the letters of Beccatelli to his friend, Reginald Pole, December 1536, speaks of the reports current from England, that it was the general opinion that the Princess Mary would one day marry him, because of the love she had borne him from her infancy. Lord Morley dedicated one of his translations from Erasmus to her, and, speaking of the change which had recently taken place in her station, he exclaims, O oh, noble and virtuous king's daughter, how is it that those of our time be so blinded, I can think no other, but that the end of the world hasten apace. He calls her the second Mary of this world for virtue, grace, and goodness, and beseeches her to help correct his work, where he has by any means erred in the translation. Notwithstanding the concessions made by the princess, no trace can be found of her admission to her father's presence before the Christmas of 1537. From this time, the diary of her privy purse expenses commences, forming a species of journal of her life, in most instances to her credit, accepting items of high play at cards, and a general propensity to betting and gambling, which will excite surprise. In this examination of the private life of a princess, so exceedingly detested by her country, a vigilant scrutiny has been kept in quest of the evil traits, with which even the private character of the unfortunate Mary has been branded. The search has been in vain. These records speak only of charity, affection to her little sister, kindness to her dependents, feminine accomplishments, delicate health, generosity to her godchildren, many of whom were orphans dependent on her alms, fondness for birds. Very little hunting or hawking is mentioned, and no bear baiting. Her time seems, indeed, to have passed most blamelessly, if the gaming propensities above mentioned may be considered rather faults of the court when she visited it, than faults of hers. It is certain Henry the Eighth was one of the most inveterate gamblers that ever wore a crown. No doubt the royal example was followed by his courtiers, for very high play at the Christmas festival must have taken place at the court of Queen Jane Seymour, if the losings of the Princess Mary are calculated according to the relative value of money. The visit of the Princess Mary at the Royal Palace of Richmond commenced December the ninth, 1536. How the longest strange father and daughter met, no pen has chronicled, but it is evident she regained, when once admitted to his presence, a large share of his former affections, tokens of which were shown by presents and New Year's gifts. The king presented her with a bordering, for a dress, of goldsmith's work, perhaps some rich ornament belonging to her mother. It was not new, for she paid to a goldsmith four pounds, three shillings, four pence, for lengthening the borders, adding in her own hand, 
that the king's grace had given it to her. Likewise she noted payment to the goldsmith, for coming to Greenwich to take her orders. The court moved from Richmond to Greenwich before Christmas Day. Mary lost at cards six angels, or two pounds five shillings, directly she arrived at Richmond. In six days, another supply of six angels was needed. Soon after, a third of twenty shillings, besides thirty shillings lent her by Lady Carew, when her pocket was again emptied at the cards. In the course of this week, the entry of a quarter wages of one of her footmen occurs of ten shillings, which offers a fair criterion to establish the extravagance of her card losings, by comparing the present value of a footman's wages, for a quarter of a year, with every ten shillings thus dissipated. As some atonement for this idle outlay, one pound three shillings was paid to the woman who keepeth Mary Price, my Lady Mary's goddaughter, and fifteen shillings in alms, and three shillings nine pence, to a poor woman of her grace living at Hatfield, and seven shillings six pence to John of Hatfield. Cromwell presented the princess with a New Year's gift, of some value, for a present given to his servant, who brought it amounted to three angels. He likewise sent her a gift of sweet waters and fumes, for which his servant was given a gratuity of seven shillings six pence. Among the other characters of historical interest, who sent their offerings to Mary, on her return to court, occur the names of Lady Rockford, then one of Queen Jane Seymour's bedchamber ladies, of her father, Lord Morley, Mary's old literary friend, of Lord Beauchamp, the Queen's brother, and his wife, likewise Lady Salisbury. To Queen Jane's maids, the princess presented each a ducat, amounting altogether to forty shillings. The Queen's page had forty-five shillings, for bringing the New Year's gift of his royal mistress. Besides other presents, she gave the princess fifty pounds. The princess made many minor gifts at the new year, to those to whom etiquette would not permit the offering of money. For instance, she bought of the Lady Mayoress of London six bonnets, for New Year's gifts, at one pound each, and likewise paid her ten shillings for two frontlets, a plain proof that the Lady Mayoress, in 1537, kept a haberdasher's or milliner's shop. The Lord Mayor that year was Sir Richard Gresham, a near relative of the Boleyns, a circumstance which makes this little mercantile transaction between the Princess Mary and her sister's industrious kinswoman a curious incident. Yet ample proof is afforded by the privy purse accounts that the Princess Mary, though formerly forbidden to do so by Rodesley and Cromwell, persisted in giving to her little sister Elizabeth the title of grace. This was, perhaps, owing to the adhesiveness of her disposition which could not endure to alter anything to which she had accustomed herself. To an item of one pound two shillings six pence, given to Mr. Bingham, the princess has added in her own hand, the explanation, chaplain to my lady Elizabeth's grace, thus disobeying, willfully and deliberately, the orders of counsel which degraded her young sister from royal rank. Afterwards, Wherever the name of Elizabeth occurs in her sister's account journal, she is always mentioned with this distinction. The Princess Mary paid five shillings for mending a clock given her by Lady Rockford, and twenty pence to Haywood's servant for bringing her regals, a sort of portable finger organ, from London to Greenwich. She had still further dealings with Lady Gresham, the Lady Mayoress, for divers and sundry things of her had. Forty-two shillings were paid in January. Among other incidental expenses, attempts were made to charge the princess with various pottles of sack, charges which she pertinaciously resisted, and the intrusive pottles were carefully scored out by her hand. The princess seems to have taken a progress after the festival of the new year, to visit her former mansion of Beaulieu, or Newhall in Essex, probably to take possession of this favorite residence. She, however, returned to the court at Greenwich, and remained there the rest of January and part of February. She paid in that month five shillings for making a window in her bedchamber there, and ten shillings for the hire of a room to keep her robes in. The end of February she removed to the Palace of Westminster, and the French gardener there presented her with apples. 
she gave generous donations to the poor prisoners in various prisons in london a favorite charity of hers and greatly needed for the horrors and deprivations in prisons of all kinds rendered benevolence thus bestowed a very good work and as such it was always considered from the first institution of christianity the situation in which mary was placed at court in these occasional visits was a very trying one she was a young woman whose person was much admired surrounded by parties hostile to her both on a religious and political account and she was wholly bereft of female protection her tender mother and her venerable relative lady salisbury had both been torn from her and who could supply their places in her esteem and veneration a perplexed and thorny path lay before her yet at a time of life when temptation most abounds she trod it free from the reproach of her most inveterate political adversaries the writings of her contemporaries abound with praises of her virtuous conduct she was says the italian history of polino distinguished when a young virgin for the purity of her life and her spotless manners when she came to her father's court she gave surprise to all those who composed it so completely was decorum out of fashion there as to the king he affected to disbelieve in the reality of female virtue and therefore laid a plot to prove his daughter this scheme he carried into effect but remained astonished at the strength and stability of her principles such an assertion it is very hard to credit it may be possible to find husbands willing to be as cruel as henry if they had the power but thanks be to god who has planted so holy and blessed a love as that of a father for his daughter in the heart of man it is not possible to find a parallel case in the annals of the present or the past and if a father could be believed capable of contriving a snare for the honor of his daughter it ought to be remembered that family honor is especially compromised by the misconduct of the females who belong to it and henry the eighth has never been represented as deficient in pride this singular assertion being nevertheless related by a contemporary it became the duty of a biographer to translate it the princess was resident at the palace of st james in the month of march and gave a reward to the king's watermen for rowing her from the court to lady beauchamp's house and back again she had recently stood godmother to one of that lady's children the fondness of the princess for standing godmother was excessive she was sponsor to fifteen children during the year fifteen thirty seven in all grades of life from the heir of england down to the children of the cottagers her godchildren were often brought to pay their duty and she frequently made them presents she stood godmother to a child of lord william howard and to a daughter of lord dudley who was afterwards the duke of northumberland put to death by her sentence her godchild was probably lady sydney the princess as before said was sponsor to one of edward seymour's numerous daughters three of whom were afterwards her maids of honor and the most learned ladies in the realm lady mary seymour the goddaughter of the princess in partnership with her sisters lady jane and lady catherine wrote a centenary of latin sonnets on the death of the accomplished queen of navarre sister to francis i whilst the princess mary abode at court the yeomen of the king's guard presented her with a leek on st david's day and were rewarded fifteen shillings in the succeeding summer she was afflicted with one of her chronic fits of illness and the king's physicians attended her in june and july she sent queen jane from beaulieu presents of quails and cucumbers there is an item in the accounts given in reward for cucumbers and the same given to the queen at divers times it appears mary practiced the good custom of importing curious plants from spain and these cucumbers were perhaps among the number mary had returned to her home at hunsdon in the month of september indications exist that her sister elizabeth was domesticated with her as notations occur in her expenses of presents to her sister's personal attendants mary stood sponsor to a poor infant the child of one welsh beside hunsdon on the seventh of october she gave a benefaction to this little one and bountiful alms to her poor pensioners apparently as farewell gifts the same day and came to hampton court to be present at the accouchement of her royal friend queen jane 
it is likely she brought her little sister with her since both were present at the christening of prince edward to whom the princess mary stood sponsor in manner already detailed she was dressed on this occasion in a kirtle of cloth of silver ornamented with pearls she gave to the queen's nurse and midwife the large sum of thirty pounds and the poor people in alms the day the prince was born forty shillings she presented a gold cup as a christening gift to her brother but as it is not charged in her expenses it was probably one of those that had been profusely bestowed on her in her infancy at the conclusion of the baptismal ceremony mary took possession of her little sister elizabeth and led her by the hand from hampton court chapel to her lodgings in the palace ten days after the calamitous death of queen jane turned all the courtly festivals for the birth of the heir apparent into mourning the king retired to windsor and left his daughter to bear the principal part in the funeral ceremonials about the corpse of the deceased queen these were performed with all the magnificence of the catholic church whilst the deceased queen laid in state in hampton court chapel the princess mary appeared as chief mourner at dirges and masses accompanied by her ladies and those of the royal household she knelt at the head of the coffin habited in black a white handkerchief was tied over her head and hung down all the ladies similarly habited knelt about the queen's coffin in lamentable wise the princess caught cold at these lugubrious vigils performed in november nights and the king sent his surgeon nicholas simpson to draw one of her teeth for which service she paid him the enormous sum of six angels on the day of the funeral the corpse of jane seymour was removed from hampton court to windsor in stately procession very fatiguing it must have been that day to the princess mary since she followed the car on which the body was placed mounted on horseback her steed was covered with black velvet trappings she was attended on her right hand by her kinsman lord montague who was so soon to fall a victim to her father's cruelty and on the left by lord clifford behind her followed her favorite cousin lady margaret douglas who was called by the herald lady margaret howard a proof that her wedlock with lord thomas howard was believed by the contemporary herald who has described this scene Lady Frances Brandon, daughter of Mary Tudor and Suffolk, likewise had her place near her cousin, the Princess Mary. They were followed by the Countesses of Rutland and Oxford, both ladies of royal descent, and by the Countesses of Suffolk, Bath, and Southampton. As the funeral passed on the road between Hampton and Windsor, the Princess Mary distributed thirty shillings in alms to poor persons begging by the wayside she officiated in st george's chapel windsor the day after as chief mourner at the interment of queen jane and she paid for thirteen masses for the repose of her soul she gave a sovereign apiece to the women of the deceased queen's chamber and many gifts to the officers of her household mary remained at windsor castle with her father till christmas king henry was supposed to be bemoaning the death of queen jane he was really deeply occupied in matrimonial negotiations for himself, but ostensibly for his daughter. Meantime, Mary stood godmother to two more infants, one being the child of her apothecary, the other that of her physician, according to an entry in her accounts. Item, given to John, apothecary, at the christening of his child, my lady's grace being godmother, forty shillings item given at the christening of dr michael's child a salt silver gilt my lady's grace being godmother to the same price of the salt two pounds six shillings eight pence she usually added her own name to that of the godchildren as edward maria or anne maria christmas was kept at richmond palace a payment was made by the princess mary in december of five shillings to a waterman called perkin of richmond for the ferriage on the thames of her and her servants coming there from windsor mary amused herself this winter by embroidering a cushion as a new year's gift to rottesley and a box wrought with needlework and silver for her sister my lady elizabeth's grace as she is designated in the diary of expenses mary likewise prepared a cap which cost two pounds five shillings for her infant brother and godson and withal made his nurse mother jackson a present of a bonnet and frontlet which cost twenty shillings 
the princess remained at richmond till february and during this time lost money at cards to lady hertford and lady margaret gray she gave considerable sums in alms and honestly paid william allen of richmond the value of two of his sheep killed by her greyhounds she paid for the board and teaching of her poor godchildren and several items were charged for necessaries provided for jane the fool a functionary who is first named in the autumn accounts of fifteen thirty seven jane the fool was sometimes exalted on horseback as her mistress paid for the food of a horse kept for her use payments for shoes and stockings linen damask gowns and charges for shaving jane's fool's head frequently occur in the diary of expenses the princess concluded her long visit at richmond palace after candlemas day when she went to hanworth she was forced to employ persons for making the road passable thither she paid these pioneers seven shillings and gave besides four shillings four pence alms on the road to hanworth among many other odd gifts she was presented with orange pies by my lady derby oranges seem to have been in general domestic use since the reign of edward i at this time they were bought for the use of the princess at the rate of ten pence per hundred lady hertford's servant brought the princess quince pies she was sent cockles and oysters and received presents of strawberries as early as april and may fifteen thirty eight a proof that the art of forcing fruit by artificial means was practised in england at that period many items occur of bottles of rose water a preparation in that century considered as an acceptable gift to royalty mary paid this summer repeated visits to her infant brother at hampton court gifts to his nurse servants and minstrels form heavy articles in her expenses she appears to have watched over his infancy with the care of a mother lady margaret douglas was in attendance on the princess at this time for she was repaid twenty shillings for articles purchased for her use the same year the princess received into her household and protection the lady elizabeth fitzgerald a beautiful girl who has excited no small interest in the literary world as the fair geraldine celebrated by the accomplished earl of surrey she was the near kinswoman of the princess since her mother lady elizabeth gray was daughter of thomas marquess of dorset eldest son of queen elizabeth woodville her father the earl of kildare with the five gallant geraldines his uncles had all perished in the preceding year by the hands of the executioner lady kildare was left a widow dependent on the alms of her tyrant kinsman whether it was the princess mary's desire to receive her destitute young cousin or whether she was sent to her at hunsdon by the king's pleasure is not precisely defined but it is certain that a firm friendship ever after existed between the princess mary and the impoverished orphan of the geraldines more than one treaty of marriage had been negotiated by henry for his daughter since the disinheriting act of parliament had passed he always setting forth that by the same act it remained in his power to restore her to her place in the succession if agreeable to his will he had been so long used to amuse himself with these negotiations that they evidently formed a part of his pastime yet mary's early desire of leading a single life was seldom threatened with contradiction by any prospect of these marriage treaties being brought to a successful conclusion thus passed away the suit of the prince of portugal made the same year the year fifteen thirty eight was one of great trouble and convulsion in england the serious insurrection of the catholics called the pilgrimage of grace which had occasionally agitated the north since the autumn of fifteen thirty six was renewed nearer the court and several nobles connected with the royal family were suspected of collusion the most dreadful executions took place one unfortunate female lady bulmer was burnt alive for high treason and sorcery her husband butchered under the same pretense in smithfield the land reeked with judicial bloodshed and the representatives of some of the most noble families in england perished on the scaffold among the requisitions of the northern insurgents there was always a clause for restoration of the princess mary to her royal rank a circumstance replete with the greatest danger to herself and very wary must she have guided her course to have passed through the awful year of fifteen thirty eight without exciting greater jealousy than she did from her father and his government her establishment was for a time certainly broken up 
for a chasm of more than a year, appears in the book of her privy purse expenses. She had in the preceding autumn excited the anger of her father and Cromwell, by affording hospitality to some desolate strangers, probably some of the dispossessed religious from the overthrown monasteries, many of whom wandered about, in the most piteous state of destitution. The princess promised Cromwell by letter, not to offend in this way again, and adds, she fears the worst has been made of the matter to the king. The Christmas of 1538 found Cromwell and the Duke of Saxony, the head of the Protestant League in Germany, busy negotiating the union of the strictly Catholic Mary with the young Duke of Cleves, brother to the Duchess of Saxony. Bergartius, the vice-chamberlain of Saxony, was likewise employed in the proposal. This dignitary, it appears, had applied for a portrait of Mary, but was answered by Cromwell, that no instance can be quoted of a king's daughter of such high degree, having her picture sent abroad for approval. But Bergardius, the duke's vice-chamberlain, whose self having seen the Lady Mary, can testify of her proportion, countenance, and beauty. And although, he adds, she be the king's natural daughter only, yet, nevertheless, she is endowed and adorned, as all the world knoweth, as well of such grace and beauty and excellent proportion of person, as of most excellent learning, honorable behavior, and of all honest virtues and good qualities, that it is not to be doubted, when all the rest, as portion, etc., should be agreed, that no man would stick or stay concerning her beauty and goodness, but be more than contented, as he, Vice-Chamberlain Bergartius, knoweth well, who saw her visage. Thus Cromwell continued to insist, that the face and accomplishments of Mary quite counterbalanced the defects of her title and fortune, but this marriage treaty proved as futile as the preceding ones, and only served to introduce the unfortunate wedlock of Anne of Cleves and Henry the Eighth. The beloved friends of Mary's youth, the Countess of Salisbury and her family, were in the commencement of the year 1539, attained without trial, and overwhelmed in one sweeping ruin. In the spring of the same year, Lord Montague, the elder brother of Reginald Pole, was beheaded on slight pretenses, and the elegant Marquess of Exeter, Henry the Eighth's first cousin and former favorite, shared Montague's doom. The Countess of Salisbury was immured in the tower, and at the same time bereft of all property, even of the power of purchasing herself a warm garment to shelter her aged limbs. Mary's other friend, the wretched widow Gertrude, Marchioness of Exeter, involved in her husband's sentence, was imprisoned in the tower, expecting daily execution. Her captivity was shared by her little son Edward, the hapless heir of Courtney, who was too young even to permit the pretense of having offended. As this utter desolation of these nobles and semi-royal families was entirely attributed, by their tyrannical oppressor, to their relationship and friendship for Reginald Pole, whose chief crime was his firm support of the claims of Catherine of Aragon, it may be easily supposed how much the princess was agonized by their calamities. At this juncture, so replete with peril to herself, Mary was dwelling at Hertford Castle with her little sister Elizabeth. It appears she had had no establishment of her own, since the jealousy had occurred respecting the hospitality she had afforded to distressed strangers at her dwelling. A tradition actually prevalent at Hertford Castle that a Queen Mary was captive there for nearly two years, and a little room in one of the turrets is shown, as a place where she used to read and study. Mary, Queen of Scots, is the person whom common report has identified with this traditionary imprisonment. But it is scarcely needful to observe that she was never so far south, by many score miles, as Hertford Town or Castle. Local reports of this kind may usually be traced to some forgotten historical reality, and satisfactorily explained, if rational allowance is made, for the confusion occasioned by similar names and station. Thus it may be observed, that our biography loses the Princess Mary of England at Hertford Castle in 1538, and finds her there again at the end of 1539, under a sort of palace restraint, and when it is remembered, that she was afterwards Queen Mary, little doubt can exist, that her durance has been attributed, by the Hertford traditions, to her fair and popular namesake of Scotland. 
End of section 13.